Just a moment. You're live. Okay. Good morning. I am Dr. Todd Peterson, and I will be serving as a designated federal official to the US EPA Science Advisory Committee on Chemicals. That's uh, what we say is SAC for this meeting. I want to thank Dr. Daniel Schlink for agreeing to serve as our chair for the SAC for this meeting. I also want to thank the members of the committee, the ad hoc peer reviewers, and the public for attending this important meeting. We appreciate the time and effort of the peer reviewers in preparing for this meeting, especially taking into account your busy schedules. In addition, I want to thank EPA's Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxics and my colleagues on the SAC staff in our EPA peer review and ethics branch for their hard work in preparing for this important review of EPA's Toxic Substance Control Act, TSCA, Draft Systematic Review Protocol. As an added note, Dr. Ala Kamel, my colleague and DFO, who will serve as the backup DFO, and Steve Knott, our Executive Secretary and Senior DFO, they are on this week, and they will, again, both serve as backups to my role as DFO. The pre proceedings for the meeting today through Thursday are outlined on an agenda that is posted at the docket. And to get to the docket, you go online to www.regulations.gov. And there is a docket ID for this meeting. It is EPA hyphen HQ hyphen OPPT hyphen 2021 hyphen 0414. Again, that's EPA HQ OPPT 2021. 0414. The docket also contains a copy of EPA TASCA draft systematic review protocol and other supplemental files for this peer review. Copies of presentation materials used during this meeting, including those submitted this week by public commenters, will be available in the public docket within the next week. So, the function of SAC and committee composition, the SAC is a federal advisory committee that only provides advice and recommendations to the EPA. Decision-making regarding impact of proposed EPA regulatory actions on human health and environment and the implementation authority remains with the agency. For the present meeting, there are nine ad hoc peer reviewers and 15 of the 17 established SAC members that are contributing to the peer review of EPA's draft systematic review protocol. My role as a designated federal official, for this meeting, I serve as the liaison between the SAC and the agency. I am also responsible for ensuring provisions of the Federal Advisory Committee Act that's FACA, uh, that, uh, that that act are met. The Federal Advisory Committee Act SAC meetings are subject to all FACA requirements. These include open meetings, which is this is an open meeting, timely public notice of meetings and document availability. Regarding financial conflicts of interest as the designated federal official for this meeting, a critical responsibility is to work with the appropriate agency officials to ensure that all appropriate ethics regulations are satisfied. In that capacity, committee members receive training on provisions of the federal conflict of interest laws. In addition, each participant has filed a standard government financial disclosure report. Our assistant deputy ethics official and deputy ethics official for the Office of Program Support and in consultation with the Office of General Counsel have reviewed these reports to ensure all ethics requirements are met. For the next three days, we have a very full agenda and meeting times are approximate. Thus, we may not keep to the exact times as noted on the agenda due to committee discussions and public comments. We strive to ensure adequate time for agency presentations, public comments, and committee deliberations. 
We may take a little extra time at various points in the meeting to help with coordination and thus work step-by-step step through the agenda. For presenters, committee members, and public commenters, please identify yourself by name each time you start to speak and speak into your microphone. This meeting is being webcasted, transcribed, and recorded. Also, for those using a headset with microphone, place that near your mouth, but slightly below your mouth, so um, you get a clear uh, transmission. This helps the audio clarity when you speak. One added note, if you are calling in by telephone, we highly recommend using a landline for those who are speaking as a committee member or oral commenter or agency OPPT representative. Further, when speaking, it is best not to have the phone on speaker mode. This also helps with audio quality. Regarding public commenters, members of the committee are encouraged to fully consider all written and oral public comments submitted for this meeting. And written comments are posted at the docket as well. For members of the public that have not pre-registered for public oral comments, please notify either myself or another member of the SAC staff if you are interested in making a comment. That request would need to come in advance of today's comment session However, at this time, the agenda is full. And as we move through the proceedings, if time allows, we may be able to accommodate additional brief public comments of five minutes or less. Regarding the, pu the public docket again, as I mentioned previously, there is a public docket for this meeting. You know, all background materials, questions posed to the committee, that's the charge, by the agency and other documents related to this meeting are posted. And again, that's at www.regulations.gov. And the docket ID, is, which is listed on the agenda, is EPA hyphen HQ hyphen OPPT hyphen 2021 hyphen 0414. The docket number and website are also noted on the meeting agenda. Regarding press inquiries, for members of the press, EPA media relations staff are available to answer your questions about this meeting. Please address all questions to Kathy Milborn, and you can reach her by email, and I'll spell out her name and the email address. That's milborn.kathy at epa.gov. So it's M-I-L-B-O-U-R-N dot C-A-T-H-Y at epa.gov. Again, milborn.kathy at epa.gov. SAC meeting minutes. At the conclusion of the meeting, the SAC will prepare a report as a response to questions posed by the agency, background materials, presentations, and public comments. The final report also serves as meeting minutes, so we commonly refer to it as meeting minutes and final report. We anticipate the final report and meeting minutes will be completed in approximately 90 days after the meeting. Also, in addition, uh, there are additional information about the Science Advisory Committee on the Chemicals, um, Committee on Chemicals as um, it's posted on the internet, excuse me. So the agenda, um, the uh, various other information about this meeting, you will be able to find it at the following website. And I'll say it two ways, www.epa.gov uh, at Tosca Peer Review. Spelled out, that is www.epa.gov forward slash T-S-C-A hyphen P-E-E-R hyphen review, that's R-E-V-I-E-W. So uh, furthermore, each day of this SAC meeting, April SAC meeting is going to be live streamed on YouTube. And the link to that live stream is also at that uh, epa.gov Tosca peer review website. And people who have registered will have also received that YouTube link. After the meetings conclude, a link to the YouTube video for each day will be made available at this EPA SAC peer review website. 
So that's a possibility for you to go back and uh, review the meeting for each given day. Also, one added reminder to peer reviewers, please send an email note to myself and the chair in indicating if you must step away from the meeting for a short time and another note when you are back. So these are the closed, I'm at the close of my opening DFO remarks. Again, I wish to thank the committee for your participation. And I now turn the meeting over to the chair, Dr. Schlenk. Thank you, Todd. Uh, appreciate the comments and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this particular committee. Um, my name is Dan Schlink. I'm a professor of environmental and ecotoxicology from the University of California, Riverside. Um, and I'll be chairing the session today uh, and for the next three days. My job will be primarily to keep us on time uh, tw uh, towards the agenda, which you should all have a copy of. As Todd mentioned, it's a floating agenda, so we will try to, to keep uh, to the time constraints as much as possible, but uh, there is some, uh, some variability there as well. Um, at this point in time, it would be, um, it's appropriate to go uh, throughout the committee uh, to uh, announce yourself and your affiliation, as well as uh, a couple statements about your expertise so that the, the public is uh, familiar with, with your background. Um, I will begin first by going through uh, the list of the Science Advisory Committee on Chemicals, the uh, membership, and we'll be doing this alphabetically, and then I will go to our ad hoc uh, committee members after that. So let's begin with uh, Dr. Apti. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Udayan Apti. Uh, I am a professor at the Department of Pharmacology, Toxicology, and Therapeutics at the University of Kansas Medical Center. And my expertise is in liver toxicology, liver pathobiology, effect of environmental chemicals on the liver. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, Dr. Baker? Hi, my name is Marissa Baker. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, my expertise is in industrial hygiene and exposure assessment. Thank you. Dr. Blystone. Hi, I'm Sherry Blystone. I'm a chemist by training, um, working as a product safety and compliance professional in the chemical industry, currently with SNF Holding Company. Thanks, uh, Dr. Cobb. I'm George Cobb, um, environmental analytical chemist from the environmental science department here at Baylor University. Thanks, uh, Dr. Chason. Uh, Hello, my name is Dr. Chris Chasen, and I'm with, um, and my background is uh, in toxicology, but my interest professionally has been exposure assessment methodologies and models for assessment with a particular focus on unique communities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Davies. Good morning. I'm Holly Davies. I'm a toxicologist at the Washington uh, State Department of Health. My uh, background is in reproduction development, and I'm um, expertise in human health hazard assessment. Thanks. Dr. Doucette. Good morning. I'm Bill Doucette, uh, Professor Emeritus, Utah State University, uh, Civil and Environmental Engineering Program, and I'm an environmental fake chemist. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hager Bernay. Hi, I'm Wendy Heiger Bernays. I am a professor of uh, environmental health at the Boston University School of Pub Public Health. And my expertise is in mammalian toxicology and risk assessment. Thanks. Dr. Johnson. Hi, I'm Mark Johnson, director for toxicology at the Army's Public Health Center. I've been working in environmental toxicology for about 28 years. Uh, my expertise is in risk assessment and alternatives assessment. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kissel. I'm John Kissel. I am Professor Emeritus of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences at the University of Washington in Seattle, and I am a human exposure scientist. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Prisbola. And disease registry. I'm a, a environmental epidemiologist, and I specialize in environmental epidemiology and human health risk assessment. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Reif. 
Hi, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm David Reif. I'm a professor of bioinformatics at NC State University, and my specialties are computational toxicology and uh, data science applications in the environmental health sciences. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Rollins. Uh, good morning. My name is Craig Rollins. I'm a senior toxicologist with Under Irish Laboratories Research and Development. My background is in molecular toxicology, focusing on mode of action of endocrine cancers and human health risk assessment. Thanks. Dr. Voorhees. Hi, my name is Chip Voorhees. I'm professor of neuroscience at the University of Cincinnati and Cincinnati Children's Hospital. My areas of interest are in transsynaptic proteins and the developmental neurotoxicity of pesticides. Okay, thanks. Uh, at this point, uh, we'll be moving on to our ad hoc reviewers that have been invited for this particular uh, committee. And the first on that list is uh, Dr. Barrow. Hi, uh, I'm Lisa Barrow. I'm a professor in medicine and public health and chief scientist at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado Anschutz uh, Medical Center, where I run a program in evidence and policy. Uh, my PhD is in pharmacology, toxicology, but my um, expertise relevant to this committee is evidence synthesis and systematic review. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, Dr. Poulin uh, Fedenik. Hi, I'm Chrissy Poulin Fedenik. I'm the chief scientist at the Natural Resources Defense Council, also part time faculty at the George Washington University School of Public Health. Uh, my uh, expertise is in environmental health and environmental policy, both broad. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Goyak? Hi, I'm Katie Goyak. I'm a toxicologist with ExxonMobil Biomedical Sciences. My expertise is in animal and in vitro toxicology studies and also um, human health risk assessment of industrial chemicals and formulated products. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lamb. I believe you're on mute, Dr. Lamb. Hello? Uh, looks like maybe we're not, we don't have Dr. Lamb. Okay, uh, Dr. Myers. Good morning, my name is Dr. Jessica Myers. I'm a senior toxicologist at the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. And uh, my work involves human health risk assessments, development of toxicity factors and systematic review. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pelch. Good morning, I'm Dr. Katie Pelch. I'm an assistant professor at the University of North Texas Health Science Center in the School of Public Health. And my expertise relevant to today is in performing and conducting systematic review and systematic evidence mapping to support human health hazard assessment. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dr. Rooney. Good morning, Dr. Andrew Rooney. I'm the acting branch chief of the Integrative Health Assessments Branch in the division of the National Toxicology Program at NIHS. My expertise relevant to this committee is in risk and health assessments for environmental substances, and I'm also a systematic review methodologist. Great, thanks. Dr. Wong. Good morning, I'm Amy Wong. I'm a toxicologist and a systematic review practitioner in the integrative health assessment branch at NIHS. My interests are the mechanism particular for the cancer and the method and the tools for the systematic review. Great, thank you. And uh, Dr. Wyckoff. Hi, Danielle Wyckoff. I'm the Health Sciences Practice Director at Talk Strategies. And my exp expertise relative to this panel is using systematic review to facilitate safety and risk assessments. Thank you. Uh, we'll try one more time for Dr. Lamb. Apparently she has not joined us this morning. Okay, at uh, this point in time, uh, we will begin the presentation uh, of the, the committee. This will take place uh, from the uh, OPP presenter and this presentation will be from, uh, begin with uh, Dr. Taylor Henry. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Tala Henry. I'm the Deputy Director of the Office of 
pollution prevention and toxics here in the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention at EPA. I'm gonna start off here with a quick review of the TOSCA statutory and regulatory requirements that OPPT or Office of Pollution and Prevention and Toxics is operating under. I hope to explain why OPPT needs to apply a systematic review approach, um, but also why it needs to be fit for purpose. And also um, to please invite you and appreciate your inputs to make this fit for purpose systematic approach robust, but also pragmatic such that it can fit within the TOSCA statutory timelines. Next slide. Um, on this slide is just a, a bit of a timeline um, and a quick, very, very brief overview of the Lautenberg amendments. So TOSCA was first put in place in 1976 and was not updated again until 2016 by the Lautenberg Chemical Safety for the 21st Century Act. Um, heretofore, there were quite a few substantial amendments. What I've listed here are some very significant, but just some of the many. Um, to section six of TOSCA. So the Lautenberg amendments required EPA to do several things within the risk assessment of existing chemicals realm. First of all, it's established that we would have a prioritization process, a process that takes no less than nine months and no longer than a year. And we needed to establish a risk-based process to prioritize existing chemicals to undergo risk evaluation. And that was, um, EPA promulgated a rule outlining that process in 2017. Um, then moving on into the risk evaluation realm, it also requires that there be a step called a scope, which is very much in the risk paradigm um, language, like a problem formulation. This is uh, the scopes are required to be developed within six months of a chemical being, um, a risk evaluation being initiated, in other words, being designated as a high priority substance. And this scope must include the conditions of use of the chemical, and that's all of them, um, describe what hazards EPA intends to assess, what exposures, and that includes the full life cycle of exposure, so the environmental fate and releases. Um, uh, exposures to environmental receptors, humans, and humans as applicable in a number of different populations. Should, would it be uh, workers in an occupational setting, the general population that might be exposed to releases to media and or consumers if the chemicals used in consumer products. And we also have a charge to specifically consider potentially exposed or susceptible subpopulations. And that, that could include um, persons who have greater susceptibility, kind of biologically, or those that might um, have greater exposures. And then finally, this culminates in the risk evaluation. Again, there we were charged by TOSCA to set up a process and procedures. And we did that by promulgating the risk evaluation rule in 2017. We also, um, the statute did not say, go ahead and set up your process, then start. It actually told us to designate 10 chemicals and move those straight away into risk evaluation. So within the first six months of the statute becoming law, we designated the first 10 chemicals. And of course, many of you reviewed each and every one of those first 10 risk evaluations that we much appreciate that experience that you're bringing to, to this uh, review as well. We also, uh, upon finishing or within um, a certain period of time of the, the 2016 law, we had to have 20 additional chemicals designated as high priority substances and risk evaluations initiated for them. That is where we are today. Um, and then, of course, there's sort of a pipeline envisioned in the law so that there are ongoing designations. Every time we finish one risk evaluation, we should have another high priority substance teed up to begin. There is uh, some pretty ambitious timelines in the law, but they are in the law. So a risk evaluation is to be completed um, in, within three years. 
with a possible extension of six months. In addition, um, manufacturers of chemicals can also request that EPA undertake risk evaluations on some of those chemicals. So that's on top of the 20 that we need to have ongoing at any given time. Now, moving on to some of the stipulations um, in the law and the regulations around systematic review. Um, a couple of excerpts from the statute are on the left part of this slide. So among other things, TOSCA requires that a TOSCA risk evaluation integrate and assess available information. I note on both hazards and exposures and that we describe the weight of the scientific evidence. So this is, these are words that must um, be adhered to in any risk evaluation conducted under TOSC. Um, and just to make a fine point, the statute does require that both hazard and exposure evidence be assessed, weighed, and integrated. Additional provisions of TOSCA under section 26 are laid out here, uh, and they are that EPA use the best available science and also base any decisions on the weight of the scientific evidence. Now, having those in the statute, the statute did not go further and define either of those terms. Um, so in promulgating the implementing regulations for the risk evaluate in the risk evaluation rule, EPA defined these terms. And of course, the, the rule was proposed. We took public comment on it and settled based on considering those comments on the definitions that are on the right side of this slide. So you can see that best available science is at its base, science that is reliable and unbiased. And then all good words that everyone would ever want to ensure any data they're using in assessment is further articulated there. We also uh, define the weight of the scientific evidence as a systematic review method applied in a manner suited to the nature of the evidence or the decision. So there's you know, a, a lot of additional words here about a protocol, um, a comprehensiveness, objectivity, transparency. And I also wanna point out in blue that each stream of evidence is included within this weight of evidence um, consideration. So within the TOSCA context, systematic review methods we've chosen to use are to evaluate each stream of the evidence that we will use in a TOSCA risk evaluation to ensure that the science is reliable and unbiased. My next slide is a quick overview here, uh, diagrammatically, of how the systematic review um, enterprise, if you will, which is the middle part of the slide, fits within um, the TOSCA prioritization and risk evaluation scheme along the top. So we have our prioritization step first. This is even before we start the risk evaluation in order to gather the data, as I said, prioritization is a risk-based um, process. We do our initial literature searching and screening to help um, facilitate the problem formulation or the, the scoping that'll come next, but also we use that information um, to, to facilitate the prioritization and develop some semblance of PICO. Then when we move into the scoping stage, uh, based on, so we now have um, some idea of what uh, available information and data are out there. In the scope, we may uh, refine the PICO um, to include in the protocol. Um, and in this scoping stage, obviously that's some of the initiating steps of the systematic review in addition to the searching and, and screening. So the scope goes out and as I mentioned, that includes the conditions of use, the hazards, the exposures and so forth that the agency expects to um, assess. And the whole systematic uh, review enterprise begins um, in earnest you know, during this, this phase. We also on the bottom here have the ability under TOSCA to um, 
actually compel the generation of new information. So in um, reviewing the initial literature screening um, and developing these PICO statements on the scope, we may find that there are critical data gaps and we um, therefore can then start down the path of potentially filling those gaps using TOSCA authorities. But as you can see, and it depends very much on the chemical and how much data um, is available, but this systematic review process then has begun, but continues on through um, to support the risk evaluation. So the data collection, the screening, and you go into the data, applying the data evaluation criteria, um, ultimately getting you to the evidence integration, which is very much part of the risk evaluation, which will contain the summary findings and confidence statements based on the systematic review protocol that we have designed. Next slide. Um, just a couple of sort of um, where we've been here. So from the start, um, EPA starting back in 2017, knowing full well that we needed to stand up some kind of a systematic review process, we reviewed the multiple existing frameworks, um, noting that most of them primarily address human health hazard only. There's a few out there for ecological data as well. Um, so in 2018, we developed and sought public comment on our previous version of the approaches document, the full titles there at the bottom, um, and began actually performing the initial steps at the same time. Again, TOSCA didn't allow for sort of a ramping up and development stage. We literally had to start trying and applying methodologies while we were doing the first 10 scope documents, which also then went out for public comment. In 2019, we implemented many improvements based on those public comments that we received on the approaches document um, and applied those in developing the first 10 draft risk evaluations. Those risk evaluations also underwent public comment. And in addition, again, many of you on the panel will recall, we solicited and received SAC peer review comments on those draft risk evaluations, as well as specifically um, questions related to the systematic approaches that were applied in developing those risk evaluations. Furthermore, in 2020, um, we asked the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine to um, peer review our, our updated process. We held, there were four uh, workshops convened. And again, it was reviewing that 2018 document, but also some of the improvements that, or evolutions, I would call them really, that were made when we were developing those first town risk evaluations. Um, and based on that input, so now we have input from a couple of rounds of public comment, the SAC, as well as the NASM. We pulled all that together to um, develop the document that you're being asked to provide inputs on today. That's the draft TOSCA systematic review protocol. And again, we've tried to incorporate um, and uh, make uh, evolve the process based on those multiple sources and rounds of comment. So here we are today, April, 2022. And um, next slide, I just wanna give you, and th this will be articulated later in much more detail, but we have in fact received a number of public comments, which I believe the panel has full access to at this point. Um, and here we've highlighted some of the positive comments that the transparency and the overall process logic is much clearer and we very much um, realize that because we were sort of doing systematic review at the same time we were doing risk evaluation that the pieces and parts were integrated within those those things that might not have been the most transparent way to do it but um, it was sort of what we the, the cards we were dealt um, the inclusion of a step to conduct supplemental literature searching, um, we got positive feedback on that. Again, as I showed you, we start our initial literature review while we're in the prioritization stage. So a couple of years could have passed. So we have included um, 
supplementing along the way. And obviously I think everyone realized at some point you do need to stop, but we have um, done due diligence there. Um, we have a pretty extensive um, section on how to search and extract and review data from the gray literature and the screening strategies for that. Um, I think especially some of the exposure experts out there might realize that or the IH experts that sometimes um, there are really excellent reports out there, but they might be considered what you call gray literature or other agency type reports. So we have a pretty robust way of identifying those and hope that you've seen seeing improvements there. Um, also, we have implemented the literature inventory trees and evidence tables that are prepared using a specialized software um, designed for, to facilitate systematic review. Um, we got good feedback on those. That they're very informative um, in really sort of showing a reader the high level landscape of the availability of data and information. And then um, another area that we've worked very diligently on in this version to put it all in one place and also to um, show the actual logic behind it is in developing our weight of evidence um, and both within evidence streams, but also across evidence streams. So um, I might've failed to say, but these are full life cycle assessments of a chemical. And I did review earlier all of the different possible conditions of use that might be there, the, the various different and varied um, exposure pathways and media that could be included in any given assessment, as well as um, looking at both human health and ecological outcomes. So the next slide, um, which is my last, is just a few considerations for you all going into this review. Um, our biggest challenge here is to balance the need to meet our TOSCA Section 26 science requirements to use the best available science. Um, and to use a weight of evidence approach um, and to get there using a systematic review approach, but one that can fit within our statutory deadlines. So I kind of just covered this in my last statement here, but just a reminder that these TOSCA risk evaluations are full life cycle and they um, need to include things, data and information all the way from PCAM properties and chemistry through fate and transport, exposure as well as hazard for both ecological and human health. And even in the human health and ecological hazard realm, we have um, multiple potential populations that you're looking at. As I mentioned a couple of times now, TOSCA does require these best available science and weight of evidence um, criteria be met. We do in fact believe that uh, the systematic review approach is the way to get there. Um, we also though, as I said here, need to be somewhat pragmatic given our timeframes. So we have only six months from initiating a risk evaluation to put the scope out and then the additional two and a half to three years after that to complete it to final. That includes multiple opportunities for public um, comment as well as peer review. Um, of course, if anyone follows TOSCA, you know that our office is in a very resource deficit mode. So again, there we're looking for um, novel ideas and inputs perhaps that you have in ways that we can further streamline or become more efficient because um, we're always operating in a limited time FT and dollar situation. Um, and so again here, getting to the fit to purpose, we have unique requirements in TOSCA. So again, we're well beyond hazard or, or just exposure. We have to uh, systematically review all of our evidence streams and that for that reason, um, kind of picking up an off the shelf and just applying it to one uh, evidence stream doesn't really work for us. Our task is systematic review protocol really does need to be fit for purpose to make it um, meet 
the, the statutory requirements and also the timeframes. And with that, I will stop. And I think Stan Barone is up next. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Henry. Will you, will you be uh, around in about an hour after Stan and Kelly's presentation to answer general questions? Or should we do questions now? You wanna do questions now? Um, either way, whatever you think, Chair. Um, okay, uh, we do have a couple of general questions, Dr. Johnson. Hi, Dr. Henry. I was just curious, roughly how much does a systematic review cost? You said your resources are an issue. I was just curious. Okay, well, Stan, right there, you can see him coming in the background. He might have to answer that one for me. So um, looking together at both extramural and intramural costs, we've estimated between 500 and 700K um, for a typical um, a uh, systematic review for a uh, chemical for a chemical and they vary depending upon the data the, the the complexity the number of conditions of use and of course the data elements both gray and peer review sure all right thank you uh dr chasen hello uh thank you for your presentation um i just wanted to uh ask for a clarification uh, in slide number two, you note that um, the uh, Lautenberg requirements, um, and you stressed requirements, was to include um, potentially exposed and susceptible populations, the, the pests, which is uh, addressed in several other parts of EPA as well. And in slide seven, uh, when you talk about the TOSCA risk evaluations under your considerations, it looks like pests uh, disappears. Uh, could you could you explain uh, what the focus is here? So consideration of pests in whichever uh, form of, of any of those human health um, populations on slide seven. I just it's just for brevity in slide okay. seven. But pests is always it is a requirement, and so to the extent that the data and information that we gather helps to address whether or not and in what way a um, population may be more susceptible or undergo greater exposure. We would absolutely be looking for that kind of data and also want to subject it to systematic review so that we can ensure that it's reliable. Um, and relevance. Can, can you, uh, one more question. Um, so the, um, just so I'm clear, so the determination that there is a susceptible population um, is not actively a focus in the uh, generation of the problem, but it is consequential to whatever information comes in. Is, am I characterizing that correctly? No, it, it is definitely a component of, of the PICO. And right. from the start, okay. the name, okay. one of the factors considered in, you know, search terms and, and such. Yeah. Things. I, okay. I thank you for that. I just wanted to be sure because of, uh, it looked like it had dropped out on this slide, but thank you for that. I was just being brief. Sorry. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Barrow. Thank you. This is Lisa Barrow. Um, Dr. Henry, can you just clarify what you mean by an evidence stream in the context of your talk? Because uh, you said systematic reviews of each evidence stream must be conducted. And is that defined as the different disciplines or is that animal human mechanistic as mentioned in the protocol? Um, what did you mean there? Okay, well, I'm going to bring in Dr. Barone again, because I do not want to misspeak. There's been much, much, much discussion around terminology. Yes, and that's actually one of the reasons why we included a glossary, um, because there was confusion about um, different terminology, discipline, specific data types, data streams, evidence streams. So we're really in evidence streams, the larger collection of exposure, the exposure information, um, and um, 
the hazard information for animal um, slash human um, and versus um, the environmental receptor data evidence streams. So we really do have to cover all those evidence streams per TSCA and, this, and the Section 26H requirements. We'll talk more specifically in our evidence uh, integration about the evidence types and for evaluation and for integration in those sections of the protocol. Okay, so I just want to be clear, you're talking about then applying systematic review to like all the hazard information and all the exposure information. Correct. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in the next overview. And don't Thank you. and PCAM too. Yes. Those are often um, very yes. puts to um, exposure modeling, for example. Yeah. Again, any questions of general sort of comments for Dr. Henry? So anything specifics, I think we're going to be dealing with Dr. Peroni here in a minute. So, uh, Dr. Kissel? Yeah, I have a, a general question on uh, implementation. So, um, the first 10 um, reviews were done using the old system, which the new system is supposed to supplant. Um, and we have 20 new chemicals coming into play. Uh, to what extent were uh, the, the reviews of the uh, next 20 chemicals uh, conducted under the old system? And um, um, what's, the, what's the process for implementing the new system uh, into the process? So again here, we don't have any um, um, exit ramps where we can go and park for a while and and put things together. But as I mentioned, so in 2018 was the initial approach document and that was used in the early days of the first 10. But as we um, started to apply that and received feedback because there's so many public comment periods within that the risk evaluation development process, we did begin to evolve that 2018 approach along the way. So even the draft risk evaluations for the first 10 did incorporate some evolution and improvements based on the feedback that we received. And then of course we got additional feedback from the NASM um, and additional rounds of public comment. So going into these next 20, we didn't really apply the 2018 was that was not the recipe book. It was the evolved improvements along the way. And we were finally at this place where with this protocol, again, we, we simply are not allowed to pull over and change the tire. So we had to move along and do continuous improvement along the way. So this protocol is the most comprehensive look at where we are today with all of the evolutions and improvements along the way. And by and large, and Stan, you can grill him more specifically about that, by and large, what's in the protocol is what has been used to date on the next 20. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dr. Henry. Uh, with that, let's go ahead and move forward with our uh, technical presentation, uh, the overview of systematic review protocol. This will be, uh, a, looks like a team uh, presentation from Dr. Stan Barone, who's at the Data Gathering and Analysis Division of OPPT, and uh, Dr. Kelly Fay, who's also in the same division. So, uh, Dr. Barone? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Schlank. And, um, by the way, to the committee, thank you again for all your hard work on this pre-work uh, for this peer review. I want to um, thank the core team as well as the ad hocs. I also want to acknowledge that um, actually I'm no longer in the data gathering and analysis division, but now the senior science policy advisor on chemical safety for our AA ship, the Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention. Um, I do have a background in the first risk evaluations and the problem formulations, the scoping efforts um, and the prioritization effort. So what I'm gonna to speak to you today is coming from that background uh, and experience how we've made improvements 
to our systematic review approach, how we've developed a draft protocol, which is the subject of this peer review. I'm also in my background gonna talk about the comments that we've received, some of the major comments and criticisms from both the public, as well um, as the previous SAC comments from the peer review of the risk evaluations and the NASM, uh, National Academy of Science uh, and um, Engineering and Medicine's report to us um, on our approaches and our innovations that we proposed in workshops in 2020, as well as a walkthrough of the draft protocol. I have included in my background um, some discussion of the recent report on the IRIS um, handbook, the NASM's report on the IRIS handbook, and how we have incorporated um, innovations and um, improvements to respond to the recommendations on the IRIS handbook as well. And I'll put that in context. So um, our protocol is one to improve transparency, predictability, um, reproducibility, reliability, and objectivity in our evaluation process. As Dr. Henry pointed out earlier, those are all key aspects laid out in the risk evaluation rule and incumbent upon us to look at um, multiple data streams. Next slide, please. So the fit for purpose context of a systematic review protocol for TOSCA risk evaluation um, has, to, has to address assessments that cover um, a similar structure and format, uh, different levels of complexity, and different levels of data richness, which we've already touched upon. And it depends upon reasonably available data for a chemical. So we're looking for data that's reasonably available and it, what is existing, and we identify those data gaps, um, existing data gaps when we're doing the systematic review process. The assessment, you've heard the term full life cycle of the chemical. So Again, under TOSCA, it's the manufacturing, processing, use of the chemical, either industrial use, commercial use, or um, uh, possibly um, personal use, consumer use of the chemical, and its disposal, the disposal of the chemical. And all of that um, life, life cycle information goes into informing the regulatory context, which is the condition of use. And you hear, hear this term condition of use. Conditions of use are specific to the chemicals use and those are being assessed and inform the scope of the uses, the scope of the pathways that will be defining the PICO, RISO and PISO. Um, and again, PICO, population exposure comparator outcome. So the exposure context in the conditions of use is critically important for defining the pathways, air, water, sediment, soil, diet, exposure routes, inhalation, oral or dermal, and on the, um, uh, on the um, populations, the receptors, the occupational um, um, conditions of use includes workers, occupational non-users, and the potentially exposed and susceptible populations within that receptor group, as well as general population, as well as consumers and bystanders, as well as our environmental receptors. So PES is considered across, across the board um, in our human health um, evaluations. Next slide, please. So I wanted to um, at briefly summarize for um, those of you that are new to the committee or the ad hocs, some of the work um, critical work that the previous committee did in reviewing both our um, approaches document as, and the application in the risk evaluations, prior 10 risk evaluations. And the, um, the previous committee did a very nice job of synthesizing that in the one bromo propane report um, midway through the first 10, some of the major concerns and major issues that arose um, looking at the risk evaluations and the application of the approaches uh, for systematic review, which was not a protocol. 
So first comment, major comment was, it was an unclear systematic review protocol. Um, the protocol being captured in multiple documents um, and responses to comments in the approaches document, as well as the appendix to the risk evaluations was not transparent, was not clearly laid out. We've addressed that, we believe, uh, some of those major criticisms. A lack of clarity on how regulatory nexus affects the elimination of exposure pathways for systematic review analysis was a crit key criticism, both by public commenters as well as the SAC. I will say that we are no longer using a regulatory nexus. Um, we have pivoted away from a regulatory nexus framework, um, and that has had um, a significant inclusion um, of pathways, uh, previously uh, eliminated pathways from our scope and from our systematic review efforts. The limitations of confidential business information and confidential business information claims um, presented some problems, at least with one of our um, previous systematic review efforts, that was PV29. We have redoubled our efforts to redact and or um, have um, CBI claims removed where possible from any and all evidence um, for our risk evaluations. And as um, called out by, by the SAC, as well as previous commenters, the need for data gathering efforts for chemicals with data needs um, and linking our systematic review efforts to identifying those data gaps has been a significant improvement and a significant recommendation from the prior SAC. Next slide. Uh, summary of other comments, um, simultaneously conducting uh, SR and the TSCA risk evaluation was a criticism and a reality. I think the committee recognized our challenges. I think the NASM also recognized those challenges. A lack of clarity and transparent rationale for inclusion and exclusion of studies is another um, key um, recommendation, criticism. Inconsistent application of evaluation criteria for different disciplines. It was not apparent in our data evaluation that we were consistently using the same criteria in considerations across disciplines. And we've made those improvements and included a lot more harmonization. And I'll talk about that more um, in subsequent slides. Rationale for upgrading and downgrading um, of the data evaluation needs to be clear and articulated. Quantitative and weighted scoring system for data evaluation gives us false sense of precision. This was uh, repeated multiple times by many public commenters. It was repeated multiple times by the SAC throughout our um, previous risk evaluations. Um, it um, was also repeated across evidence streams, both for exposure and hazard, um, how the quantitative and weighting um, was or was not working um, or gave a false sense of uh, precision. And um, deficient discussion and measures of uncertainty and variability as it related to evidence integration. Um, the discussion and evidence integration was not in the approaches document. There was no, um, it was not a full protocol as, as I've already stated. So it did not include evidence integration where the draft protocol that you are reviewing does now include that particular um, chapter. A lack of description of the SR process in the, uh, between the applications of systematic review and the risk evaluation presented a lot of challenges, both for the public as well as for the, um, the peer reviewers and stakeholders who were reviewing our risk evaluation documents. Next slide, please. So to sort of pile on um, some of the major um, criticisms and recommendations that came from our NASM um, report on the TSCA systematic review approach, unclear and incomplete systematic review protocol was one of their um, critical concerns and major recommendations was that we needed to take into account the public comments and develop a draft protocol. They recommended again um, that the use of quantitative weighted um, scoring system for data evaluation be dropped in favor of a qualitative approach. 
Um, they also um, recommended that where possible, we could use existing uh, information from previous systematic reviews, whether they be OHAT, IRIS, or the Navigation Guide. There was um, a suggestion that in some cases we could actually employ um, one of those frameworks um, to our systematic review evidence stream. Um, but again, as Dr. Henry pointed out, having an approach that's developed just for hazard, we did a lot of work to develop an approach that would um, apply to all evidence streams, not just the human health hazard um, data, uh, evidence stream. The development for non-hazard endpoints um, was not clear in our previous approaches document, and we have uh, addressed that with the new protocol. A lack of method for data synthesis and evidence integration was called out because that was lacking in our approaches document. And uh, again, no protocol, no, um, no methods for data synthesis and evidence integration. We've now addressed that and addressed the lack of transparency issues. Next slide. So the next two slides, I'm gonna briefly summarize some of the key re summary recommendations, primary tier one recommendations that came from the NASM report on the IRIS handbook. And one of those uh, was, the need for a glossary and figures for process transparency. And um, as we were developing and collaborating with ORD and taking into account the uh, comments on the, on the IRIS handbook, we were incorporating a glossary and, and uh, working cohesively to try to not only capture terms that are related to TSCA and risk evaluation, but capture terms that are important and critical to the process that we've laid out in the approach that we've laid out in our draft systematic review protocol. So we're looking for comments on the glossary um, uh, that we have developed for systematic review, which is in our, um, at the end of the document before the appendices. We also included professional tech editing um, in the preparation of this document. We've included evergreen links to tools and evidence maps and lit trees in the development of both the scopes um, and future risk uh, draft risk evaluations that'll be available through Hawk and Tableau. Um, and those links are also included in the draft protocol. And um, we provided examples of evidence integration in the actual, um, in the actual um, draft protocol. And I'll, I'll be, Speaking to that later, um, some of the example tables uh, in, and so on for our discussion. Uh, next slide, please. So additional, um, additional topics, uh, recommendations from, um, from the NASM to, on the IRIS handbook and topics that we're still exploring with our, um, with our colleagues and collaborators in ORD include step-by-step um, -step description of study evaluation. We've, we've included that in our draft protocol. Synthesis and integration, and the term synthesis and integration is generally captured in our um, protocol as evidence integration. We don't divide synthesis and integration up um, per se as steps as in the IRIS handbook, and we're um, having further discussion on that. We have spent a lot of time in this pro in preparation of this draft protocol harmonizing data evaluation criteria for epi and animal evidence and ecological evidence as well. So our um, draft protocol, the data evaluation criteria do include a harmonization of those data evaluation criteria and your comments can further develop um, that particular area. More detailed justification of upgrading and downgrading criteria is included in this draft protocol and is included as a matter of course in our application of uh, data evaluation in our distiller um, platform. And I'll talk more about the tools that we use and distiller is one of those tools. We are having more discussion about more detailed PICOs and more detailed use of um, mechanistic data in our PICO statements, and that is um, an ongoing uh, evolution. You will see from the scopes to the, um, 
to the protocol, there was an evolution in many cases of the PICO statements, and we have captured that, and we'll continue to capture evolution of PICO statements based upon um, calibration efforts and based upon chemical specific um, uh, uh, issues that come up. We've included, uh, we have not yet included evaluation of publication bias or funding bias uh, in our data synthesis. And that's an ongoing discussion uh, topic with awardee um, as we move forward as an agency. Um, so that's a topic that um, there's still work uh, underway. Next slide, please. So in brief, um, we've taken a number of steps which are captured in our um, draft protocol. And we've re we report qualitative ratings um, rankings for um, data evaluation uh, in our risk evaluations, we will, um, using our revised evaluation system. The protocol describes how the TSCA systematic review framework addresses risk of bias and other characteristics that we have borrowed from existing frameworks, and we've actually mapped um, where risk of bias occurs, uh, is assessed in our different domains and metrics, and there are multiple domains and metrics we do not report a quantitative score or ranking for risk of bias uh, in our approach, um, but we are assessing risk of bias. We've updated evaluation criteria. We have developed training materials, both for our staff and for our contractors to provide greater transparency in, in the draft protocol. And it is uh, much more developed for non-hazard endpoints and we've spent a lot of time over the last year um, in response to comments and recommendations from peer review, uh, beefing up and training um, to develop our uh, systematic review approaches for our exposure, fate, um, physical chemistry, um, uh, and, uh, and so on for the non-hazard endpoints and evidence streams. Um, we are um, using this draft protocol um, and approaches that are outlined um, in the development process, risk evaluation uh, development process and scoping process for the next 20 um, uh, risk evaluations and the manufacturer requests as well as uh, requested risk evaluations as well as 1,4-dioxane uh, supplemental analysis being performed um, for the first 10 and um, the asbestos part two evaluation. So transparency concerns are being addressed by publishing this draft systematic review protocol. Next slide. So just as a reminder, Tala showed this slide previously, the systematic review process is in the middle row of this slide, um, searching and screening and of secondary sources for problem formulation and designation is a key part of the prioritization process. And that's where PICO development initially occurs. We develop a generalized PICO statement um, inclusive of um, the population uh, and susceptible populations. And that's included in our analysis plan that's, um, that comes up, comes up later in the scope. Um, the, PICO refinement is also captured in the scope, the first um, version of the PICO statement, and the searching screening approaches are, are applied um, and implemented um, for our development of our scope. And as I said before, the evidence tables, which we'll talk about in the lit trees, are part of the scope documents and also provided as links, evergreen links. Data extraction and data evaluation really occur after scoping, publication of the scoping, um, and that is part of the risk evaluation process, and the evidence integration and summary of findings are part of the risk evaluation and informed by the systematic review. Data gaps are identified during screening, searching and screening, and um, in many cases, if it's a critical data need, that can inform our Section 4 or Section 8 authorities for uh, additional data gathering. Next slide, please. So what's new in the TSCA process for the next risk evaluations? We've included a number 
a number of innovations based upon presentations to the NASM, based upon um, collaborations with ORD and with others, based upon inputs through our community of practice, cross-agency community of practice, and interagency community of practice, uh, monthly committee meetings, um, where we talk about approaches and look for best practices. We've used machine learning, and we'll talk about machine learning and machine learning tools in our searching and screening. We've um, uh, updated uh, and made additional changes to our PICO statements. We've improved our calibration exercises and done a lot more pilot testing uh, and found that calibration and pilot testing uh, is of critical importance and a best practice in the systematic review arena. And we apply it across disciplines and across each chemical um, so that there are multiple phases of calibration, um, calibration exercises occurring. We're leveraging um, tools, and I'll talk about the tools and the workflow of the tools in the next slide, Swift Review, Swift Active, um, and Hawk, as well as Hero and Distiller. We've updated um, the evaluation criteria, as I've already said. We've also reduced our resources needed, both FTE and dollars, from the first 10 evaluations. We have actually kept track of what it cost us to do systematic review for the first 10 and can compare that to the resources that are being um, required and used for the next 20. And we've developed more guidance um, and decision um, uh, documentation, both in our data screening, uh, searching screening and evaluation process. Um, and this has led to, um, uh, again, more details being incorporated into our um, appendices of our draft protocol. Next slide, please. So now um, I just wanna briefly outline that we have included a, um, a glossary of terms in the document. Um, these slides, th this slide and the next, at least try to give you uh, a high level overview. And again, as Dr. Henry pointed out, um, there is sort of an embedding of circles, the TOSCA scientific standards, evaluation domains, those evaluation domains include evidence streams. We have metrics um, within those domains and we have criteria for each metric. Um, clearly articulated um, in our protocol for each, um, each data type. And there are different data types within, um, within each um, specific um, uh, um, uh, discipline. Um, and we do talk about data quality rankings now rather than um, a quantitative scoring. Uh, we've made that transition uh, in the application of our um, new um, draft protocol. Next slide, please. Again, the weight of the scientific evidence, Tal has already talked about that. Strength of the evidence um, for hazard and exposure our overall judgments um, for steady evaluation are high, medium, low, and uninformative. Um, the, um, from evidence integration and the confidence level for risk estimation is high, medium, and low. Um, we're not um, using uninformative for our confidence level for the risk estimation um, per se. It is based upon, um, based upon the high, medium, and low um, uh, confidence rankings. Next. Brief overview of some of the innovations um, that you'll see discussed within the protocol. And for some, this, these are terms of art, um, but they are real tangible tools that we use in the workflow. We are developing APIs um, uh, and automating a lot of these steps and looking, QCing the automation um, and scripting that occurs um, between Hero, which is our repository um, and of all our PDFs and basically where we house um, the references, whether they are gray literature and or peer reviewed literature. We're using Swift Review to filter and develop uh, using machine learning. We're using Swift Active also for screening 
And that's for the machine learning. We're in cases where we're not using machine learning, where we have over a thousand references per uh, a data type or discipline, we're using distiller for the smaller data sets and doing it ma purely manually. And then Swift review for um, filtering um, different hazard outcomes and labeling and tagging um, for different for both exposure and uh, engineering and, and hazard. So we are implementing, and it's um, described in, um, I think, chapter three, um, a lot of our tagging and labeling techniques so that we can pre-process and do post hoc analysis of what um, data exists in what kind of bins. We're using Tableau to visualize and develop heat maps and hawk to develop our um, our literature inventory trees. And as I said, uh, there's a lot of work both internally by our staff um, um, with our data science um, techniques, as well as with our contractors to develop scripts to make this workflow more seamless and more efficient and to do um, QC. Next slide, please. So briefly, I'm not gonna read all of this to you, but I do wanna um, briefly summarize um, how we're using different tools, Swift, Hero, Distiller, Hawk, and Tableau, some of what I've already spoken to you about in our evidence map development, in our automated literature prioritization methods, and in the electronic screening um, for, um, for the um, title and abstract and full text screening. So those implementation of innovative techniques has saved us time and significant resources um, in moving forward with the next 20 plus uh, evaluations. Um, and we are able to document uh, transparently and recreate um, what the steps were in the process and identify um, what might what was included and what was excluded um, via that process. Next slide. Briefly in this slide, and you'll find it in figure 3.1 of the protocol, we're talking about one of the things that the NASM had challenges with in our overview of our, uh, in our workshops was our terminology, but also how the systematic review efforts in TOSCA overlapped with the risk evaluation process and fit into the weight of the scientific evidence analysis in the conclusion of the weight of the scientific evidence analysis, the actual risk evaluation, risk characterization. Um, so those steps are outlined here. What you will see in the blue boxes, uh, again, laid out are the literature searching and screening, Step one, data evaluation. Step two, data extraction. In most cases, data evaluation and extraction go hand in hand with each data type uh, and discipline. Evidence integration is a separate step. Evidence integration uh, of the systematically reviewed data. We do look at other data gap filling um, options and sources. Uh, that are outside of systematic review process. And the Academy actually, um, in their previous report, suggested that not everything needed to go through systematic review um, when we're considering different, um, different information streams. And these include model outputs, um, potential analogs, analog approaches, read across approaches, and then qualitative information on the conditions of use um, those QSARs and so on um, can categories, uh, generic exposure scenarios can help inform our, um, our uh, weight of the scientific evidence, but are not systematically reviewed. They go through a systematic approach and they have been, all our um, tools and models have been through some kind of peer review previously. And we have the documentation for that and provided that in previous risk evaluations as well. So uh, in our weight of scientific evidence, the, the point I'm trying to make is there is systematically reviewed evidence and there's systematic 
approaches that are combined in the weight of the scientific evidence. And um, we are including a description of both of those um, for clarity and transparency. Next slide, please. So to the um, recommendation of providing greater clarity on the process, um, we've provided figures here um, to help delineate um, searching and screening in the workflow for searching and screening, starting out with title and abstract, going to full text screening. Again, the PICO, uh, RISO, uh, PISO, depending upon discipline is critically important for identifying off-target studies that are excluded for further consideration and title and abstract. We have a very, very broad um, searching and screening approach. We have a unified approach for all disciplines. Um, we have spent a lot of time um, you know, with that effort and have with the development of our PICOs, RISOs and PISOs, um, been able to screen that literature down at title and abstract and move to full text and PDF acquisition fairly efficiently. And we document what is excluded on what is included at each of these steps. Um, the excluded um, can include um, supplemental studies um, at full text or labels for supplemental studies, not excluded, but labels of supplemental studies for consideration in full text for hazard ID and weight of evidence. Um, and not necessarily dose response information in that supplemental category. Next slide. Moving on to data evaluation. Um, I already talked about the innovations across disciplines, I identified the, um, uh, we talked about the pilot screening and importance of calibration um, for de PICO development and chemical specific considerations. Next slide. Um, and again, improvements on, on the gray literature side were significant, um, and we've provided more transparency on what happens with gray literature sources and what those trusted sources can be um, and generally are that we look at. Um, but there are other sources that pop up depending upon the chemical or specific classes of chemicals where we, we, will, we have identified those in the appendix of the protocol. Next slide, please. Uh, the evidence mapping is a fit for purpose application of evidence mapping. And again, we've applied evidence mapping for transparency across all the disciplines, not just human health hazard. We borrowed this, um, this approach from, um, from development uh, of work in the IRIS handbook and ORD's efforts to do evidence mapping and others. We have um, applied this um, across all six of our disciplines, um, physical and chemical properties, environmental fate and transport, engineering uh, processes uh, and exposure, um, general population, uh, consumer exposure, residential exposure scenarios and human health hazard and environmental hazard. Inventory trees and heat maps, um, are uh, going to be evergreen and the links will display updates. The updates can include uh, information references provided through public comment um, and through peer review submissions from the SAC and or public comments that are provided uh, through, the, through the public comment period for the FACA uh, reviews. The goal is to, um, to really provide um, these updates based upon full text screening results wherever possible. Um, and the updates um, will continue to occur um, prior to draft risk evaluation and then post um, draft risk evaluation um, finalization. Next slide, please. So for data quality uh, evaluation, uh, one of the key uh, improvements, and this uh, included a lot of discussion both within and across EPA um, was about the development of our uh, metrics um, and scoring. Um, we now moved away from scores to rankings and it's really a, um, a ordinal um, high, medium and low, one, two, three, or four. Four being uninformative um, for the overall study score, 
um, and the studies that are tagged as uninformative are considered in hazard ID, can be considered in the weight of evidence, but generally are excluded from consideration in dose response. And the reason they're excluded is because generally um, they don't have dose response information or the relationship between dose and response is not clear um, and quantifiable. And that's the reason why they're un uninformative for dose response. Um, next slide, please. Moving on to evidence integration um, shortly. Summary of our ranking approach. Uh, again, there's been a, a, a lot of comments in the press. We don't have numerical scores per study. We're not including weighting or metrics um, for weighting of the metrics or the domains at this point. Um, and there are public comments uh, about that that Kelly Fay will be speaking to in a, a minute. We've replaced uninformative for dose response with unacceptable and we've included the ordinal categorical rankings of high, medium, and low, and informative to, in the description of the, in, in the body of the, um, of, of the protocol and the appendices for transparency. Um, and again, we describe in this blue box um, how we get out, how we develop um, that ranking um, for a study in our appendix. Um, and really, it, it is something that's fairly egregious or fairly major that shifts a study um, metric into critically deficient and critically deficient into an uninformative ranking for the quantitative analysis. And one of the things that um, we've done and incorporated into our process is labeling, tagging studies that are methodologically um, uh, informative for the principal study um, and considering that together to make sure that we have for those methodologies that are cited in a particular study, we have all the information that's informative uh, for that study um, considered along with the critical study um, for the data evaluation. Next slide. So evaluation strategies for um, data Data information quality, again, it's a structured framework and it's qualitative compared to um, uh, quantitative. Uh, we've developed updated um, predefined criteria for all of these disciplines, all six of these disciplines, which, um, which is you know, rather comprehensive. I will say um, the in vitro and mechanistic um, uh, data, data types are varied highly varied. We have developed criteria for them and have applied it to numerous um, mechanistic types of studies, including um, PK, including in vitro approaches. Um, and there are opportunities for further development of additional uh, NAMS approaches as per needed um, in the TOSCA risk evaluation process. And we believe we have um, a data evaluation approach that can be applied and flexible for additional data evaluation of additional um, study types. Next slide. So I think some of this is repetitive. I do wanna say um, the new methods um, to reduce bias and improve evaluation consistency between reviewers and across chemicals uh, include additional training for reviewers, both our contractors as well as um, the EPA staff development of additional internal evaluation guidance, implementation of uh, calibration exercises. I cannot, cannot um, undersell the importance of our calibration exercises for consistency of criteria evaluation across reviewers um, and both the reviewer one, reviewer two in all our cases and pilot testing of the revised criteria was a key step in moving this effort forward um, so uh, we have consistently applied two levels of review for each quality evaluation um, and included conflict resolution where necessary. Um, generally, we find that the two levels of review, we get to um, fairly quick uh, uh, decisions and consistency based upon the calibration efforts that have occurred prior. Next slide, please. As I said before, I referred to um, uh, 
uh, considerations of bias and confounding in our different metrics, both for animal tox as well as epi. This is um, now tracked and, um, and included, and this crosswalk helps you see with regard to our, our different domains and metrics where um, risk of bias is actually being considered um, in our data evaluation process. Next slide. For evidence integration, uh, I'm not gonna go into great detail. We've included some detailed slides here for reference, um, but we'll save those for, this is to help you, the peer reviewers and help the public. And we will um, possibly have greater discussion and, and more probing questions about that during our um, discussion of charge question four. But again, to remind you, that are um, going from data evaluation to evidence integration, we are talking about multiple levels of evidence integration across um, disciplines, and we're talking about multiple levels of evidence integration um, with, with the different data types within a discipline. Um, so all of that comes together to inform uh, the strength of the evidence call which is outside of systematic review, which is part of the risk evaluation process. Next slide, please. So just a little bit more about the considerations within a body of evidence um, and in the evidence integration process, we've talked about um, there are multiple uh, considerations, both for hazard, both for environmental hazard and human health hazard, um, and then for exposure. And depending upon what type of exposure and the context of the exposure, PCHEM and FATE and transport are critically important for informing the contextualization, both for the pathways as well as the receptors um, that are under consideration. So we include um, all of this in our evidence integration. Next slide. And we provide a structured, structured approach. We've outlined the structured approach in the protocol in chapter um, seven of the protocol, uh, how we get to um, the strength of the evidence, how we get to coherence across uh, bodies of evidence and, and ultimately informing the overall weight of the evidence conclusions or judgments that are included in the, in the risk characterization is the output of the, of the evidence integration summary. Next slide. For um, some, some degree of detail, um, just wanted to highlight that evidence integration for human health in, in particular, um, how do we get to those evidence integration judgment levels? How do we document that? There are tables that are provided um, that include um, a narrative of the overall evidence integration judgment, what level you're at, and what, what degree of evidence has to be captured uh, or demonstrated for each of those levels. And that's table 7.7-12 uh, in chapter seven. Next slide. There's also um, tables uh, and a narrative to describe uh, this table captures some of the narrative in chapter seven to help um, illustrate uh, one of the recommendations, NASM's recommendations of uh, describing how you incorporate human, integrate human, animal, and mechanistic information in your different judgment levels. And this evidence profile summary is an attempt to try to illustrate how we and uh, facilitate discussions with our ORD partners on different levels of um, integration within the different data types um, for, um, at least for human health in this context. Next slide. We provided, um, and because there were a lot of comments um, and we've had ongoing discussions, well, with ORD as we're, re we're revising the IRIS handbook and um, uh, talking about the current um, current draft systematic review protocol, what are the descriptions that we use for um, evidence integration and how our terminology compares across our, um, our different approaches. 
And so we provide this just as an, as an example of some of our efforts to coordinate and uh, harmonize between the IRIS handbooks approach and the TOS draft TOSCA systematic review protocol. Um, since we will be using um, efforts um, developed by the IRIS program in our TOSCA approach. Next slide. And again, this is just a summary of um, the integration, higher level summary of the integration of animal, um, human, and um, evidence streams, other um, inferences across evidence streams into the overall um, evidence judgment. Next slide. So um, to describe just in brief um, what has transpired, we published the protocol in December, um, which finally made public our um, working um, uh, approach, systematic review approach, revised systematic review approach, and what we're applying uh, in the scope documents and um, what we will be developing um, uh, based upon public comment and peer review for our upcoming um, draft evaluations. The public comment period closed around um, February 19th of this year, additional comments, you know, clearing the docket, that's all publicly available and available to the committee. Um, we are providing a high level summary of those comments in the next presentation. Um, the SAC peer review meeting is this week, we expect um, with, you know, uh, the stars aligning that the peer review report minutes of this meeting will be expected around July. And we expect um, that the comments, but uh, public comments and the peer review recommendations from the SAC will be incorporated into a final um, protocol for um, being published around October timeframe and being implemented in the draft, upcoming draft risk evaluations. Next slide. And just to um, reiterate, it has taken a village, uh, a, a large village um, to uh, one, respond to the many public comments, the many peer review sessions that we've had both from the SAC and from the NASM workshops and from um, the more recent NASM report on the IRIS handbook. We are very cognizant of all of those um, public comments and incorporating um, that feedback uh, along with help from ORD and our sister offices uh, within OCSPP. Um, as well as numerous contractors uh, with different disciplinary expertise, um, both in eco, in exposure, um, and in systematic review methodologies um, and data science methodologies um, to help us um, streamline and, as I said, um, develop APIs that we can make this workflow, or workflow more efficient and traceable, um, which is a key, key part of um, getting this work online um, into, um, into an API. Um, last. And for links, uh, again, in these slides, I provided a link to the risk evaluation rule, our draft protocol for anybody um, who hasn't gone online and looked at the protocol already. I know the peer reviewers have, but for the public, there's a link to the previous NASM workshops. There's a lot of presentations that are available virtually and posters and so on that drill down on some of the innovations that I just touched on at a high level. For historical purposes, you'll see uh, a link to the 2018 uh, evaluation uh, for the applications of systematic review, our previous approach. Um, and it, it's quite, quite different in many ways. And then the NASM report on systematic review um, is also available here through this link. So with that, I'll take questions um, if there are any clarifying questions. Um, actually, uh, Stan is, is, uh, is our second presenter going to make a presentation because I have you listed as, uh, as a team. So That's fine. Dr. Faye be presenting? Dr. If Dr. She, Kelly Fay will present on the summary of the of the public comments. Um, yeah, he goes straight to that if there are no clarifying questions. 
No, we will have clarifying questions, but they're going to be after the break, if that's okay oh, with you. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. So if Dr. Fay, if you can uh, go ahead and load your presentation, that'd be great. And we'll move on and then we'll take a break and then handle the questions all together. Great. Thanks. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, thank you to the panelists and to our chair. I'm Dr. Kelly Fay. I'm in the I'm a team lead in the data gathering and analysis division and acting branch chief um, given Dr. Barone's recent departure. Um, and as stated, this will be just a high level summary of initial public comments on the draft systematic review protocol supporting task or risk evaluations for chemical substances. Um, go ahead and click to the next slide, please. Um, the intention here is really not to circumvent any discussion that we'll have uh, during this meeting, but hopefully to provide some opportunities for uh, clarifying um, some of the areas that were brought up during our public comment period. Um, uh, so as you know, this document was provided on regulations.gov for 60 days for the public to comment on it. We did receive a diversity of commenters, 11 different submissions that came from industry and trade associations, uh, environmental, public health, and animal rights advocacy groups, as well as an academic institution. And this presentation will just focus on a few of these comments that were particularly significant or were brought up by multiple stakeholders. And just for brevity in this presentation, TASCA SR protocol refers to the draft systematic review protocol supporting TASCA risk evaluations for chemical substances. HPS refers to high priority substances. And these are the substances that are designated as high priority for risk evaluations under TASCA section 6B. MRRE refers to manufacturer re requested risk evaluations. And PICO statements are a general reference to population exposure, comparator and outcome screening criteria, which are used for hazard and exposure disciplines, but also as well as the corresponding screening criteria for fate and engineering disciplines. WOSE refers to the weight of the scientific evidence and MOA refers to mode of action. Next slide, please. Um, as stated in Dr. Henry's presentation, we did receive a number of positive public comments um, during this period. And you've seen this slide before. The positive comments actually could have filled three slides, but we just wanted to highlight a couple that indicated the scope of our positive public comments, everything from the overall uh, transparency all the way to the you know, screening and literature searching as well as weight of evidence um, integration. Um, but I won't cover this again. Um, next slide, please. And of course, um, Dr. Barone also covered some of the general comments that have come back through our public comment periods and our NASM uh, review of some of our systematic review products. Here, we just want to cover some of the recommendations or criticisms that were received on the protocol, um, including here just the timing and the review of this protocol. Uh, one was that EPA should have provided the TASCA systematic review protocol for public comment prior to releasing the scoping documents or issuing test orders. And you know, the timing was really a result of competing statutory deadlines, as Dr. Henry described in detail our limited resources and numerous updates that we've made to the TASCA systematic review approaches since the release of our 2018 applications document. We have provided for public comment the searching and screening methods previously and the results for each of our 20 high priority substances and MREs in the draft scope documents. And generally there was an ask for additional review opportunities um, many opportunities are provided for review of our TOSCA SR products, including our draft scope documents, this protocol, and the forthcoming draft risk evaluations. We do anticipate that if there are substantive changes that are going to be incorporated into subsequent versions of this SR protocol, these will also be made available, available for public review. Next slide, please. There were also a number of comments about uh, the incorporation of potential additional data. Um, specifically, there is a recommendation to use our updated 
protocol approaches to supplement um, information collected using the 2018 approach. And to the extent that supplemental analyses are being conducted on the first 10 risk evaluations, the most current TASCA systematic review protocol will be applied to supplemental literature. Um, updates otherwise based upon SAC review will be published in the finalized TASCA SR protocol and the appendices of the draft risk evaluations. There was also a number of questions regarding um, how information, additional information might be incorporated into our process, specifically data from the public, data from additional supplemental searches, and data from test orders. Um, EPA is going to review and incorporate any reasonably available information that is relevant to the risk evaluation. EPA's risk evaluation rule defines reasonably available information as information that EPA possesses or can reasonably generate, obtain, or synthesize for use, considering the deadlines specific in TSCA Section 6B for prioritization and risk evaluation. Um, what this means is that EPA may not be able to fully incorporate new information if it's received during the very late stages of the risk evaluation. And we are considering how to clarify some of these timelines um, in the final published TASCA SR protocol. Next slide. Uh, one commenter in particular had a lot of recommendations on using a tiered approach for our problem formulation or PICO development, um, specifically how we should be screening out um, specific scenarios and how exposure models um, might be used to predict uh, sort of as a first tier. Uh, as a reply, EPA is using a tiered approach uh, in prioritization and scoping, which in turn both inform problem formulation and PICO development and screening for systematic review. Thank you, next slide. On the topic of problem formulation and PICO development, it was also acknowledged that there were some differences in our PICO statements between the title abstract and full text screening, as well as um, some differences across chemicals. Uh, this is true. There were some modifications of PICO statements made from the scoping documents to the draft SR protocol, which reflect incorporation of calibration results and other considerations from public comments on those scoping documents. And minor differences across PICO statements reflect chemical specific considerations. As calibration and conflict resolution of screening progressed, sometimes unique studies were identified that required clarification for screeners. In these situations, PICO statements were occasionally adjusted and the new statements were recorded within the screening software and also presented in our SR protocol. Next slide, please. On the topic of literature searching, there were some specific questions, concerns, and recommendations on some specific search sources, um, including academic studies. There seemed to be a divergence of opinions on whether these should be included. Some specific recommendations for, for national laboratory and agency reports, and some confusion about how existing assessments are used in our literature searching. EPA sources for searching, as described in the TASCA SR protocol, are extensive, comprehensive, and commensurate with the systematic review state of practice. These sources include academic studies published in peer-reviewed journals, national laboratory and federal agency reports, which are listed in Appendix E, and studies identified in, the, in existing assessments, um, also listed in Appendix E. And of course, the public may also provide additional reports or studies for consideration, and have done so during the public comment periods on the scope documents and on this SR protocol. Also on the topic of literature screening, there is some concern that EPA is using automated approaches for the entire screening process and an ask for some clarification on how study tagging was conducted, if this is a manual or automated effort and also what quality control measures are being implemented. So to clarify, EPA uses automated approaches in very targeted incidences, which is very consistent across OPPT's TASCA risk evaluations, as well as the IRIS program. And we apply a manual review at the following steps for title and abstract screening and tagging, as well as full text screening and tagging. We use two independent reviewers and also 
um, provide a conflict resolution for that process. For data evaluation and data extraction, we also use two reviewers, which provide a one reviewer provides an initial review or extraction, and another reviewer, a separate reviewer, provides the QC review. And just to clarify, we wanted to describe a little better the active screener approach. Um, when we use Swift Active Screener, uh, a manual review still occurs. Uh, Swift Active Screener is used to predict PICO relevant studies, but screeners manually review all of the studies until an algorithm can predict similar studies, which will likely be included. And each of these predicted includes is then manually reviewed and confirmed by our reviewers. Next slide, please. On the topic of data evaluation, um, there were some recommendations about specific types of studies that should be included um, or should be preferred or excluded. Specifically, GLP and guideline studies, it was recommended that these should be preferred and evaluated at a higher ranking. Um, alternatively, academic studies, it was suggested, should not be included. Studies from existing hazards hazard and risk assessments should be evaluated in the same manner. Uh, assessments of regulatory determinations from international jurisdictions should be given less weight. Just to clarify there, we don't use regulatory determinations from other jurisdictions. We do conduct our own evaluations. Studies on analogs used for read across should also undergo the same evaluation as primary studies. Exposure information provided under TOSCA Section 8D, there was a request for some clarity on how this information will be evaluated. So all of these studies, GLP and guideline studies, academic studies, studies on analogs, studies conducted pursuant to TOSCA test orders or 8D exposure studies, as well as studies found via our backward searching process from other assessments, are all evaluated with the same criteria relevant for the given discipline. Guideline study methods were considered in the evaluation criteria development, and all of the details on the data quality evalu evaluation criteria are provided in appendices K through T. Thanks, next slide. On our use of metrics, domains, and study validity, it was suggested that EPA should not exclude or downgrade studies with one critically deficient metric. Studies found to be critically deficient in one or more metrics are included in evidence integration, but these are not considered for quantitative analyses such as dose response. Also, there is a suggestion that EPA should not use reporting quality in assessing validity of a study. We do, EPA does use the quantity and the quality of reported information within a study to determine if data are useful. In doing so, EPA reviews full method descriptions reported by authors, including cited methods. EPA also evaluates the cited methods and links any of these references to the primary study. Next slide. Um, on the topic of data evaluation, and Dr. Barone covered this a bit in his presentation, um, we really had divergent comments received from multiple stakeholders on this issue of using a qualitative versus a quantitative data evaluation approach. On one end of the spectrum, we heard that the quantitative store scoring method is inappropriate and the use of an overall quantitative study quality rating is inappropriate. Um, again, quantitative scores for overall study quality give a false impression of precision within and across study types, and a, generally a criticism that EPA has not moved away from quantitative scoring just by removing the metric weighting that was described in the 2018 applications document. On the other end of the spectrum, we had stakeholders um, suggest that a prescribed systematic approach to characterizing study quality is as much as possible is necessary to remove subjectivity of individual reviewers. There is the argument that we needed to add back metric weighting as some metrics are considered to be more important than others. A recommendation to use the OHAT risk of bias tool for epidemiological studies, and also a, a criticism that individual assessors should not be able to alter the study quality ranking. Next slide, please. 
Again, on the side panel, you'll see sort of an overview of how our ordinal ranking is currently conducted. And we feel that EPA really takes kind of the middle ground in this approach. We really use a current process of ordinal ranking, which strives to provide a method that is sufficiently systematic to ensure consistency across our many study reviewers. It's transparent in its approach and its objective. At the same time, we also provide flexibility for ranking adjustment under rare situations which are required to be documented. And some of those flexibilities are described here. Next slide, please. Again, we've heard repeatedly that there are existing published approaches that we should be implementing. Uh, we have, EPA has considered several of these existing frameworks. Please see Appendix A1. But we do have the need for a fit for purpose approach that applies to data for all of our disciplines needed to conduct a TSCA risk evaluation. For human health hazard data evaluation, EPA has emphasized incorporating, harmonizing prior and ongoing IRIS systematic review approaches into the TSCA systematic review process. Next slide, please. On the topic of data extraction, uh, there was this suggestion to expand the data extraction tables to include modeled and read across data and their associated uncertainties. We Input parameters for modeling are evaluated through the data evaluation process of their source literature. Information obtained from analogs for read across will also be evaluated for data quality and extracted just in the same fashion as the studies for the subject chemical. Use of modeling and read across are systematic approaches employed in evidence integration, but are outside of the systematic review process. We refer back to that figure 3.1. Modeled and read across data will be included in the weight of scientific evidence tables. We also had a recommendation to have data extraction performed by two independent reviewers. Um, similar to the other response screening, uh, our screening approach includes two independent reviews. Two reviewers are also used for data evaluation, data extraction, but these are characterized as initial reviews and QC reviews. Next slide, please. On the topic of evidence integration, evidence integration should include considerations and uncertainties of calculating exposure, hazard, and risk values. Again, selection of model parameters and derivation of specific hazard or exposure values is outside of the scope of this systematic review protocol. And EPA will describe the approach to deriving these values in detail in the risk evaluations. There is also a recommendation that consideration of coherence both across evidence streams and across disciplines is important. Coherence across evidence streams, for example, epidemiolog epidemiological, animal toxicity, and mechanistic studies is described in the protocol as part of evaluating the weight of the scientific evidence. EPA does consider evidence integration across disciplines as part of the risk evaluation. Uh, an example provided in the protocol is that PCAM properties and release information can influence decisions on exposure pathways and affected ecological receptors. And the protocol should more explicitly describe considerations for mode of action analysis and application to cancer dose response. EPA considers evaluation of mechanistic studies as part of the TSCA SR mode of action analysis as part of the evidence integration process. Dose response analysis is part of the risk evaluation process, and again, is not covered in this systematic review protocol. Next slide, please. Along the same vein, uh, mechanistic data and new approach methods, including in silico methods, should be given greater weight of evidence weight in evidence integration. This is going to be a topic for one of our subsequent charge questions, and we look forward to discussing this with the panelists. Um, in respective discussions. Uh, evaluation of exposure model selection should incorporate considerations of peer review rigor and input parameters. Again, all EPA models and the Exposure Factors Handbook have undergone peer review. All newly published models also go through data evaluation and the input parameters are evaluated also through the data evaluation process of their source literature. Finally, it's unclear how or why the within-stream 
considerations for evidence integration differ from the IRIS synthesis process. We have harmonized with IRIS in many regards, but we do have a scope that's broader than the IRIS program. So in this sense, the TASCA SR protocol includes integration of a wider diversity of information to conduct a TASCA risk evaluation, including information subject to systematic review and information not subject to systematic review, such as modeling and QSAR results. Again, please refer to figure 3.1. Those are those conclude our preliminary replies and clarifications on some of the comments we received during the public comment period on our draft systematic review protocol. And I know we'll be taking a break shortly, I believe, and then um, be able to answer some specific questions. Thank you, Dr. Fay. Yeah, uh, at this point in time, let's go ahead and take uh, a 10 minute break and then we'll reconvene at that particular point and uh, Dr. Fay and Barone can be uh, present for questions of clarification. We'll do that at, at uh, 10 past the hour. See you in 10 minutes.
Will, can you hear me? I can. I can hear you. Excellent. <laughs> Good. Okay. Thank you. You'd be back. All right. Thank you. Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, at this point in time, um, we will uh, have some questions for the agency uh, for the presentation. But before we do that, uh, Dr. Lamb has actually joined us uh, during the, the presentations. And uh, at this point, I'd like to have her introduce herself, uh, state her affiliation and her expertise. Dr. Lamb. Hi hey everyone, good morning. Uh, my name is Julian Lamb. I'm with the California State University East Bay campus. I'm in the Department of Public Health and my areas of expertise are in environmental health, environmental health policy, risk assessment, and systematic review. Uh, my apologies for joining uh, late this morning. No worries, thanks for that. Okay, um, so let's move transition into our questioning period. And let me just remind the committee this is the time uh, where, uh, based upon what you've read or what you've heard in the presentations uh, this morning, uh, this is your opportunity to, to ask uh, the agency specific questions. So uh, the idea is to try to get you guys to answer the questions now so that when we get to the, 
the formal questions and, and discussions around our questions that we're not bantering back and forth with the agency, so to speak. So, uh, and, and so I'd like it if we could actually get all of our questions answered, asked during this period, rather than uh, having to go back and forth uh, throughout the, the, uh, the latter parts of our, our, uh, our discussion. Um, so with that, uh, yeah, just raise your hand and I will call on you uh, as, as I see you on my screen. So uh, at first period, uh, we've got uh, Dr. Johnson. Thank you, sir. And Dr. Barun, thank you for a great presentation. I can appreciate how much work all this is. Um, my question involves hazard identification on tables 12 and 14. And uh, I would, my question is, do you evaluate each of the toxic endpoints separately? And then, after you evaluate the animal evidence, I guess the uh, human evidence, maybe the in vitro mechanistic evidence, then you then uh, look across all those lines to determine if you have sufficient evidence for an effect? Dr. Johnson, you captured it. Awesome, okay, that's what I was- We do, I, I we do the evaluation, the distiller approach that we use and the way we describe it, hopefully it's clear in the protocol, we do look at each outcome. Okay, great. And the only other question I had is uh, your two reviewers, are they blind to each other? Are they blind to each other? On data evaluation, they are not blind to each other, okay. generally speaking. All right, thank you. Okay, Dr. Chisholm. Sorry, um, this is Chris Chasen. Uh, first of all, I wanted to compliment the agency on the presentation. It answered several uh, points that I had been interested in before. Uh, two uh, questions of clarification. Um, uh, as I was reviewing this over the past months, um, in the back of my mind, I, I kept thinking about, what, does the system learn uh, as uh, the agency um, receives uh, comments as they go through the chemicals in the future and learn about possible improvements uh, for either the quality of the whole system or the uh, efficiency of it. And in slide nine of Dr. Faye's presentation there, she noted that, um, that the information search could be upgraded per their experience for both uh, for the quality uh, as they learn about new um, sources of information. Are there opportunities for such learning to be incorporated into the process more broadly and other steps or in the overall process? And, uh, or is there a provision in the law and, and EPA implementation for improvements like that? That's so my first short, question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chaseland. So the first thing, the an quick answer to your question is yes. The, the law and the rule do not prohibit us from learning. Um, what the law and the rule are asking us to do is to document and to provide transparency. So the systematic review protocol and the approach, um, as already indicated, improvements take place in different parts of the process. So we are trying to, one, document where those improvements occur, whether they're at the scoping phase or in the protocol, the release of this protocol, we will have, uh, I'm sure, additional um, recommendations from you all for improvements. Those will be documented in our appendices for the specific chemical uh, draft chemical evaluations. Um, so we anticipate um, uh, lessons learned as well as incorporation of recommendations from the SAC in that process. The other thing that I mentioned, at least with regard to data evaluation, um, we are looking at this sort of evergreen approach using Tableau and Hawk to make available information, newer information um, in the um, data evaluation process. 
Thank you. Um, my second question was uh, regarding Dr. Faye's slide number six. Um, <clears throat> there was a rec there were she has three bullet points here for recommendations to use a tiered approach to screen out specific scenarios, etc. Two seven already. Are you on two seven already? You're still just getting out. Just leaving the house. Um. Ali, you're getting some feedback. Um, can you go pick up some food for me from the Trinity place? Kurt, you're you're yeah. on. Uh, you're. Um, you know where you know how to find it. Will Kurt, can you mute. Thank you. Kurt, you're on. Okay. Go ahead, Doctor Chase. Oh, uh, okay. Um, Sorry. I, I didn't understand. With was this recommendation being considered, uh, or, or. Um, a tiered so, approach is, I, I would just speak to this slide. I wasn't too sure yeah. what it meant in terms of what we, you were adopting. So provisionally, all recommendations are being considered at this point. Um, what we're replying to is what we did. We're trying to clarify what we have done, what we are doing. Um, we haven't made any quote unquote decisions yet. And we will make decisions after we receive the SAC panel's recommendations and further public comments today. Was there a, in, the, in whoever this recommendation came from, was there um, some priority or rationale about the screening out process or taking out specific scenarios that we can look at? And maybe uh, uh, comply, you know, add some commentary to it. Kelly, do you want to um, talk a little bit more about the specific comment, please? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. It, it was a pretty lengthy response. I don't know that I can do it justice by summarizing all of the details. I think they had a number of recommendations. Um, there was a lot of focus on that last bullet, the exposure. Uh, if we could use as a first tier some off the shelf model predictions and then maybe we wouldn't have to go and dig deeply into the literature to find mm. all of the exposure information that we currently uh, consider. So I think, you know, I think the intention was probably to help EPA narrow its focus um, and, you know, hone in um, our resources basically. So, but again, you know, I think it was sort of a lengthy response with a, a few recommendations. These, uh, especially the screen out and the uh, off the shelf model prediction really gets to the heart of some of the issues we're considering in, in this review. So if it's possible to um, identify this recommendation for, um, for our consideration and, and um, to be able to opine on that, um, I, I would certainly appreciate that opportunity. Dr. Chaselin, this is Stan Barone. So all of the public comments are available to you. We're trying not to um, do uh, interpretation uh, of the comments for you. We're just highlighting um, some of the major comments and at least trying to make it clear uh, what we did and what we're doing as it relates to the protocol to facilitate your right. critical evaluation. So we, we don't want to, um, um, you know, pre pre assess or pre judge uh, the public comments and your uh, um, appraisal of those. Uh, I'm just asking for identification sure. of the of this um, recommendation so that I could read it in, in mm -hmm. detail. Is I that think possible? We can I think we can help the DFO help you identify those, yes. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you again. Okay, uh, Dr. Wong. Um, thank you for the presentations. They are very, very informative. And I have a slight small question and a comment on the um, evidence profile summary slide, slide 29 in Dr. Barron's talk. Um, the table is very nice. Um, I wondered you know, if it's already in the in the draft and I missed it, or is something that um, not there yet? Very astute, Dr. Wang. It is not there yet. It actually is a product of our conversations, internal conversations with ORD, 
Um, and we put it out there because in the narrative, it's captured in the narrative, uh, we, but we have not included the table as of yet. So it, it kind of is a new piece of how the structure, how the narrative is laid out. Um, I think um, Dr. Keith Jacobs could provide some further comments. Well, I would well, recommend including that in the- Yeah, um, the, the, the comparison graph. table is sort of a, a, to help edify the committee on what our conversations are between the IRIS handbook and, and, the, um, and the evidence profiles that are prepared um, in our approach. But that table on evidence profiles is, is still part of active conversations. Okay. Oh, yes, I can. Can you hear me? This is yes. Yes. Jacobs, Keith Jacobs, EPA. Um, yes. As Dr. Burns said, if you're talking about the actual classification table, that is Table 7 14 in the uh, protocol. So that is in there. We just did not have a specific comparison and contrast with the IRIS handbook as that's laid out. Yeah, your you, audio you know, is not coming sorry, through. Sorry, I heard that. Can you hear me better now? Uh, it's not that much better. It, you're um, you kind of oppressed. It's twangy. <laughs> yeah. What about, what about now? Uh, we can hear you. It's just not very high quality. That's all. It should be better. Uh, yeah, it's a little better. Yeah. My headphones, I think. So, sorry. Table 7-14. Is the, you can find the classification of weighted the scientific evidence and has those different causal determinations. We just did not include the comparison with um, the IRIS handbook. So that could be something we might consider at our presentation. Okay, thanks. Okay. I have a second question. Um, the data stream that's not subject to systematic review, um, things like analog and other things, they could be from published studies. And so how do you divide it? Do you go by where you get it? Or do you divide it by the data type to determine if it goes through the systematic review process? Good question. This is Dan Barone again, responding to you, Dr. Wang. So it does go by what the source is. So if it's coming from, uh, if the analog is coming from, for example, um, AIM, our analog identification methodology, it's a tool, a model, um, it's peer reviewed, and that is um, not necessarily going through systematic review. So that's a systematic approach. Um, and the same could be said for our exposure modeling. Again, that's a systematic approach, um, not necessarily going through systematic review. However, an analog study that uh, we identify that fills a data gap um, for a particular um, species or a particular outcome that we feel is relevant would go through systematic review and the same data evaluation criteria. So there's a distinction about where the source of the information is, systematic approach versus systematic review. I hope that helps to clarify. And we tried to, we spent a good bit of time in the protocol trying to make that clear and with the figures. Um, and it, it, it is complicated because um, the source of the information um, generally are looking at through a systematic review process, but there are gaps being filled through a systematic approach. Okay. Thank you. Great. Uh, Dr. Prisbolo. Yes, thank you for the presentation. I'm curious if you can comment on the decision to use distiller in the data extraction, no, the data evaluation phase as opposed to Hawk, and is that in line with the IRIS protocol? Interesting you asked ask that question, Dr. Prisbola. Um, so we are in conversations with ORD about Hawk and Distiller. 
There are advantages and disadvantages to Hawk and Distiller. Distiller provides us a, a, a lot more detail and a lot more um, flexibility uh, for our data valuation and data extraction. Um, we are looking, this is part of our future developments, looking to go to a one platform approach. Um, and again, Hawk has been primarily focused on human health endpoints um, and our distiller um, approaches um, cut across all our disciplines. Um, so the reality is um, right now, Hawk doesn't do everything we need to do. It could in the future, and we hope um, we hope to be able to do that because the visualizations in Hawk uh, and the user friendliness of Hawk um, is, is has a lot of advantages. And Distiller, for those that have used Distiller, it's a, quite a, a powerful tool in the systematic review community. Uh, but it is wonky. Uh, that's a technical term. Uh, don't mean to. Per, per, be pejorative of anybody's product, but it it um, it has some interesting um, technical issues. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Wyckoff. Great, thank you. Um, I have two questions as well. Uh, first. Regarding Dr. Brown, your your presentation slide fifteen, which is Figure three one in the in the protocol, as I understand it, the, the figure was very helpful. By the way, um, overlaying systematic review with the scoping and risk evaluation process. And what I'm hoping to have clarified is when the the process formally ends, which I understand to be at evidence integration, but then there are subsequent steps in the risk evaluation which utilize the information from systematic review, but aren't, you're not really classifying those as part of the systematic review. And so specifically, would elements like identification of critical health effects and points of departure, are those regarded as subsequent to the systematic review, but relying on the systematic review information as an example? You got it perfectly, Danielle. Okay. Okay, that's, so those, that's the whole point. Okay. Just that make, is make the point. Sure. Okay. Okay. Super. And then my second question, you mentioned training in, in your presentation as well and, and some staffing. Are, are the staff that are doing these assessments, the scientists, are the same people doing the systematic review and the subsequent risk evaluation steps or are those different people? Actually, they overlap quite a bit. Okay. Uh, we do have a team approach with our contractors and with our internal staff. Um, and the calibration occurs with both contractors and internal staff uh, to make sure that we have consistency um, uh, across disciplines, but also across chemicals. Um, so in, as primary and secondaries, uh, in some cases, folks are working on quote unquote, an assessment that is systematic review of an assessment that is theirs. In some cases, it won't be their chemical, but there it is a team approach. We have to have a team approach. It, it's such a large effort. Certainly. And, and, and on that note, is the team, could you speak a little bit to the multidisciplinary nature? And clearly the scope is so broad. Exposure scientists, occupational. Can you give a composition of a typical team? Yeah, for our systematic review team, uh, when you look across the um, disciplines, we have engineers, chemical engineers, process engineers, we have industrial hygienists, all looking at our um, uh, occupational exposure information, occupational release information. Our exposure scientists cut across the gamut of data types, um, experimental modeling, survey, um, and um, and monitoring studies. So there's many different data types. Hazard, again, hazard includes both animal tox, it includes epidemiology, it includes mechanistic, um, PVBK, ADME experts. Um, so it does cut across multiple, um, multiple types of disciplines in our teams to evaluate um, the multiple data streams that we have to evaluate um, in evaluation 
and in immigration. Got it. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Cobb. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, I want to. I want to commend the agency for moving away from the regulatory nexus. That was a big point of contention in the past. And I, if nothing else, please hear that. Um, so the first question I have relates to um, uh, exposure pathways and it's on, it's on Dr. Barone's slide too. There's no exposure pathways for products and packaging. And is that simply a slide size shape space matter or is that not it seemed like that was considered in the in the review it is um, i'm sorry it is a space issue it's just, um, but exposure coming from packaging is considered um, a, a condition of use processing part of the condition of use so okay. we are I, evaluating I, any uh inherent exposures um from those from those conditions of use Okay, that, that, that's what I thought. I wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Um, now, I've got several questions here. And then on, on slide 16, again, of Dr. Barone's uh, presentation, there's some wording there uh, on the second time um, things are excluded. It says excluded studies tagged for further consideration. Does that mean those studies were considered further and excluded, or does that mean these were excluded but we look to double check that they should be excluded. I, I, I got confused there on that slide. The stamp around again from EPA. Yes, we will look um, oftentimes to check the exclusion. And particularly for the supplemental studies, what gets tagged as supplemental studies, um, because we come back to the supplemental studies, particularly mechanistic, when they get a mechanistic tag, it, and we talked about this previously in the um, review of the first 10, you know, if it's genotox, if it's a, um, different ca cancer mechanisms, um, if it's related to um, aggregate or cumulative um, approaches um, that we might use, and it gets into that tag for supplemental, um, it will be potentially excluded from the first round and put into the supplemental um, bin for second, for uh, additional evaluation. So we're trying to tier what are the primary data for uh, data evaluation. And then um, there's this other tier for supplemental evaluation. We're, we're, we've articulated this in the protocol, but uh, implementing it in the workflow um, is, is, um, is another issue. It's a resource issue. Yeah, I understand. And, and it, it's a cyclical thing, so it's it's hard to word sometimes. I, I get it. So thank you for that clarification. One more question, and then I'll, I'll be done. This one may be a little bit beyond the scope, so I apologize. So when, when you're using a machine learning system and you're trying to harmonize the TOSCA review, which is broader than just human health, with the IRIS review, how, what, if anything, has the agency done to consider not having drift of the searches such that information that would be relevant to Ecotox doesn't end up getting excluded by trying to harmonize with the IRIS review? Um. I think I understand your question, Dr. Cobb. So the, um, the hazard approach we, for, for ECO, the, the machine learning is not, we're not excluding based upon human health hazard. Um, the seeds and the approach are different. Um, so, you know, and again, based upon the PICO, we are, we are inclusive, more inclusive, tend to be more inclusive rather than exclusive, um, which is another reason why our um, approach is somewhat resource intensive and laborious. Excellent. Th thank you for clarifying that statement. Okay, Dr. Goyak. Hi, yeah, uh, thank you for all, oh, this is Dr. Goyak, uh, Katie Goyak. Um, 
Thank you for all the information. It was really helpful to understand. One really small clarification on terminology. Uh, so I noticed in the glossary of terms that you showed, you had both um, strength of evidence and also confidence level. Uh, I don't see the confidence level definition in the glossary in the systematic review protocol. So I was wondering if you could, if you could provide some information on, you know, are those two related? What's the distinction between strength of evidence and confidence level and how they're being used? Yeah, they, they are different. The strength of the evidence really comes from evidence integration. Um, the confidence level, which we could include in the glossary, thank you for um, catching that. Um, I'm making a note. Um, really gets at the um, risk characterization and, uh. um, and what we have to do in the weight of the scientific evidence for the risk characterization, the confidence level that we assign for um, our uncertainty. And we, um, we are re we're required um, to make that, to make those um, judgments. So um, we, can, we can make that more clear, but that is outside of systematic review. Yeah, that, that actually with that explanation, I, I think that maybe that makes sense why it's not in the systematic review protocol. So, oh, so, so thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Lamb. Thank you. I, this is Julian Lamb here. So um, I have two questions. I'll start with the first one. In Dr. Fay's presentation, they spoke um, about in the peer review, um, in the peer comments, there was a statement about the kind of difference in the PICO statement uh, between the title and abstract and the full text screening process. And in addressing that, it kind of sounded like the changes that were being made to the PICO statement in the full text screening were clarification or additional directions that came from the title and abstract screening. So I was wondering if EPA could clarify whether these changes that were made um, are kind of in the process of screening the title and abstract references and whether or not that means that the articles are being screened using the exact same criteria in title and abstract and full text screening, or are these changes being made after the articles have been screened in title and abstract and therefore two separate PICO statements really are accurate in how they're being screened? Good question, Dr. Lamb. So the, the um, in actuality, there are um, modifications taking place between title and abstract and um, full text. And we're trying to document that. We're also trying to document that there are um, additions and or clarifications of the PICO um, at full text. Um, and that comes from the calibration exercises and the piloting. Once we get into full text, we found um, additional things, particularly for specific chemicals, uh, 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 as an example, um, asbestos too. Uh, where additional um, clarification to the PICO was required. Uh, so, so there are, we are trying to capture this as a best practice. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, under, the underpinning of, of that documentation. Okay, thank you. And then my second question, um, so we've talked about this a little bit already about the, the quantitative scoring system and, and how uh, in general, NASA and the SACC has previously recommended against that. And so now EPA has um, said that they are moving away from quantitative scoring and using this um, categorization instead. Um, but it does seem like the EPA is still using quantitative scoring within that process. Is that right? So the quantitative scores are being used in order to make that determination of how the studies become categorized into these quali qualitative categorizations. So I was wondering if EPA could talk a little bit more about this new approach that they've proposed and how they see this as different than using quantitative scores, and in particular, um, how this process addresses limitations that were raised by NASA and, and the SAC regarding limitations of using quantitative scores in general. So the, the issue of ranking one, two, three, and four, which are essentially the analogs of high, medium, and low for each metric, we're summing the one, two, three, and four, high, medium, and low for all the metrics across all the domains to come up with the overall steady ranking. 
And as you um, indicate, there is a ordinal numerical ranking that is summed to get to the total ranking, which is divided by the number of metrics. So it's a fairly simple arith arithmetic um, way to get at the ordinal overall ordinal rank. That's what it, that's what we're currently using. There's no fancy um, weighting within metrics, uh, between metrics or across domains. Um, and we are not, um, and this received a lot of uh, uh, criticism, we are not using that a numerical output of that ranking or the study to compare studies, to discriminate between studies or between um, uh, data types. The Academy was very, very critical of that perception. Even in some of the discussions of previous SAC meetings, uh, there was public comments or discussion of this study is better, it's a 1.6 is better than a 1.7. Um, the false sense of precision that that um, leads to or could lead to, um, we felt had um, we felt that the recommendations were um, strong in moving away from that approach. If the committee has um, suggestions or recommendations um, for weighting or for uh, additional considerations that we could use or implement in the um, in the evaluation approach, we would um, we would like to hear that. And that's part of charge question number four, by the way. I mean, excuse me, charge question number three. Okay, uh, Dr. Pelch. Hey, yes, this is Katie Pelch. Thank you very much for the presentations today. I had just a couple of questions. Regarding figure 4.1, which I believe you showed in your presentation, Dr. Brown, I was wondering if you could clarify what the different line styles mean in that figure. There are lots of lines going in lots of different directions. And I wasn't I'm, sure if that was intentional. Dr. Pelch, I'm sorry, I'm, which slide did you say? I'm not sure which slide it was. It didn't have a slide number, but it's figure 4.1 in the document. Figure. Slide 13, maybe? Stan, it's the figure that shows all the software we're using. Yes, oh, that oh, sorry. That's slide 13. Oh, okay. Slide 13. Um, so I think the dash lines, uh, to be honest, the dash lines are where we're still working on APIs. Dr. Pelch, um, the rest of the lines show, uh, solid lines show what is already underway or uh, we already have APIs, um, good APIs for. And there are, again, instances like Swift Review and Distiller where we hopscotch um, across uh, to Distiller depending upon the particular approach. Okay. So then that leads me to my next question, which there is a lot of movement, of course, between the different tools with the different, um, with references moving from one tool to another and sometimes back. And so I was just curious if EPA could speak to any level of consistency check across time within a specific um, review and perhaps across reviews, but more specifically within a review, if there's kind of an overarching um, check of completeness and that, you know, as you mentioned, there are some wonky things sometimes to make sure that, you know, everything is appropriately where it is, should be. Yeah. yeah. So let me be, no, let me be up maybe a little clearer. Um, this, this particular figure doesn't really map as well, to, it's trying to describe where things are in the workflow. Um, but to a little more detail, Swift Review, Swift Active, and Distiller can be used in the screen. Distiller, 
what is distinct is distiller houses all, all of the data evaluation records for the studies and for the chemical or the chemical project. So all the information for, um, for uh, the, the particular data evaluation is contained within one program. The labeling and tagging can come from different parts or different tools. And eventually all of that labeling and tagging will reside in Hero with the Hero reference and in Distiller. Um, and those two are, the Hero is our repository uh, for all our PDFs um, that are used in, um, in our um, uh, systematic review program. And there may be multiple chemical projects um, that, are, that are labeled for in Hero, but Distiller is where the actual um, um, uh, root data lives right now. And one of the previous questions was about distiller versus hawk. And in the future, um, we may have more of that information going over to hawk um, that right now we're primarily using hawk um, for visualizations for the evidence trees, uh, excuse me, evidence maps and uh, lit trees. Um, but again, those are, those are the devil's in the details to, to, to expand that effort. Thank I you. Class. Yes, that, that is helpful. Um, my next question was this, I, I feel like the term included and excluded are used a little bit loosely, and I'm not sure if I'm misinterpreting that. So I wanted to better understand if there's a general inclusion, exclusion, assignment to a study, or if that's more included and excluded within a specific discipline. For example, a study that it has um, biomonitoring data or exposure data would be excluded from the health hazard discipline, but it would be included in the exposure discipline. So I wasn't sure how those labels are applied to a particular study. So the PICO, RISO, and um, PISO is for every single discipline. And we work hard to develop that and calibrate around that and do our, you know, try our, our testing around that during the searching, uh, during the screening process, title and abstract and the full text screening, which we've already talked about. And it is specific to each discipline. So um, depending upon the full text screening, um, this and the the discipline, um, whether it's included or excluded. Epi for epidemiology, for example, could be included for both exposure and for epidemiology, or it could be excluded for, for exposure and just included for epidemiology. Um, so there are exposure components of the epidemiology study that are considered in epidemiology. Um, and we've worked hard to try to harmonize um, those two disciplines to the degree possible, but there's still some overlap um, between, the, between the two data evaluation forms. All right, thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Reif. Hi, um, this is David Reif, uh, NC State University. I'm um, on the SAC member. Um, my question was about uh, trying to understand the study quality ratings. Um, and it's for some of the comments for the questions you know, tomorrow, the charge questions. Um, do those ratings endure across, you know, if, if I have rated a given study um, and it comes up 10 chemicals down the line and something else, is there any sort of, of tracking of the quality ratings or do those, is it a connected only to the particular evaluation? So I think you're talking about the distinction between PICO relevance. That's going to depend upon the chemical or the project. Um, but for the actual study evaluation, data evaluation of the study, that is going to be relatively consistent across um, multiple systematic reviews. And there are cases, cases where that might vary if additional information becomes available 
um, additional methodologies are revealed and say, for example, some of the methodology that was employed in that study is now um, determined to be, you know, have problems, methodological concerns that later on that study could get a, a, a potentially a downgrading in the data valuation. But we, we, do, we, we do and will look at studies across multiple chemicals. We're doing that now. Um, and in many cases, um, we have many studies that include evaluation of more than one chemical. So naturally, um, those data evaluations uh, serve multiple purposes. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. It just seems like the, the nature of publications now are perhaps not always one chemical, but yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Doucette. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is Bill Doucette. Uh, Dr. Barone, on, on slide 23, it's uh, process improvements to data evaluation. So basically, it, it's kind of a follow-up to the, the discussion that you had on training uh, individuals. And I think that is really key and, and often overlooked, uh, you know, how important it is to, to be consistent within the reviewers. You talked a little bit about the, the consultants versus the EPA staff. And I, I wondered if there was any discussion in including uh, a slide like this or information related to this slide actually in the, in the systematic uh, draft protocol, because I think that's, you know, the training part is really, really key. And then additionally, if you could just tell me a little bit about what you mean by calibration exercises, uh, that would be helpful. Yeah, I'm going to um, pitch to one of my um, key uh, leaders in this area uh, on calibration, Dr. Uh, uh, to Amy Benson. Um, but just in brief, we have included text in the protocol about the importance of uh, calibration across all the disciplines right. and calibration um, uh, training at multiple steps in the systematic review process. At, at um, full text screen, title and abstract full text screen with the PICO um, and with regard to the data evaluation criteria um, for the chemical or chemical project. Um, Amy, would you, would you like to add anything to that? Yes, just that we have done calibration during data evaluation and we include contractors and EPA staff and everyone looks at the same study to do that calibration. And then we have discussions over, over multiple meetings to do that. We've done that for um, hazard. So I was doing it for animal toxicity, but we have a variety of other people doing it for other disciplines. And they've spent quite a bit of time trying to make sure the calibrations are, are um, well done uh, across, you know, when they come to some consensus across um, contractors and EPA staff. And one, uh, just one other piece is that we have develop some guidance documents to, to really kind of get into some of the details on, on sticky issues. And, and to, to amplify on Amy's point, uh, it's across data types. So um, not, we, we do this calibration for different study types to make sure um, that all the staff understand for this particular study type, this, these particular data evaluation criteria um, do we understand, do we all as a team understand um, and interpret the meaning of the evaluation criteria? And it is amazing, um, you know, different experience, different backgrounds, um, people can interpret the same words in very different ways. So that calibration and that training um, really is key um, to uh, making sure that we have full understanding and we, when we go to implementation, um, we're, we're providing more consistent results and leads to less conflict resolution, frankly. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Barrow. Hi, thank you. Um, Dr. Brown, I'm referring to your slide uh, 15, figure 3.1, because I, I think that's a really important figure. It's also in the protocol in terms of understanding the entire uh, process. And I just want to, um, 
so as EPA is defining the systematic review process, it's those four steps in blue. That's, is that correct? That's correct, Dr. Barron. Okay. And so uh, my question is, how um, do you map the, what data get to go through those four steps to your PICO questions? And I know in response to Dr. Wong, you said that the decision to go through the systematic review process will depend on the data source, but each systematic review should have a defined PICO or RISO or you know, whatever type of question. So how do you get from the broad um, you know, scoping question to the individual questions for the systematic reviews? And then I have one minor question after that. Thank you. So we've, we've defined and captured all the peer reviewed literature. Um, so from any peer review source, um, we've also defined that um, the gray literature um, may come from multiple pathways, multiple sources, including TSCA submissions. And there are multiple and myriad types of, uh, of data that come to us through TSCA submissions. What I was trying to distinguish is there are gap-filling approaches, generally modeling and prediction approaches, which are not primary data. And those are not going through systematic review. So those are used in the evidence integration for the weight of the scientific evidence. And that is that yellow box, um, step box five going to step six. Together, that is to help inform the weight of the scientific evidence, but the primary data, the primary data is coming through systematic review. And do each of those have a, a refined question or is uh, the question the larger um, TSCA evaluation question? It's the larger evaluation question. It has to be relevant to the chemical and relevant to the PICO but it's not going through systematic review. It's a systematic approach that a peer reviewed model that is helping to supplement contextually or substantively the range of predictions, but it's not primary data, okay, generally you. speaking. Great, thank you. And just one other question. Uh, uh, a key step often in a systematic review process is development of the protocol for the specific systematic reviews. And so does that um, occur at any point? So this is one of the challenges we've had, and Dr. Henry spoke to this, uh, putting out a protocol before, uh, before you even start um, any of your work. We are um, publishing our draft protocol in stream We've done our prioritization, the prioritization work and the scoping work is being captured in this draft protocol. We are um, basically telegraphing what we're planning to do in data evaluation and uh, evidence integration with this draft protocol. We have not actually completed data evaluation or evidence integration for any of the chemicals uh, in play. Um, and so this is still, a, this is a draft protocol that will be implemented um, as we move through this process. Okay, thank you. Hey, Dr. Rooney. Hey, Stan, uh, appreciate your answer to the question. And can I follow up on um, Lisa's question from the previous one? That protocol is, is great. Um, and, um, also, there's complication because the whole document we're reviewing is called the protocol, but we're not asking about that. The chemical specific protocol that you just said, um, and I believe you said at a very logical time, after you've started this problem formulation or completed problem formulation and you're scoping and you've done some of the initial searches, then you're going to release a protocol for the specific chemical. Is, is that correct? No, no, no. Let me, let, me, let me try to reframe. Do it. Because the protocol, the generic method, is the document you're reviewing. What you're also reviewing 
is the chemical specific appendices, which is the approach we are taking for every specific chemical. So we are presenting you a hybrid approach, which includes the generic and the okay. chemical specific. And when are you releasing the chemical specific, which I would call a protocol? The, this is our protocol for each of the chemicals. We are not going to go back. We have no plans to go back and do the individual chemical protocol based upon um, you know, trying to separate out everything that's being described here into a individual protocol. We do plan. So, so Iris, the Iris program developed chemical specific ones. Other people in the systematic review can very a, a specific protocol for each chemical and hazard evaluation or combined or risk assessment or ecologic, whichever they're doing. And so where would I find something most similar to that in that chemical specific appendix? Correct. It's all in this document and that makes it large, but the appendices for the chemical specificity addresses your question for both exposure and hazard and so on. So okay. we, we are, we are trying to be as efficient as possible by capturing the generic in the body of the document and the specific for the chemicals in the chemical specific appendices. A hundred percent respect that other agencies struggle with the same thing. Time, it's hard. Yeah, time, yeah. effort. Um, but, and it makes a lot of sense. Um, I would say, this is more of a discussion than a question, so I'm just going to quickly say it because you've already articulated your point, is that calling the framework document, which is what I would call what you have, a protocol, confuses the systematic review and the public that are not familiar with a general methods to be called a protocol. That's me editorializing. If you want to respond, go ahead. Otherwise, I can ask my question. Yeah, so... This was something we had uh, uh, extensive discussion in our NASM workshop, and uh, many of the committee um, were in agreement because there was a lot of repetition um, that this was a, a reasonable approach to proceed with. Um, and we have discussed this again with ORD, and sure. we, we, uh, we are actually aligned. Um, and in, in many respects. Um, and again, when you start looking at groups of chemicals, um, we, we will probably see more alignment in the future. Sure, been there. I apologize, that was following up on Dr. Barrow's question. I understand. I, I, understand. I had a this question of my own, which was um, on the slides 13 and 14, uh, when you're introducing SWIFT and, and some of the prioritization as well as the machine learning. Um, the machine learning with uh, Swift Active, or you could use the machine learning approaches uh, for prioritization in uh, Distiller as well with their AI models. But I have no concern of how those described or how they're used or your screening. I, I, I'm asking how Swift Review is being used. Um, and my first question is, do you have a calibration or pilot step when you're using Swift Review or is that using the off the shelf approaches? Um, both, actually. There are certain filters which we use off the shelf, but there's general, generally we're piloting as well. Okay, excellent. And so if you're using their built-in strategies for SWIFT um, review in order to process by your three disciplines, I think that's what you're calling them, um, the fate and chemical properties, the environmental hazard and the human health hazard. Um, that's just using their off-the-shelf built-in categories, right? Um, I will have to pitch to my team okay. and get back uh, to you. My follow-up to that is my understanding, that's not been validated. Um, so I'd be interested in whether you're using the off-the-shelf and um, what you're relying on for 
validation. And then um, why not simply put it into Swift Active or Distiller, which would re would prioritize through re-ranking and you'd never have to screen the ones that weren't relevant. So you're not saving time. Yeah, I, let me get back to you on this particular question because I think I, I need to have some discussion with the team. Sure. I, don't, I don't think the seeds that we're using, depending upon discipline, um, that's, what I'll, that's what I need let, to articulate yeah. more clearly. Let me know if you need um, and somebody can correct me on what I'm allowed to send you for clarifying if you want a direct question. Um, I'm sure my chair will let me know what I can do to, to help get the answer clarified for you. Thanks, Dan. Okay, thank you. And if the chair doesn't mind, we'll try to respond after the lunch break. Yes, um, that's totally fine. Um, maybe even I after to, the... I need to caucus with... Yeah, even after the public commenters actually... Yes, yes, totally thanks. Great. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Dr. Myers. Hi, um, I, I wanna come back to this idea of what data is actually being put through the systematic review versus what data is using systematic methods. And I think this is a really important point. So the supplemental data, as I understand it, is getting, it may not be reviewed in the actual systematic review, but it's being brought back again later, similar to some of the models, is that correct? So, I think we just conflated two things. So I want to, Dr. Myers, I want to make sure supplemental, what we're labeling supplemental still can, will go through the systematic review process. So at least in, in our uh, terminology, uh, what gets tagged as supplemental um, is still going through systematic review. For the gap filling exercises and back on figure 3.1, uh, whether we're talking about um, analog approaches or modeling approaches or QSARs or generic scenarios, we are trying to fill gaps or contextualize information um, that is a systematic approach that is generally coming from a peer-reviewed approach or a peer-reviewed model. It is not necessarily going through systematic review. It's not. Okay, so, so we're trying to make that distinction because, I, again, that was a strong recommendation to clarify that um, from the academy um, on our previous from our previous workshops. Right, and and I agree that that's an important distinction. I guess my, my trouble is understanding why we're still trying to force the physical chemical studies through a systematic review process when it may not be the best appropriate method. So for example, IRIS will use physical chemical properties in, in their different models and calculations. They use different dose response models. None of that data actually goes through the systematic review. So I, I'm wondering why, why the physical chemical property studies actually need to go through the systematic review when TSCA only says to use uh, exposure and hazard. Yeah, good question. So to clarify, you talked about dose response and you talked about physical chemical properties. We're, I, I'm going to separate those two issues because let's focus on your question about physical chemical properties and um, physical chemical properties and the data. Um, and this came up numerous times from, uh, I'll just call out Dr. Doucette and, um, and Dr. Kissel and Dr. Cobb and Dr. Schlink all raised concerns in our first 10 risk evaluations about how we chose a particular PCHEM property. Because that PCHEM property um, basically had implications on the exposure assessment, had implications on the hazard assessment, pathway and receptors. So we've paid particular attention to the choice of physical chemical properties and looking at them through a systematic review process. So the data, the primary data is being evaluated based upon um, a structured approach and data evaluation criteria um, appropriate for PCHEM properties. So um, some of it is experimental and some of it is predicted and we're trying to uh, um, address that in the most systematic way through SR um, approaches. 
Okay, thank you. All right, Dr. Lamb. Hi, Julian Lamb here. Um, I just had a quick follow up that uh, to Dr. Rooney's question um, and the discussion about the protocol. And I, I hadn't realized that this generic protocol was also being used simultaneously as a protocol for the ongoing risk evaluations that, that are happening with the 23 chemicals. Um, so one of my concerns about this generic protocol was that there was no explicit step talking about protocol development for chemical specific assessments. But now I guess it makes a little bit more sense in that those this is a protocol for those 23 evaluations that are ongoing right now. So I guess my question is kind of thinking about this as a generic protocol moving forward for future um, assessments for newer chemicals. How will this protocol development for new chemicals be integrated into this? Will, will there be a separate protocol that will be developed for each of the future chemicals with chemical specific information in it? And in that case, where is that protocol development step actually taking place since that isn't discussed in this generic protocol? Good question. And you're sort of forecasting to the future. So um, we are anticipating that revision of this protocol, the generic protocol and comments on the specific uh, chemical approaches in the appendices, uh, we will get comments and make revisions on the generic approach in the body of the document, what gets repeated over and over again, um, would be the core of any future chemical specific protocol. And we would predict um, in the future that we would take that and the chemical specific protocol, release that for public comment and um, part of the scoping exercise for the future. But again, we're looking for the committee's um, recommendations um, ar around those issues. We have to, uh, um, quite frankly, uh, address the challenges, the resource challenges and the timing challenges that Dr. Henry pointed out earlier. And when uh, it really factors into the prioritization process and scoping process, that interval between prioritization and scoping, when that next group of cohort of chemical assessments will come, come into play. Okay, uh, Dr. Kissel. So I don't know if we'll get opportunity to ask uh, these kind of questions elsewhere, so I'm gonna do it now. Um, on, in the, the document, uh, on page 43, there's a list of exposure pathways and uh, vapor intrusion is not included. And I wonder, um, uh, is it assumed that vapor intrusion would be covered either in the indoor air or groundwater pathways or, um, uh, you know, is it left out altogether? So uh, thank you for bringing that up, Dr. Kissel. I didn't realize that vapor intrusion was not included, but by inference, yes, it would groundwater and indoor air is what we're going to be looking at. And vapor intrusion is part of um, part of our systematic review. Um, so we have we have had extensive discussion about vapor intrusion um, in our um, in our systematic review efforts. Okay, thank you. Um, second question, uh, table H1 on page 338 lists the, the target PCAM properties that are being specifically sought um, in review. Um, and there's no mention of uh, dermal permeability coefficients, for instance, which um, can either be uh, experimental or uh, estimated from physical chemical properties. If you're, if you're not searching for the um, or maybe you are searching for the, the um, experimental results. Um, uh, but uh, if you aren't, does that imply that you're, you're uh, in future, the, the protocol will be to use estimated values rather than, than experimental values? The EPA's hop back and forth 
on and used both in the, the previous 10 risk assessments. And so I'm just curious if this is a, uh, a signal about, about uh, a policy decision or if it's um, uh, somehow just that permeability coefficients didn't rise to the level of attention uh, in the property list. So dermal permeability values, we are looking for dermal permeability values in our peer review um, evaluations. So we can make sure that that's included. We are also um, going to be looking at modeling. Um, you will also, uh, if you're familiar with uh, the uh, data gathering efforts, we did um, release um, a specific orders on uh, dermal permeability earlier um, for some of the chemicals um, in the next tranche of risk evaluations. Okay, and a, and a second uh, property, uh, there's nothing in the list about uh, acid dissociation constants, which um, can't be determined from other properties and are really crucial in, in uh, fate and transport solubility and partitioning sorts of things. So um, where would that information come from if it's not, uh, if it's not a, a searched term? I'll have to check on that um, and, and get back with you um, about that. We'll look. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kissel. Okay, uh, Dr. Peltz. Hey, yes, this is Dr. Pelch. Thank you. I had a, a question and I apologize if I missed it, but can you clarify for me how ADME and PK studies are, if they are, I see that they're tagged as supplemental um, for all the chemical specific sort of PICO statements and explanations and the appendices, but can you explain to me how they fit into the systematic review process beyond that if they, are considered, and then also I just noticed that there's no main text that ever refers to Appendix U. So there's a lack of connection in the text there. I'll have to check on the Appendix U issue. I thought we had cross-referenced everything to the body of the document. So I'll have to check on that um, with the team. With regard to ADME and PEK um, studies, they are going through systematic review. We focused on um, key endpoints uh, and um, toxicological, epidemiological domains first. Um, we'll be looking at the admin and PVK um, as, as well. So they're in supplemental. They're in a supplemental basket, but they do have a data evaluation. Um, they do go through data evaluation. Okay, so they go, they get tagged as supplemental during screening, they go through data evaluation and distiller, and then after that they get synthesized in some method. They will get synthesized in the evidence integration step. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Stan looks like we're, uh, we're out of hands at this point. I, um, Actually, I do have one quick question uh, um, that I wanted to bring up. This is Dan Schlink. Uh, I was looking through and, and your, your differentiation between a generic document versus some of the specific uh, X compound appendices. I was going through um, the, the text of the document and I didn't see comp talks highlighted um, for um, as a database uh, search. I saw it in the appendices and I'm just wondering does it need to be in the generic part? Uh, is that just missed or it seemed like it's very important in the appendices, but I didn't see it in the written document. Is that? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean, Dr. Schlenk, ComTox. If you're talking about the comp, computational toxicology dashboard or tox. Yes, task, yes, the dashboard. Yes, it's, it's so, listed in the appendix, in the appendices, but not in the, in the main document. And if that's a generic, I'm just wondering, is there, is there a reason for that? Why it's in the appendices and not in the main document? So we are looking at the CompTOX dashboard in multiple ways and multiple disciplines. Um, and 
in, in general, we're looking at it, whether there's primary data or whether it's secondary data, um, to fill in gaps um, and to identify other sources. Um, the annotation is fairly comprehensive for other sources. Um, we are also, you know, it's useful in our duplication, deduplication process. Sometimes data sources, uh, particularly in the gray literature, are not um, very well documented. Um, so uh, just want to bring that up. Um, so I, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, I, I yeah, I just again I see it in the in the appendices. I just didn't see it in the main document. That's all. Yeah. Um, the other the other question I had relates a little more specifically to this to the search engines and databases used for the literature reviews. I noticed, and I I have to bring out the transparency fact that I'm an editor of an ACS journal. Um, so th just to be transparent about it. <laughs> Um, I noticed that SciFinder is not listed as a uh, database for searching uh, chemical abstracts, for example, whereas Scopus is being utilized as an Elsevier database. And I'm just curious why, um, what the rationale was for selecting Elsevier-based um, search engine database versus a uh, SciFinder uh, search, data, uh, search database that's an ACS uh, uh, product. So to that question, I'm going to pitch to um, our, um, one of our data scientists, library scientists, who leads that effort and can speak specifically to that. Um, Hillary, would you mind identifying yourself and speaking to that issue? Hello, I'm Hilary Hollinger with EPA. Um, we're using Scopus. It recently became available as a subscribed service that we can use. Um, and so we wanted to jump on that mostly because previously we had been using Science Direct, um, which is a subset of the Scopus population, um, but we wanted to use more of that information. And so we scooted over to Scopus. Uh, SciFinder, we have not been using, but I do have plans to look into it. Um, and so it may make it into the next round of this. Yeah, it's free, apparently. <laughs> so we've just, we've just been shown that. Um, yeah, it's just, uh, um, it has a much longer database retreat. It goes back a lot farther than, than a lot of the Scopus ones, just to set that out there. Dr. Myers? Yes, yeah, sorry. I just want to come back to the supplemental data information for one second. So if you're looking at your literature inventory trees that are within the document, the supplemental data is actually separate from what the data is that's being extracted and evaluated. And if you look at the hazard literature tree, there's actually two categories of supplemental, both of which are separated from what's included in full text review. Um, so if that data is being used, it's unclear where that data is fitting in and, and how it's moving through the process because it's been physically separated from the rest of the data in these examples. Yeah, I uh, understood, Dr. Myers. So supplemental is used in multiple ways in the evidence integration. And as uh, I was indicating, um, it can be used in the weight of evidence. It can be used um, contextually qualitatively, it sometimes is used quantitatively, um, but it's not, it's not used uniformly in the same way. So we have it in a separate pot um, and there are cases um, sometimes as we go through it where um, things will move from the supplemental into uh, the hazard uh, in, in for specific uh, under specific conditions as we go through the study in more detail and, and figure out ad additional things with some rare exceptions. But not every PVDK model is going to go through um, data evaluation. I mean, go through uh, evidence integration. It may not even meet our, um, our data evaluation criteria. So um, it, it's, it depends upon the purpose uh, in, the, in the context. 
And and I understand that. So the question is, does this information go through study quality and, and data extraction? And if it does go through study quality, are you using the same st study quality criteria that you would use on in an epi study or an animal study to evaluate no. these? No, and I wanna be clear about that. So we actually, I, I talked about this earlier, mechanistic um, studies are evaluated with a different set of study quality criteria. And we've actually included that in the, in the appendices. We have generic mechanistic um, admin PUK um, uh, sort of colloquial cri criteria, study, study evaluation criteria for those. When we have the specific need to tailor those, we will. Um, right now, um, those, those are somewhat generic, and we have included the specific um, cases that we've, we have needed to include it. And, and I'll just make one more comment. In, within that supplemental material, it's not all mechanistic data. It's, some of it is non-English right. studies. And, and so being able to decipher which of those studies you're referring to when it's all lumped together makes it very difficult to follow the data. Okay. I got your recommendation. Um, on uh, back to Dr. Kissel's point on um, PKA and acid dissociation constants, um, that is part of our, our, our searching and screening strategy. Um, it's in appendix G1. Uh, we are looking at um, those chemical properties. It is included in the chemical properties that we looked at. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dr. Pelch and Dr. Doucette. Hey, yes, this is Dr. Pelch again. I, you mentioned that the evidence, um, sorry, the heat maps, I'm forgetting exactly what they're called. Evidence maps. Evidence, evidence maps. maps. And the literature trees are evergreen. And I understand that the hyperlinks are meant to be evergreen. Um, but I also wanted to clarify exactly what it meant or what the implications were for the data within them to be evergreen. So when I was reading the document, at one point, I, I understand that studies can be added in as you get public comments and whatnot. That, that makes sense. But at some point, it seems like the tags that are kind of the underlying data for the literature trees and the evidence maps are pulled from like title and abstract screening. They might not be confirmed necessarily at the full text level yet, or that you might be getting duplicative tagging occurring at title and abstract screening and full text screening. So it's kind of wondering about a little bit more about that process, how those tags, if that's part of conflict resolution, if you know different um, reviewers were to tag a study slightly different, and then how, how that is clearly and transparently displayed and made clear that data has been updated in those two uh, visualization types. So you're getting it there. For those of us that have worked on tagging and labeling, um, it, it really is in the sausage making um, and trying to keep track of that. Um, uh, Hillary Hollander, um, Dr. Hollander, sort of our team lead, in that area of tagging and labeling, and I'll, I'll, I'll pitch to her in a second, but just in brief, um, we document and make sure that we are, the evergreen part of this, updating the most um, relevant. And again, there's redirection, deduplication efforts, um, because there are cases where um, a study, a like study or as same as study, um, got tagged, tagged um, twice. Um, so we, we have to reconcile those and that's part of the evergreen process. Um, the other part of it is we're receiving, uh, we're gonna be um, receiving additional information through our data call in through the test orders. We're gonna be um, looking at updates of our literature searches in the not too distant future. So as our searches um, reach a certain shelf life um, before we put out a draft risk evaluation. Our intention is, and we say this in the protocol, if it's more than two years old, we're going to be doing a literature search, a literature update, and evaluating new data, any new data since the last search. 
Um, so that's part of our evergreen process and not necessarily trying to put out another posting, but making this publicly available through the evergreen links and then um, uh, posting with the draft risk evaluation, any new information through those links. Um, did that answer to your question or would you like more detail from, from, um, from Hillary? I think that answered my question. Um, the other little pieces, is there a way within essentially Hawk in the Tableau to label the date of like some version control, right? Because it is completely yeah. lacking right now. Um, and then you brought up another point that I also wanted to ask on, which was in the, so we, we talked about the difference between using Hawk and Distiller for evaluating like the risk of bias or the general evaluation. And I know Hawk has a place where reviewers have to document why they give the rationale that they do or why they assign low, medium, high. And I was just wondering if that is the same in Distiller. It is, it is. Okay. And we've actually made that a requirement. You can't skip over it. Um, you actually have to write, the, I mean, the justification we found through calibration and from primary to secondary review um, and the QC process that it's critically important to make sure the documentation is um, included. So I hope, I hope that's, that's clear. Go ahead, thanks. There was something right. else in your, I, I don't, did I answer all your questions? I think so. It, you got to the point of it is very difficult to keep track of all the tags that are coming in at different levels. And so I oh, think that that was kind of the point of my question, yeah, how the, that was it, occurring. The other point that I think you raised was the dating issue. Um, mm -hmm. So that the one of the things we found we find quite challenging is um, between scope and draft risk evaluation, you know, there's new information. So so what's in the scope and what's provided in the scope as far as lit trees and evidence maps is that snapshot in time. The lit trees and the evidence map that will be released with a draft risk evaluation is a different snapshot in time. What you might be able to go to in Hawk um, will be more what's going on at that point in time. So um, we're, trying to sh we're trying to make available, um, at least in as real time as possible, um, where we are, what the status of the study evaluation, um, you know, the, the full text screening um, yeah. is at that time. I appreciate it's a very complicated challenge to deal with. Yeah. Okay. We're, uh... I know we're past food time on the East Coast, so uh, Dr. Rooney, if you can, if you uh, uh, have a quickie, I guess. It, I'll <laughs> keep it short. Um, and uh, Stan, I appreciate all those challenges and, and the complications of evergreen and the use of the, evi um, the evidence trees within Hawk that um, I would suggest not using the trees for uh, tagging or using another form of tagging, such as what distiller can do that is gonna be much more data rich. So that you could separate out whether the same study was tagged in multiple places. You wouldn't have to do it twice. You could do it once. And um, it could also handle version control, whether it was evergreen, whether it was used in a particular update or not. Again, in a simple format, um, but not using the evidence tree. That's a limitation of the evidence tree. Yeah. So that, have it. that would be a great comment, by the way. Yeah, we're having a lot of discussion about that, Dr. Vinny. Um, the, the, the advantages of Distiller, the advantages of Hawk, and um, as you know, there are, there are additional things to be, that we would like to have in Hawk um, that hopefully in future versions will make that better. Okay. Um. At this point, I think we uh, are up for a food break. <laughs> um, the agenda has a 45 minute break. Uh, let's try to, if we can chop that back to 40, let's, let's try that and uh, try to be back here at what, 20 past the hour. That would be 40 minutes. 
And uh, then we'll begin uh, with our public commenters at that period. Okay, thanks everybody. And uh, see you at 20 past. Hey, Stan, it's Todd. You can mute your microphone. We can hear you typing. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Have a good lunch break. Todd? Todd? Yeah, yes. Uh, let's not let's talk. Do... Let's not talk here. This the is time still... is the time is not correct here. If this says the time, we want the countdown. I'm working on it. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay, so that's for Kurd. Thanks, yeah. Kurd. Take a break.
Okay. Is everybody back? Um, this point we're about to begin uh, the public commenting period. Uh, what we will do is uh, take a brief roll call here. If you're here, just uh, answer uh, that you're here or, or present. So again, we'll just go through the, the list alphabetical. Uh, I see you, Dr. Apti, you are Hi. obviously here. <laughs> uh, Dr. Baker? Present. Uh, Dr. Blystone? Here. Dr. Cobb? Dr. Cobb? Okay, I think he said something about he might be a little late. Uh, Dr. Chasen. Dr. Chasen. Okay, Dr. Davies. Here. Uh, Dr. Doucette. Virtually present. I was waiting for that one. <laughs> Dr. Hager Bernays. Present. That's a Dr. Johnson. Here. Uh, Dr. Kissel. Here. Dr. Prisbola. Present. Uh, Dr. Reif. Dr. Reif. Okay, I'll go back through these. I guess we're recording. <laughs> uh, Dr. Rollins. Dr. Rollins, Dr. Voorhees. Here. Great. Dr. Barrow. Here. Dr. Poland Fedenic. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, Fedenic. Here. Fedenic. Fedenic. Yes. Great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Dr. Goyek. I'm here. Uh, Dr. Lamb. Here. Dr. Myers. Here. Uh, Dr. Pelch. Here. Dr. Rooney. Here. Dr. Wong. Here. And Dr. Wyckoff. Present. Okay, let's go back here, see who we missed. Uh, Dr. Cobb. I made it back. Yay. Dr. Chasen. Here. Awesome. And uh, Dr. Reif. Dr. Reif. Dr. Rollins. Dr. Rollins. Okay. Well, we have a quorum, so I think we're good to go with our public comment period now. Um, at this point, uh, I will uh, call your name. This is a list that, uh, that our DFO has assimilated. Uh, hopefully, you, uh, your name, you are here uh, when I call your name. If you're not, uh, I'll just move on to the next one. Um, you have five minutes, and the DFO will be uh, timing you and let you know if you are uh, at the 30-second mark when you are uh, finished with your, your comments at that time. Um, so with that, let's begin with our first presenter, uh, Nazaruddin Abulaye from the Society Maricosaro. And I don't, uh, like um, Dr. Schlenk, I don't see them, uh, I don't see that, that name online, so. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, if you could tell me, that'd be fantastic, actually. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Actually, if you could, you could chat me that info as we get down the list. Um, do you have the list? I'm uh, pulling Kurt, it out. <laughs> Kurt, okay, yeah, if you have that list, that'd be great. Okay, uh, Nicholas uh, Charche. Nicholas is on. Nicholas. Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Fantastic, and the slides are there. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Nicholas Charters, and I'm the Associate Director of uh, the science and policy team of the Program of Reproductive Health in the Environment at the University of California, San Francisco. Next slide, please. I have no conflicts to disclose. We will 
we'll go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, Section 26H of amendments, Oscar states that the administrator shall use scientific information, technical procedures, measures, methods, protocols, methodologies, or models employed in a manner consistent with the best available science. Next slide, please. By incorporating only certain aspects of other systematic review methods into the 2021 draft protocol, EPA is failing to adhere to its statutory mandate outlined in 26H of Amendment Tosca. I'll focus today on one of the key issues that the scientific community, the SAC, and the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine had with EPA's original systematic review method or Tosca method, which was how EPA evaluated the quality of the evidence. Next slide, please. In its review of EPA's original TOSCA method, the NASM explicitly recommended that EPA do not use numeric scores to evaluate studies. This is because empirical evidence shows that this approach can falsely imply a relationship between scores, that is high versus low, and the study result or reliability of a study because we do not know how much each metric or domain should be weighted. And therefore the use of only say high and medium quality studies based off this arbitrary score can lead to a biased body of evidence. Simply, there's no scientific justification to using quantitative scores. Next slide, please. In the 2021 draft protocol, EPA states that in response to a variety of commenters, including the NASM and SAC, the TOSCA systematic review protocol does not include a quantitative weighted scoring system for data evaluation. Rather, the TOSCA systematic review protocol applies ordinal rankings to guide the qualitative categorization of high, medium, low, or critically deficient for each data evaluation metric. Next slide, please. However, as you can see here on this slide, and I'll get you to go to the next one as well, please. This statement is misleading because EPA is still using quantitative scoring methods to derive the ordinal rankings. While the ordinal ranking appears to be qualitative, it is actually based on, on, um, based on translating a quantitative score into a corresponding qualitative score. EPA has simply obscured the scoring with language regarding ordinal rankings. Although EPA has removed unequal weighting of metrics is still applying quantitative scoring with all metrics weighted equally. EPA is then assigned arbitrary cutoffs to designate the studies low, medium or high quality. Next slide, please. The second recommendation the NASA made to EPA on their study quality approach was do not exclude studies based on risk of bias, study quality or reporting quality. In the original TOSCA method, EPA created a seemingly arbitrary list of quality metrics and rating system that made studies unacceptable for use often based on just one reporting or methodological limitation. As an ASM highlighted that while there is inevitability, inevitably variation in the internal validity and risk of bias across individual studies, it's standard practice to include all studies, even studies with a high risk of bias into the evidence synthesis. Next slide, please. Although EPA states that it has dropped its previous approach of excluding studies ranked as uninformative, the way the 2021 draft TOSCA method describes how EPA will use these studies is inconsistent, ambiguous and confusing. In section five, data evaluation, which you can see here on the left-hand side of the slide, EPA begins by stating that for each evidence stream, a critically deficient rating in any metric makes the study unusable for quantitative analysis. EPA then says, however, that any study with a metric rated as critically deficient will be rated as uninformative overall, and the quantitative use of an uninformative study may be inappropriate. EPA then changes the language again in Table 5.1. Next slide, please. Further, as you can see here in Table APXQ9 for data quality criteria for animal toxicity studies, EPA explicitly states that for the majority of metrics in animal toxicity studies, so 19 out of 24, a critically deficient rating makes the study unusable directly contradicting EPA statements elsewhere in the document and in today's presentation that studies with this rating are not excluded from further consideration. Next slide, please. This concern with using an approach that can exclude studies from a body of evidence based off only one methodological limitation, risk of bias or study quality assessment was validated when the NASM in its review of the ORD staff handbook highlighted that EPA provided data from recent virus assessments showing that the proportion of human studies rated as uninformative and excluded from further consideration range from zero to 50% and zero to 41% for animal studies. Next slide, please. Finally, the NASM recommended EPA use established tools for assessing risk of bias or at a minimum remove inappropriate criteria from the current tools. Next slide, please. You're done. EPA states that in its 21 draft method that during data evaluation, they assessed the risk of bias, methodological quality and sensitivity of individual data sources. 
As the NASM stated, many markers of high quality studies are unlikely to have a direct implication for the potential for a study to be affected by bias. Please finish last your slide. last sentence. Last slide, please, and I'm done. Last Thank sentence. You. However, EPA continues to conflate how well a study is reported with how well the underlying research was conducted and continues to include inappropriate appraisal criteria such as statistical power. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions, if anyone has any. Okay, let's uh, move on to have our a next quick question. Speaker. I have a quick question for the okay. chair. Are those slides being placed in I'm the- I'm sorry? This is a question for the chair. Are those slides being placed in- Who, who is asking the question? I'm sorry, I don't Andrew see your Rudy. hand up. Andrew oh, Rudy. Can you please place your hand next time so I can see you? That'd be great. Uh, yeah. Dr. Rooney, I believe the slides will be available, yes, on the docket. This is the DFO. The <clears throat> slides are available to the committee in their share drive folder, the uh, SharePoint folder. And as I noted at the beginning of the meeting, um, all the presentation graphics for the oral commenters, plus also the EPA will be in the docket later this week. Thank you. That's great, thank you. Thanks, and let me just remind you, if you do have a question, please raise your hand because I can't see you on the screen, on the Zoom screen, unless you raise a hand, so if you're, way down on our 61 participant list. I have no idea where you are, so. Um, okay, our next presenter will be uh, Courtney Cooper, also from UCSF uh, Program on Reproductive Health Environment. Hi, thank you. Um, good afternoon, my name is Courtney Cooper and I'm a science associate at the Program on Reproductive Health and the Environment at the University of California, San Francisco. My comments today will focus on our concerns about protocol development and EPA's recent Draft Toxic Substances Control Act or TOSCA Systematic Review Protocol, referred to hereafter as the 2021 Draft TOSCA Method. Next slide, please. I have no conflicts to disclose. Next slide, please. I will specifically be focusing on charge question one, part B, which states provide advice about whether the systematic review principles and processes described in the document represent comprehensive workable, objective, and transparent process. What specific changes do you recommend for improving the clarity and presentation of this systematic review approach? Specifically, I will address how the protocol outlined in the 2021 draft Hoska method is not representative of comprehensive, objective, or transparent process. Next slide, please. A protocol is a critical foundation for completing a transparent and unbiased systematic review. The goal of the protocol is to ensure that judgments regarding evidence evaluation are made prior to reviewing the evidence to reduce bias. However, EPA is concurrently assembling and interpreting the evidence while also applying the rules, which leaves the risk evaluations open to bias. The NASA recommended to EPA a systematic review protocol that details the pre-specified methods, including eligibility and critical appraisal criteria, and that is peer reviewed and publicly posted before the review commences shall be prepared. Next slide, please. EPA indicates they address this recommendation in the 2021 draft TOSCA method, stating previously EPA did not have a complete, clear, and documented TOSCA systematic review or SR protocol. EPA is addressing this lack of a priori protocol by releasing this TOSCA SR protocol. Next slide, please. The 2021 draft TOSCA method is neither transparent nor objective as EPA was in the process of conducting risk evaluations for these 23 chemicals prior to publicly releasing this protocol. This contradicts NASM TOSCA recommendations, which state key elements of systematic review include the following. Developing a protocol, which a priori describes specific criteria and approaches that will be used throughout the review process. And from their 2021 review of EPA's Office of Research and Development Handbook, which states in a systematic review, the protocol is a complete account of planned methods, which should be registered prior to conduct with a review. The term registration in this context is generally understood to mean the public release of the protocol in a time-stamped read-only format. While we appreciate that several of the chemical risk evaluations were ongoing when EPA stated it would no longer use the previous TOSCA systematic review method, EPA did have the opportunity to employ an established systematic review approach and could have released the new protocols much sooner than the 10 months it took for them to release the 2021 draft TOSCA method. Next slide, please. It is also not comprehensive in that EPA has failed to include protocol development as a specific step in the systematic review process. This is in contradiction to the NASA recommendation, which states 
The research questions and approach should inform the first step of the systematic review, the development of the protocol. Next slide, please. It also contradicts the 2014 National Research Council Review of the Integrated Risk Information System or IRIS program systematic review method, which does explicitly include protocol development as a specific step in the systematic review process. This is a critical missing piece because creating protocols for all review components prior to conducting the review minimizes bias and thus is specified as a best practice by all established systematic review methods. Next slide, please. Importantly, the protocol development in the 2021 draft Hoskin method is inconsistent with the best available science for conducting systematic reviews in environmental health. This has cast reasonable doubt on the validity of the chemical risk assessments, which is a direct threat to EPA's mission to protect human and environmental health. Next slide, please. We recommend EPA include protocol development as an explicit step in the systematic review process, publicly release chemical specific protocols for each of the risk evaluations conducted under amended TOSCA and make draft systematic review protocols available prior to conducting all chemical risk evaluations under TOSCA. This will help ensure that the methodology represents a comprehensive objective and transparent process. Next slide, please. Pre outline these issues in our public comments submitted to the EPA and in a recent blog post. We encourage you to review these materials for additional information, and we'll share these brief resources in the references of our oral comments. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Okay, we'll move on. Uh, let's see, I don't have Cruz or Gruel online, so let's move on to Suzanne Hardigan, American Chemical Council. Hi there, I'm here. Um, Great, thanks. I'll get started. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm Suzanne Hardigan, and I'm a Senior Director of Regulatory and Scientific Affairs for the American Chemistry Council. ACC appreciates the opportunity to provide feedback on EPA's TOSCA Systematic Review Protocol, and we submitted written comments to the docket in advance of this meeting. Today, I'll discuss some key overarching issues from our comments for the committee's consideration as you evaluate the protocol. The protocol reflects improvement from the original TOSCA systematic review approach as released in 2018. However, further proof of concept is needed in application to risk evaluations to fully understand the impact of the proposed changes. Ultimately, the approach to systematic review for the TOSCA program must meet EPA OPPT's needs to identify hazard and exposure information that meet the TOSCA Section 26 science standards for use of best available science and weight of the scientific evidence and that are appropriate for use in quantitative risk assessment. The process must also be sufficiently practicable to allow EPA to maintain the statutory timeframe and throughput requirements. The protocol encompasses important initial steps of the systematic review process. However, greater clarity is needed regarding how these initial steps support the larger risk evaluation process Discussion of later steps of the risk evaluation process, such as dose response assessment and calculation of margins of exposure are lacking in the protocol. The document could be improved by further discussion of these later steps of the risk evaluation process and how systematic review feeds into them. We continue to emphasize the importance of problem formulation to serve as the basis for focused systematic reviews that answer specific research questions. This process is also a critical step to make the systematic review manageable and allow it to be completed in a timely and efficient manner. Scoping and problem formulation must also include identification of key science issues that are then used to focus the systematic review, such as consideration of what is known about modes of action for effects of concern. With regard to data quality assessment, a thorough understanding of the impact of the study quality is a critical part of the systematic review process. EPA must ensure that the updated study quality approach does not put less emphasis on understanding how study quality aspects impact interpretation of results. EPA must also provide sufficient narrative discussion in each risk evaluation to explain the necessary expert judgment exercised in data quality assessment. Greater emphasis on systematic review approaches should not reduce the value of guideline studies. Reasons for not following guidelines should be analyzed to understand their justification and applicability to the question asked any deviations that are sufficiently justified can then be appropriately addressed in the quality assessments. How to address the quality of existing exposure data for purposes of regulatory risk assessment remains an area of research and discussion. EPA may consider further evaluating and refining these criteria. 
For example, the current data quality criteria for monitoring data include consideration of temporal representativeness, which is extremely important to selecting the appropriate data for characterizing occupational exposure and potential for unreasonable risk. EPA should consider explicitly evaluating this earlier in the risk evaluation process, given its importance, and because this is a question of relevance rather than methodological quality. Additionally, existing hazard and risk assessments can serve as sources of, for identification of data and information for TOSCA risk evaluations, but the information must be critically evaluated according to the TOSCA criteria as outlined in the protocol to ensure it meets statutory scientific standards. And the further discussion of the evidence integration step in the protocol is important to the application of systematic review in TOSCA risk evaluations. EPA should indicate that the integration step includes a consideration of the nature of study strengths and limitations to ensure that this information is not lost. It should also include an assessment of the relevance of the available data and should not be conducted only within silos of discipline specific topics. Evaluating coherence across evidence streams is also a critical step in the integration process that should be prominent, particularly for inferring whether the evidence carries more or less confidence. And uncertainty should be characterized quantitatively wherever possible, as this will be important when deriving toxicity values. Finally, EPA states the protocol will continue to be improved by public feedback and evolution of the state of the science in the field of systematic review. It's important that the document continue to evolve as the new methods are applied and as EPA gains further experience with risk evaluations. Thank you. Okay, any questions? Okay, thanks. Uh, let's move on to Frederick Nundu from Tender Mercies Foundation. Hello. Uh, Frederick, we're not Frederick hearing. is not on. There we go. Hello. Frederick is we're not, not on. You. He's not on. Okay. All right. So let's move on to Bob Sussman of Sussman and Associates. Yeah, I I am here, and and hope you can hear me. Uh, yep. My name is Bob Sussman, and I'm making these comments today on behalf of Safer Chemicals Healthy Families, which supports strong federal and state policies that protect the public from toxic substances. Since Congress amended the Toxic Substances Control Act in 2016, EPA has tried unsuccessfully to put in place a scientifically sound methodology that incorporates broadly acceptable systematic review principles. Despite completing the initial 10 risk evaluations required by Congress and beginning work on the next 24 evaluations in 2020, the program still lacks a final peer-reviewed SOR methodology six years into the implementation of the new law. This has called into question whether the completed and ongoing risk evaluations incorporate the best available science as TOSCA requires. The draft method, which the SAC is now reviewing, was developed after the National Academy of Sciences in 2021 strongly rejected the initial 2018 systematic review method. The NAS report found that the process contained in the 2018 guidance document and as elaborated and applied in the example evaluations does not meet the criteria of comprehensive, workable, objective, and transparent. Importantly, NAS faulted EPA for, quote, the decision to develop a largely de novo approach rather than starting with the foundations offered by approaches that were extant in 2016. In its comments, the Program on Reproductive Health and the Environment, the University of California at San Francisco, has exhaustively reviewed the 2021 draft method in light of the NAS recommendations and accepted systematic review principles. 
The pre-analysis shows that the draft method fails to remedy several major deficiencies identified by the NAS and must be revised extensively to conform to systematic review best practices. We agree with the pre-analysis. As one example, pre-demonstrates that, quote, EPA is still using a quantitative scoring method to inform how it ranks studies, even though the NAS report emphasized that, quote, the reliance on numeric quality scores is problematic because scores do not distinguish between high and low quality studies and the relationship between quality scores and an association or effect is inconsistent and unpredictable. If SAC finds that the draft method fails to follow accepted systematic review principles, further revisions to the method will be necessary. Fixing the flaws identified by the SAC will prolong the uncertainty created by the lack of a final systematic review methodology under TSCA and further delay the 24 evaluations, which must be completed by no later than mid-2023. To minimize these consequences, SAC should urge EPA to adopt one of the approved methods developed by PRE and the National Toxicology Program. Alternatively, since NAS has emphasized that, quote, the methods for developing IRIS assessments can serve as a model for other EPA programs, OPPT should simply adopt the IRIS method once it incorporates the improvements called for by NAS. The IRIS handbook could then be implemented by both programs, resulting in a single consistent systematic review methodology applicable to the Jesus. chemical risk assessments of both parts of EPA. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Okay. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Anthony Tweedale from RISK Consultancy. Yes. Yes, hello. Uh, my comment concerns only one issue, very narrow. It's uh, on your first charge question, but it's the most important part of a systematic review. Uh, that, that is the, uh, um, after the literature search is the initial, uh, hmm, there it is, uh, the initial uh, eva evaluation of which studies to keep and not. And uh, as many probably know, the, the recent PRISM S guidelines for systemic review uh, say that right in the abstract that uh, this is the most important part and that, uh, well, they don't say it out loud, but if you interpret what they say, what they're writing, uh, that everything depends on uh, the literature review and the subsequent screening. So um, I would very much like the SAC to focus on this tomorrow and hope the EPA, which I heard today did not, uh, uh, they just uh, went over this issue very quickly. I'd like the EPA to, to address this directly. Um, in the first 10 uh, systematic reviews, uh, section 1.5 of, of each one had this uh, boilerplate language where EPA said, and I'm paraphrasing to, brief, to make it brief here, uh, we don't have the resources to evaluate uh, you know, thousands of toxicity findings for each of these chemicals because they're kind of po poster boy chemicals. Uh, and in any case, we have uh, all these, uh, uh, we have a handful or a few dozen uh, old studies that we used in previous risk assessments of this chemical. And uh, we're gonna exempt them from SR and they just go straight into the, uh, uh, the top of the queue as key studies and supporting studies for the key studies. This is a travesty. It's, it completely uh, means that systematic review was not done at all. So what's the point? Um, and of course, uh, published studies get, low dose studies keep getting published uh, roughly two or three a day uh, 
invertebrates. Uh, and I've sympathized with the EPA that there's thousands of studies to evaluate. So I, I, I thought of two possible solutions and uh, I'm sure others could, could think of more. But number one, I know that TSCA requires, has always required industry to submit any new information that they know of. And in this case, we're talking about toxicity. So uh, I thought that um, was well, gonna, why don't you ask EPA if they have, if EPA has existing authority to have industry do the literature searches, uh, collate the information, very carefully not, uh, avoid screening out studies before they're even evaluated because a toxicity study is automatically relevant uh, pretty much. And then uh, EPA's role would be to uh, much reduced work, workload to uh, you know, evaluate industry's work as long as it was all transparent. Uh, I know that's a dangerous proposal from the view of NGOs. Uh, I, I work with NGOs, so that's my viewpoint. Uh, my second solution would be uh, what the National Academies is already working on, which is an artificial, artificial intelligence. So I would urge the SAC and the EPA to really focus on uh, developing uh, AI methods uh, that focus on, that um, can extract the dose response and other data from a toxicity study of all the different types of toxicity findings, including epidemiology, and uh, make the job easier. Bottom line, and I'll finish, uh, if this isn't focused on, it's not systematic review, as I said earlier, period. So thank you, I'm done. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the committee? Okay, moving on to our next speaker. It is uh, Paul Whaley from uh, Lancaster University. Uh, we're not hearing you. Can you hear me anything. okay? Yep, there we are. Good, excellent. It's playing on mute. Yeah, yeah. Right, good. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present. So my comments are going to focus on study quality assessment methods in the draft TOSCA systematic review protocol. So next slide. I'm a researcher and consultant based at Lancaster University. I work with the evidence-based toxicology collaboration, and I'm systematic reviews editor for the journal Environment International. Next slide. The way we've started recently breaking down the components of the study appraisal process and systematic review is something we're calling the FEAT criteria, standing for the extent to which an appraisal process is focused, extensive, applied and transparent. Next slide. For reference, uh, much more detail on this framework is presented in a paper by Jeff Frampton and colleagues that was recently published in the journal Environmental Evidence. Next slide. So what does FEAT mean? Uh, well, for appraisal to be focused, we mean it should be directed at key quality constructs that are relevant to the evidence review, and each construct should be appraised separately. Uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, an appraisal to be extensive, we mean that all important elements of the target quality construct should be identified and evaluated. For an appraisal to be applied, we mean that the appraisal process should logically inform the data synthesis with accurate, consistent descriptions of the extent to which each element of each construct has been fulfilled. And for an appraisal to be transparent, we mean that judgments should be made against explicit, unambiguous criteria. And the reason for each quality judgment made by the reviewers should be clearly justified and transparently reported. So how does a TOSCA study appraisal process measure up against each of the FEAT principles? Next slide, please. In terms of being focused, the TOSCA construct of study quality is ambiguous. On page 67, for example, quality is defined as all of methodological quality, sensitivity, risk of bias, and lack of reporting. And test substance metric one on page 599 conflates reporting quality and internal validity and also hints at external validity. Next slide. In terms of being extensive, with so many metrics, it seems unlikely that anything that could bear on study quality might have been overlooked, but it is possible to have too much of a good thing, as it's not clear how the metrics relate, whether they overlap and double count on any issues, whether they're all really equally important. Next slide. For being applied, there are several issues that need to be addressed. Uh, the first is that summing and averaging ordinal values in the way proposed in the protocol is mathematically invalid. While you can use high, medium, low critical ordinal scales, 
It's not valid to then assign numbers to judgments and do summing, summing or averaging calculations on them as though the judgments are interval data. Uh, the second issue is that studies of multiple issues identified as being likely to have a substantial impact on results can still average out to a study being ranked as high quality. This is not internally consistent. You can't judge a study to have an issue that substantially impacts results, yet perform a mathematical calculation, and then those things judged to be substantial actually result in not having an impact. And then the third is a more minor one, but not all metrics are even on the same scale. So metric two for test substance is rated high or low only. It's a two point scale and it's combined with metrics on a three point scale. Next slide. For being transparent, the metrics are detailed. The judgments do seem clearly categorized and the evaluator is asked to provide reasoning. Uh, this may provide a sufficient level of transparency, though this can only really be assessed when we see examples of the process being applied. Next slide. I suggest three high level recommendations for revising the proposed methodology. Uh, to address the focus issue, the protocol should define non overlapping dimensions of quality that matter for a task or review, clarify what each concept means in terms of the assessment, and evaluate each dimension separately. To address the extent issue, the protocol should define a minimum set of strictly essential criteria that directly address each quality dimension. For example, for test substance identity, I think there's a question of whether three metrics are really necessary, or if we just need confidence that the substance in the experiment is one the investigators think it is. Tease out the implications for validity of the results of the experiment. And to address the application issue, the protocol should carefully define independent quality constructs and domains make judgments within those domains on a normal scale, and use a method for deriving sudden judgment that is appropriate for ordinal data. Next slide. As overall comments, I do want to commend the efforts being made by EPA and its staff to introduce systematic review methods to task evaluations. This is not trivial. Um, the issues identified are common challenges in this process. 30 seconds. And EPA is making clear strides forward. Um, I think, next slide. It is noticeable, I think, that little of the seminal work on study appraisal methods and systematic review have been referenced in the citations on page 66, section 5.1. Only tools that are to a greater or lesser extent consistent with good practice and critical appraisal have been cited. This may explain why the protocol is to some extent reinventing established practices in a way not obviously grounded in the theory of study appraisal as it developed over the last three decades. This theory could be usefully revisited. Um, I think this would, uh, help support the credibility of Tosca assessments and address how uh, the study appraisal methods have come from a potentially un uh, compromising state crowd acceptance of conclusions. So thank you for your time, giving me the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Okay. Let's uh, move on to our uh, last speaker, which is Tracy Woodruff from UCSF, Reproductive Health and Environment. Great, and I have some slides. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Tracy Woodruff. I'm a professor at the University of California, San Francisco. Previously, I worked at EPA for over a decade in risk assessment. I'm also the founder of the Navigation Guide Systematic Review Methodology, which has been used for both hazard assessment and quantitative dose response analysis. Today, I will focus my comments on the PICO statement. Next slide, please. I have no conflicts to disclose. Next, oh, there we go, stop here. Um, a PICO statement lays out the rules for deciding which studies are relevant for inclusion in the systematic review. A well-crafted PICO statement is critical for conducting a good scientifically sound systematic review. Um, there is not a charge question regarding the PICO statement, but there are several critical issues embedded in the PICO statements, which is an appendix H.5 that you should consider. First, we commend EPA for appropriately developing individual PICO statements for each of its ongoing risk evaluations. Unfortunately, EPA's PICO statements do not provide a clear, consistent, reasonable, or appropriate basis for determining which studies to include. Importantly, their approach is likely to result in the exclusion of critical health effects studies relevant and critical to comprehensively assessing health risks. Next slide, please. EPA's PICO statements could inappropriately exclude important toxicity endpoints from TOSCA risk evaluations. In some instances, EPA appropriately includes studies of all health outcomes and all biological effects. However, for most of the chemicals, the inclusion criteria are narrowed to all apical biological effects, 
measured at the organ level or higher. Next slide, please. The inclusion of only studies with apical endpoints emphasizes observable health effects such as birth defects or cancer and could exclude important health studies reporting on biological changes observed at the cellular level. Outcomes that may be excluded could include reduced thyroid hormone levels, reduced red blood cell counts, reduced immune system function, and reduced sperm quality. For example, in the previously completed perchloroethylene risk evaluation, EPA identified reduced red blood cell counts as a hazard for the risk characterization. This assessment was completed prior to the adoption of the term apical in these uh, current PICO statements. In the PERC assessments, EPA indicates reduced red blood cell counts could be indicative of autoimmunity, anemia, and other immune effects. Reduced red blood cell counts should be regarded as a hazard of concern, even without an associated finding of anemia, as in the perchloroethylene risk evaluation. Our concern in the draft TOSCA method is that EPA may interpret changes in clinical signs, like levels of red blood cell uh, counts, only ap as apical when changes cross a level that indicates clinical disease like anemia. Next slide. Additionally, EPA disregards the recommendations from NASM to avoid changing PICO statements after starting a systematic review. For 21 of the 23 ongoing chemical risk evaluations, EPA applies one PICO statement for the initial study screening stage and a different one for the more detailed review, which came up earlier this morning. Changes to the PICO mid-review could result in inappropriately excluding studies and lead to inconsistencies in evidence evaluation. Next slide. Um, this illustrates the different versions of the outcome component of the PICO statement uh, that EPA is applying. So version A is more inclusive. It allows for all health outcomes for human studies and all biological effects for plant and animal studies. Next slide, please. Version B is more restrictive. As you can see, it places emphasis on apical endpoints at the organ level or higher. Next slide. Here we have categorized um, how EPA applied different versions of the PICO statements to different chemicals to evaluate their risks. And you can see that it varies. Some are version A, some are version B, and some are both. There are also numerous unexplained differences in the PICO statements for the ongoing TOSCA risk evaluations. For example, two organophosphate flame retardants, TCEP and TTP. These are chemically similar and have similar uses. However, the PICOs for these chemical uh, statements for these chemicals differ so different rules are therefore, or could be applied to the risk evaluations for these two similar chemicals without any explanation in the document. Next slide. So our recommendations are that EPA include cellular, cellular level changes and other sensitive outcomes as relevant. And instead of only including studies with apical outcomes, this uh, recommendation is also consistent seconds. with the other NAS recommendations for evolution of toxicity testing to incorporate more NAMS-based approaches and to apply single ECO statement. And the next slide is the conclusion of my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, questions from the committee? Okay, thank you very much. Thanks to all the commenters from the public and uh, appreciate your time and, and efforts in presenting those. Uh, unless I missed anybody, is there any last members on the list that uh, showed up after we called your name? Yeah. I don't this is Todd Peterson, the DFO. Uh, I just searched through the list in the um, those who were online, and I do not find any more names of people who had apparently requested oral comments. So like I suggested, if there was somebody there that could raise their hand, but I don't see their names. And it looks like we're almost back on schedule with the way the agenda is timed. So I'll just turn it back to the chair. You, may, you can decide. Thanks, Todd. <laughs> uh, yeah, since we've only been at it for, for about, uh, what, 40 minutes now, let's go ahead and uh, move on to the, at least to charge question 1A, and then we can take a break after that, if that's okay with everybody. Um, so uh, I believe, Dr. Fay, you were uh, going to read in the questions into the record, is that correct? Yes, that's my understanding. Could Great. you please advance to the next slide? Charge question 1A, that's regarding the TOSCA systematic review protocol document, chapters one through seven, 
please comment on the overall organization, presentation, and content of each chapter of the document. Thank you. Our uh, lead discussant for this particular question is uh, Dr. Baker. Hi there. So um, you're going to hear me talking a lot today because I have all of um, 1A, B, and C. And just to preface this, um, when I was compiling reviewer comments, you know, there seemed to be some overlap of what people put in 1A and what people put in 1B. I'm trying to present it where they gave it to me just so they can be assured that their comments were um, read and integrated. So um, hopefully, so there will be a little um, overlap, but trying to minimize it. So the general comments we received that were overall, um, while some reviewers found the document to be very organized and easy to follow, there were still some major concerns noted. Um, reviewers who were familiar with previous iterations of this document noted that while there had been improvements, um, many of the previous suggestions by NASM and SAC had not been integrated adequately. And it is recommended to re-review the NASM feedback um, to utilize their comments and make sure um, that they've all been integrated. Um, reviewers acknowledge that because TOSCA needs both hazard and exposure information to inform risk evaluations, it makes it more challenging to adopt existing systematic review processes and leads to a more complex protocol. Um, as the scope of TOSCA risk evaluation is much different and much broader than IRIS, and given TOSCA has to do more assessment in shorter time periods, it makes sense for TOSCA to use a fit for purpose approach and not rely too closely on the IRIS approach. However, more justification is needed for not relying on the IRIS program um, for systematic review protocol for human health, because what is presented um, feels incomplete and confusing. A reviewer suggested reading the comments on the most recent IRIS handbook for applicability to the proposed um, TOSCA systematic review. Uh, the title of the document implies this is a generic TOSCA systematic review protocol, but chapter one provides table 1-1, um, which presents details for approximately 20 or 25 chemicals undergoing review. Um, and this makes the purpose confusing. Is this truly a generic protocol to be followed for all evaluations, or will it be modified for each individual chemical that is being evaluated? Other reviewers commented that the purpose of the document should be defined and outlined early in chapter one and chapter three. And it's unclear um, who the intended audience of the document is. It's recommended that if no chemical specific pro protocols are to be developed, then this should be stated. And if it will be adapted for specific chemicals, then this should be stated and document. And I know we've discussed this some already, but just wanted to get, um, get this out there. Um, another reviewer suggested that this should not be called a protocol, but rather a handbook or methods framework, um, that those are better terms to use to describe the document. Um, a reviewer noted that the term protocol is not typically used by um, the systematic review community or the public to refer to a general method guide. So it's confusing that Tosca has decided to uniquely use this term. Um, the length of the overall document feels unmanageable and can make it hard to find information and even to meaningfully review it. A suggestion is that the, what we're calling the protocol should contain only the information needed to explain the systematic review process um, with extraneous information such as references to previous evaluations or examples of how the protocol was applied moved to the appendix. However, um, in some other sections, necessary information seems like it needs to be moved from the appendix into the chapter. In particular, the data evaluation chapter um, feels a lot lighter than chapter four, um, and they feel differentially, um, differentially detailed. And so it should, you know, while chapter four probably needs to be culled a little bit, Chapter five um, needs to have a little more in the, in the text. Um, it was also recommended that the protocol should indicate that the systematic review methods are being used to conduct the risk evaluation rather than describing the systematic review as a separate or parallel step. 
and it would be nice to explicitly define how the output from the systematic review is used in the overall risk evaluation. Um, so multiple figures and, te and text are provided demonstrating or identifying the risk value valuation process and the systematic review steps. Figure 2-1, 3-1, and 7-4 were called out. Um, however, reviewers found these um, figures to be conflicting. For example, figure 2 includes references to scoping and PICO development, and figure 3 says that the first step is literature searching. Figure 2-1 identifies the weight of scientific evidence being outside of the systematic review steps, but in figures 3-1 and 7-4, the weight of scientific evidence are included. Um, so a clear flow diagram of the steps of the process from start to finish and how it fits into the overall risk evaluation as needed. Um, so as written, the protocol lacks connections to the risk evaluation process. For example, con conditions of use, hazard characterization, risk characterization, et cetera. And I have some recommendations from the reviewers to address this. Um, one, chapters should be revised to clearly identify and describe the step of the risk evaluation that is being addressed with that chapter and how the output or goal from that chapter um, relates to the risk evaluation process. Um, additional texts or figures could be added to describe how, how to proceed from one step or chapter to the next and how the outputs of the systematic review directly inform the risk assessment process, um, whether that's informing hazard characterization, dose response, exposure assessment, et cetera. Um, this was especially relevant for chapters four to seven, where the bulk of the methods are housed. For example, what is the goal of the output of the liter literature search? Is it a full text inventory of all possible studies or information that could be considered in the risk evaluation? Or in systematic review terms, is it everything that, it is, that is included based on the PICO? Um, and for chapter seven, which is evidence integration, what is the evidence integrated for? To determine hazard classification, risk potential, media concentration, candidacy for use in evaluating a specific condition of use, points of departure, this just didn't feel clear. Um, and then developing a figure that overlays the concepts of the risk evaluation process with the systematic review outputs would better demonstrate how the outputs from the systematic review process are used in the overall risk um, evaluation process, or this could be added to an existing figure or table. Um, and this could also integrate with the recommended flow diagram of the steps of the systematic review that I mentioned before. Um, reviewers also noted that it was apparent while going through the protocol that multiple groups contributed to the document, leaving the chapters feeling choppy with each discipline having their own sub-methods. For example, the literature trees for exposure divide studies by where they were obtained, whether it was peer review or gray literature, and none of the other um, subsections do this. The data extraction section is different for each of the disciplines with the physical and chemical properties and environmental fate disciplines providing a list of study attributes while the others give example of data, data tables. Consistency is needed for transparency and crosstalk between the different groups of reviewers and the different groups who maybe wrote the sections is essential for a workable process. I also have some chapter specific suggestions. Um, chapter one, no specific suggestions were noted. Um, for chapter two, reviewers noted that in the risk evaluation rule, EPA chose to define weight of the scientific evidence as required under um, the Lautenberg Act as a systematic review without clearly outlining what the process should consist of. While systematic review is common in the evaluation of hazard, it is more challenging for TSCA to apply it to methods of exposure um, and whether it is appropriate to apply, it, to apply it to physical and chemical properties should also be discussed. 
particularly for physical and chemical properties where there is less controversy and differences in these data, a full systematic review may be unnecessarily burdensome. Other systematic methods could be used to vet these types of data and studies that would still fulfill the requirements of the rule. I know that's also been uh, um, addressed some today. So in chapter three comments, um, occupational exposure is currently included in the engineering discipline. It is suggested to call this discipline engineering and occupational exposures to ensure that the right experts are being used to evaluate those data. Um, this is actually what it's called in figure 4.7. Um, and then called the exposure discipline could be called environmental and community exposures to differentiate between the two. Um, and also given that occupational exposures are considered in this protocol, it would be helpful to discuss how the TOSCA scope differs from risk assessments undertaken by NIOSH related to occupational exposures. Um, table 3.1 describes discipline specific needs. Perhaps um, you could link this to the chapters and types of outputs where those um, are discussed. For example, in the row for environmental fate and transport, the data needs such as environmental mobility, environmental degradation, bioaccumulation, um, et cetera, were not found to be addressed elsewhere in the document. Um, in chapter three, maybe with table 3.1, it would be nice to mention the type of team that's conducting the review for each discipline and what their background should be. Um, Narrative in chapter three identifies chapters as sections, which is confusing. So suggest revising this term back to chapters unless section means something different. All right, chapter four comments. Um, figure 4.1 um, was helpful in showing the flow of data, but some additional um, clarifications are warranted. So data enters in its entirety but then it's separated by disciplines or tags within the discipline. Figures 4.1 and 4.2 show a single flow of data, but it seems to get split and reviewed by discipline specific reviewers at some point. It's not clear where this happens and what happens if it ends up with the wrong tag. Using this protocol, a single study could be tagged by multiple disciplines, meaning multiple reviewers in different disciplines um, and so reviewers question whether it is valuable for studies to be evaluated multiple times by multiple different disciplines and how discrepant quality scores between the different disciplines would be settled. Um, reviewers appreciated the decision trees and inventory trees that were provided in this section and thank you for your, their inclusion. Um, Hawk is also featured in chapter four. Reviewers spent some time looking at info in Hawk, and though there were some initial missteps, found it fairly easy to review and look at the systematic review results. Um, the view by tag option was very useful. However, there was not information on why a study was excluded or the ratings of individual studies. Um, if a source is in Hawk, could it be made easier to find this information? Um, if it isn't in hoc, could it be included? And then also to note in chapter four, there's no mention of food pathways as a potential source of exposure. All right, chapter five. Um, reviewers noted that the data evaluation methods have come a long way since the previous protocol, but it is yet to be fully workable, consistent with current systematic review practices. Um, although the previous SAC and the NASM committee both recommended moving forward without numerically scoring study quality. A few reviewers noted that Tosca still seems to be stuck on ranking these studies based on quality and using numerical scoring or ranking based on arbitrary and non-transparent factors. Um, the domain-based approach used by IRIS was recommended and adopted by Tosca, so it doesn't make sense that an additional scoring system is added on as well. It also doesn't make sense with the literature that is being evaluated. For example, for the physical and chemical properties discipline, a study evaluating the boiling point would be ranked along with a separate study evaluating solubility. 
Both of these studies are needed, whatever the quality may be, so why waste time ranking them? This ranking system also requires the use of professional judgment to alter the scores after the fact, um, in essence, to ensure that the higher ranked studies are used, making the process even less transparent. Similarly, another reviewer felt that ranking and quantification of studies must be removed from the process, along with the ability to adjust scores as needed. Detailed explanations can be provided following the domain-based evaluation to discuss the selection of studies. Um, chapter six comments. It was noted that table 6-7, which is the generic extraction template for modeled concentration data, indicates that key model inputs are optional. This input would seem to be relevant, particularly for sensitive analysis, so optional may not be appropriate. Um, another reviewer indicated there were issues with how data are extracted, but no specific comments were provided, um, and no charge question is specific to chapter six. All right, chapter seven. Um, table 710 references relevant species in evaluating the strength of the evidence for ecotoxicity and the quality of the database. Um, EPA should consider further defining this term. It should not be assumed that every chemical requires a complete set of testing in a very large variety of species, but instead should be considered in a tiered assessment. For example, if there is no indication of toxicity, um, for example, it's not classified as hazardous per GHS um, criteria, so if there's no indication of toxicity for aquatic organisms, which normally would not indicate a need for further studies, it is presumed that the quality of the database is high or low because no other species were tested. And then finally, um, the appendices. Um, so the added appendices make up the bulk of the document. And although some of it provides needed information, there is a lot that can be left out and reviewers found them difficult to follow. A reviewer indicated there is no need to include the search strategies, um, PICO statements, or potentially relevant supplemental material for the last 20 TSCA assessments. Assuming this information can be found in their respective assessments, there is no reason to take up the space in the generic protocol. Another reviewer seconded this, noting that the protocol becomes overwhelming when information needed to complete or review the TSCA process is buried in over 500 pages of appendices mixed in with examples and previous uses. This is especially noticeable with the chapter on data evaluation, which is arguably one of the most complex steps in the systematic review process and yet is given the shortest amount of text in the protocol. Much of this section has been pushed to the appendices leaving it up to the user to find the information needed to complete this step. The appendices should be used for additional information supporting the protocol, while the steps needed to complete the review should be in the main section. Information relevant to previous reviews could be referenced in their respective documents without bogging down the generic protocol. Those are the end of comments I received for 1A. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Okay, we will go down the list of our associate discussants. So, uh, Dr. Blystone. Yeah, uh, Dr. Baker did a fabulous job in organizing and giving all of that. I have nothing to add. Thank you. Dr. Heiger Bernays. Yes, um, hold on one second. Uh, yes. Um, Sorry, question one. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, that was a really extensive review. Um, and I think for 1A, um, my comments were incorporated. Yes, thank you. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Poulin Fedisnik. Yeah. Uh, I'll, yeah, I concur with uh, with the others that Dr. Baker did a wonderful job and summarized my comments as well. Awesome. Dr. Myers? Yes, thank you, Dr. Baker. You did amazing. I just would like to add that if they 
the confusion I think came from adding the generic protocol with the protocols for all these other 20. So they really need to be separate if it's not examples, if you're really trying to show what was used for each assessment, those assessments need to be separated from the generic protocol. That was clear, yeah. Dr. Pelch. I, yes, this is Dr. Pelch. I echo very loudly what Dr. Myers just uh, stated that the uh, chemical specific aspects of the protocol need to be separate. And I'm not quite sure, but I think there might have been a mistake or, or miscommunication somewhere along the line, but I don't think that my uh, comments got incorporated. So if I can take just a moment to go through there, through those, I did, I'm not sure if this was something on my end, but I want to encourage EPA to make sure that the Headers are viewable and navigable in the PDF and Adobe. So I had a great difficulty in navigating the large document because I couldn't um, quickly jump between the pieces and that could have been something on my side. But if not, um, just to make the document more accessible, that is important. Um, I did call out that there are numerous moving pieces in each step of the systematic review and protocol. And so I think that within the protocol, there is a need to add further discussion as to how the data will be checked for consistency and completeness across the conduct of the individual reviews. And chapter one, I noted on page 27 that there are five disciplines listed. Those were fate, exposure, engineering, environmental, and human health hazard, yet the definition provided in the glossary on page 139 lists six different, six disciplines, and that uh, sixth discipline was physical and chemical properties. And so that needed to be rectified. Um, I agree with the comments that were made regarding chapter five, that overall there, this chapter was lacking detail and it was less straightforward than earlier chapters. In chapter six, I found the beginning of this chapter confusing as parts of it were um, addressing information that had already been discussed in chapter five, specifically section 6.2. I also note that there was no charge question relating to chapter six. So specifically in chapter six, I wanted to address that chapter uh, section six or chapter six, however we're calling that, should address upfront how many reviewers are independently extracting the data how the data is quality checked and how changes to the data are documented. Some of that information is buried and not available right up front. Section 6.2 indicates that data extraction and evaluation steps are conducted simultaneously for studies on environmental release and occupational exposure data. And this seemed contradictory to information in section five that indicated that a data evaluation was a separate step for, then, from data extraction. So it was unclear why Specifically for those two disciplines, um, it, they were, it was occurring simultaneously. I also noted that some of the tables in chapter six included a place for reviewer and QC initials, but that this was not included every time data was extracted. And so I would like to encourage EPA to include uh, documentation of each reviewer and QC and the date that the entry was initiated and then as well as including the date and initials of any time the data is amended. So sometimes changes are needed when reviewing studies, especially for consistency over time. And it is important to document how and when those changes occur. Uh, minor typo, table 6.5 states country of continent, and I believe that should be country or continent. Several of the example data extraction tables also indicate that there is a place for reviewer comments. Specifically, it states any comments about the general generalizability of the study results or other study details. And I was wondering how often or at what point those comments are reviewed and discussed or whether or not they are kind of just comments that um, live in distiller and are only addressed when there's a problem. And I found that it was unclear from the generic extraction templates which fields accept free text and which fields require reviewers to select from a choice of answers. 
So distiller allows questions to be set up to only allow a single selection or multiple selections. And that element was also missing from the data extraction templates. So in general, there was a lack of details regarding exactly how data extraction templates. Uh, and this made it difficult to assess the utility, the complexity and completeness of the proposed data extraction. For example, it was not clear whether or not there is any linking of answers from one question to the next or whether or not there is any hierarchical structure built into the data extraction forms. On pages 80 and 81 of section 6.4, the data elements for extraction from environmental and human health hazard studies are listed. And it was unclear why this section was not structured similarly to earlier sections in chapter six. So again, it was unclear if the data that is extracted in section 6.4 if there's any hierarchy to the data extraction elements. I know that this came up also in some of the submitted public comments that this uh, section was lacking. So given that a single data source, for example, a single peer reviewed study may contain multiple analyses on the same or different populations, it is likely necessary for the data to, some, to have some hierarchical structure. And further, these data elements seem to be lacking overall as they don't indicate the timing of exposure or exposure assessment, the timing or age of health effect assessment, whether confounders were included in the analysis or covariates, the number of participants or individuals in the study and the study type for epidemiological studies or the route of exposure for animal toxicological studies. So by and large, the um, health hazard information, the elements that I would deem important for uh, characterizing the health hazard were lacking in this section. Section 6.4.1, which is on page 81, indicates that data from low quality studies may not always be extracted in detail if enough medium and high quality studies, for example, on an outcome are available, but it's not clear how much is enough to trigger this particular decision. And then section, the section on page 81 discussing the environmental hazard studies was confusing. It was unclear if there are peer-reviewed studies that exist that are not yet part of the Ecotox database, and if so, how data from such studies, how it's housed and extracted, extracted and housed. Mm -hmm. In the appendices, I note that the first, in the first full paragraph on page 144 in appendix A, uh, it refers to itself, so it refers the reader to see Appendix A, which you're currently in. Appendix C, Section C.1 states, the search date indicates the earliest date for which literature was available to be searched within the database. And I wonder if this should instead be the date of the most recent search. So the earliest date, in my mind, indicates the earliest date that the database has indexed, not the most, the date of the most recent literature search. In Appendix H, just a, probably a question, I'm, this is not my area of expertise, the, regarding the PESO statements, so P-E-S-O statements. And so I had a question about whether or not environmental fate and transport studies have to have a component of exposure for humans or other organisms. That was a point that I um, would like clarity on. And I didn't know if those types of studies typically had that information. And then finally, uh, Appendix H refers to conceptual models in some of the, I think it's on the tables if I'm correct, but um, there's nowhere indicated in the document where those conceptual models could be found. And I think that those were the rest of my comments on section on 1A. Okay, thank you, Dr. Peltz. Our uh, last associate uh, discussant is Dr. Wyckoff. Yes, hi, thank you. I uh, echo that Dr. Baker did a wonderful job synthesizing everything. I just have two uh, brief builds. Uh, one is to emphasize the recommendation to improve the communication on the workflow and the decisions between the steps and chapters as they relate to the risk evaluation process. And then second, just two references used to support some of the, the comments, the first being the WHO framework for the use of systematic review and chemical risk assessment from 2021. 
and then a paper, uh, Wyckoff et al. from 2020 and Reg Toxin Farm on the facilitation of risk assessment with evidence-based methods. Thank you. Okay. At this point, we'll uh, open it up to the rest of the committee. Uh, Dr. Baker, you have your hand up. Yes, um, I just wanted to apologize to Dr. Pelch. I, I dropped the ball on getting your comments in. I have them for one B and one C um, and you got them into me so early. So I, I really appreciate it and I do apologize, but thank you for um, letting everybody hear, <laughs> um, hear, hear your comments. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Barrow. Thank you. Um, th th I just want to strongly reiterate the point about the uh, title of the document because we, you know, the document we're reviewing is not a systematic review protocol. And specifically, the point I want to make is about the term systematic review. I mean, it could be a protocol for the whole process, um, but there's only a uh, part of the process is a systematic review process. So that that really needs to be made clear. And the systematic review protocols uh, are a separate. Uh, element. And although we heard earlier that the specific protocols are in the appendices, um, those are not actually systematic review protocols. They may have search strategies for specific chemicals, for example, uh, but those aren't uh, the, system, the, the specific chemical specific uh, systematic review uh, protocols. And the only other point I want to make is this term discipline seems to be a, an organizing principle for analysis of the data, and one could argue it should be the question, but because discipline is, is so important in this document, just to add to Dr. Pelch's comment, uh, discipline is an organizing principle for study evaluation too, and there 10 disciplines are defined in the 10 uh, appendices. So again, I'm not quite sure uh, what the disciplines are or how many of them there are. Thank you. Okay, just uh, also just to remind anyone else outside of the associates to get your comments in to Dr. Baker so she can assimilate them. Anybody else? Uh, Dr. Rooney. Hi, um, I think that uh, we can all reiterate that Dr. Baker did a great job and uh, be a tough act to follow, but gave us something to to do for the next couple of questions. Um, she captured the comments that I sent really well, um, but I'm not sure what we're doing with references. And so I'll read a couple of references um, that may not have been mentioned here if, if that's necessary. It's not necessary. You can just say that we'll put references in the document. Excellent, okay. Then I have a... Um, summary statement of the recommendation regarding the, the title and the protocol that I'll just do that I changed from my initial one. And that is um, in four points um, to d deal with the title and the, the lack of the um, spe chemical specific protocols under this current approach that Tosca has. And so I, I would suggest, strongly suggest starting with retitling the document that we've reviewed from protocol um, to the more common usage or the common usage uh, in the field and in public health as a TOSCA handbook or methods guide, and then use the TOSCA handbook just as it is. It's a very nice document as a basic to conduct problem formulation, scoping, the full breadth of all the different disciplines and the initial search and PICO are defined as EPA already does. And this step should end with the development. Um, the scoping step should end with the development of chemical specific protocols. Point three, then the chemical specific protocols will have the PICO, the extraction, risk of bias or study quality, and integration that is chemical specific and tailored for the chemical exposure properties and health effects of those substances. These protocols would be posted on the TASCA websites to support things that the other um, panelists have noted. Um, Data for scoping and problem formulation, updated if there are changes to the process and documented um, when the draft assessments are released. Yes, to points that EPA has made, 
there would be a lot of repetition of sections for the individual chemicals. This is normal. There's two good choices. Tosca can refer to those general sections of the Tosca handbook for general steps and keep the contents of the protocol focused on unique specifics. Or Tosca can put all the content, both general and specific, into each individual protocol. That's fine. It's digital. And no one will fault Tosca for killing digital trees. This will not add appreciable time relative to the clarity, transparency, um, and much of it can be done cut and paste from the really nice document that Tosca's already done. That's it, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rooney. Again, please uh, get your comments in to Dr. Baker. Um, anyone else in the committee? Okay, uh, not hearing any uh, additional comments. Uh, at this point, I'll go back to Dr. Barone or Dr. Fay and ask them if they have any questions of clarification regarding the comments that you've heard so far. Anybody out there? <laughs> I don't think so at this time, I, I don't. I don't think there's any um, any issues. We heard a, a number of good suggestions, um, so we'll take it under advisement and sure. um, follow up as we go through the meeting. Okay. Uh, okay, uh, Dr. Pelch. Apparently, did I miss you? Your hand is up. Oh, now you're gone. <laughs> Okay. Yep. Oh, now you're back. <laughs> your hand is up, Dr. Pelch. Now you're frozen. Hello? Dr. Pelch? Oh, I'm not here. What is Yeah. Um, how about a break? <laughs> <laughs> At this point, uh, let's go ahead and take our, our uh, instead of a 15-minute break, let's take a 10-minute break. That'll give Dr. Pelch some time to get back online and, and uh, provide, I guess, additional comments for, for 1A. If not, it could be maybe integrated into B or C. But uh, let's go ahead and take a 10-minute break. So I have uh, 12, I have uh, 41. Um, uh, past the hour, so let's come back at 51 past the hour, and we'll reconvene at that point and start 1B. Thanks.
Okay, everybody back. Um, so we had concluded with uh, 1A and uh, Dr. Pelch uh, had a, a couple comments that uh, she wanted to make, um, more so with regard to, I believe it was chapter six. Um, let me just say, um, and I uh, neglected to point this out in our um, introductory meeting, it is, it's okay if you have additional comments that aren't uh, necessarily addressed by the questions that EPA provided, uh, we can make a section at the end of the minutes where those additional comments can be included. Um, so that is, is totally fine. If, if you see something that uh, hasn't been addressed by a question, it's, it's, uh, it's okay to put uh, that information uh, in the minutes at the very end of the document. Um, so uh, I don't know, uh, Dr. Pelcher, did you have anything else you wanted to add on that? No, that, that's it, I think. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, my sure. computer froze. No worries. Uh, Dr. Chasen, did you have something? <laughs> yes, um, I'm glad you just uh, said that, Dr. Schlank, because I, I have several comments, but I couldn't quite determine where they fit in, and I was going to save them until uh, discussion on Wednesday, but just uh, to bring up the issue here, perhaps others uh, could sort of enlighten me as we <laughs> go forward on it. I went through the, the document um, with, with an eye toward the exposure assessment and particularly how, how it uh, fulfills the requirement for identifying and doing risk assessments unique to the susceptible or uh, exceptionally exposed or uniquely exposed people. And um, I have some general comments. Um, throughout the document, it was just hard for me to find um, how the process plays out. I couldn't quite follow how, for example, how a, um, a unique community or a community that could be defined, how the process would find and you know, and determine uh, how the um, uh, a particular subpopulation, no matter how you what you want to call it, is uh, determined that there's evidence that they are uh, uniquely susceptible or uniquely exposed. And um, my related concern about this is. Um, um, is that that, inf that kind of information may in fact be unique. It may be coming from, uh, you know, within gray literature and it may be uh, presented in a way that is atypically formatted or something that the science doesn't necessarily, scientists don't usually see coming across their desk. As an example of that, if you look at figure 4.3 on uh, page 46, of the document, <laughs> the um, this concept of relevance, I had originally uh, understood that to be relevant to a specific criteria um, of the mandate, and I, I I'm not sure relevance is really uh, meant that way in this. It's just relevant to the. Uh, Tosca risk evaluation, according to this. Um, that's uh, pretty um, vague <laughs> to me. Uh, but then you, you go down to step two to completeness and availability. And this is where I think our prejudice, if you will, toward um, typically formatted and presented information. And, and who's the expert who did the peer review? What kind of peer reviewers are we talking about? And for uh, uniquely exposed or susceptible populations, uh, the people who we think about as the typical experts may in fact not be knowledgeable um, for the community circumstances that lead to uh, unique, repeated, frequent exposures or, or uh, unique pathways or susceptibility in terms of um, uh, 
how they, as a receptor, if you will, uh, to the chemical um, uh, express the um, health effects. Uh, if for, and one of the just kind of things that jumped off the page to me, uh, if you look at the criteria in the middle of that section, it says, has the result been produced by a US government or state source? Um, the U.S. government, uh, last I heard, was um, it, supposed Sorry, to be. Sorry, Chris, Christine, can you yeah. can you move your microphone? It it is it's it's rubbing. Yeah. I'm sorry, I apologize. The um, thank you. Uh, I I think you need to in, incorporate into things like this the uh, partnership, if you will, that you have with groups like tribal. Um, um, entities. Uh, now, I don't know how Tosca fits into that, but it was my understanding in other parts, um, in other parts of EPA where uh, those kinds of information sources, I thought were being formally uh, accepted as authoritative. And it's certainly an area where um, you need that kind of unique experience and expertise to know whether or not the information that's being produced would be valid. And because um, I, I just don't think the typical scientist who's been doing risk assessments in, in most institutions would have the background to uh, really apply that. So what my fear is, is that even if information comes into the system it's going to get kicked out right there you know in that 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 step two it's not going to look typical the peer review isn't going to look typical and so you could have information entering this process and then just getting cold back out again because it doesn't fit in a tidy way into this system and I, I want to bring that up now. There are other examples of that through the document, but I thought I'd get it on the record because my concern is that the system, as it's produced here, has a tendency to weed out the evidence of um, pests. And I think one of the advantages of the criteria that was set up initially is uh, explicitly to identify the communities that have something unique about them. So I just wanted to uh, point out that I have concerns throughout the document that that status is just not being fulfilled or in some way I think uh, is at risk, if you will, as it enters the process, so. Thanks for the comments. Uh, based on what you just described, it would seem to me that that would fit mostly in B of question one in terms of does the document or is it comprehensive, uh, comprehensive process because the, everything that you mentioned seems to be uh, an a, um, assessment of comp, uh, comprehensiveness, yeah. well, if you will, and transparency in terms of how <laughs> that uh, works. So that, that seems like one B might be I don't know, Dr. Baker, if, if that seems appropriate for you or not, since you're the lead on, on that. Yeah, that's good. Um, Dr. Chason, if you could send I would be happy to write that up. Uh, I, yeah. I was going to include that on Wednesday, but then listening to this conversation, I, I, I didn't, I really thought, oh, gee, maybe, maybe it's included somewhere under one. So, but I'll, um, I'll pay, I'll send that out and then you guys can put it into where you think is relevant. Okay. Thank you. And, and there are other um, examples of this throughout the, the document. So I'll try to um, include some of those general points. Yeah. Um, before we move up, can we, um, we're kind of stuck in no man's land between questions. So, um, uh, I guess if we can uh, agree on uh, one location, uh, oh, Dr. Davies, you have your hand up, go ahead. I, I just wanted to add what, um, what she was talking about reminds me of some of what I was thinking about in question two uh, with gray literature and sources for the literature searching. Um, so it also might sit there. 
but yeah. yeah, if you write it up, we can figure out where to put it later. Yeah, exactly. Okay. If it's an overall comment, it, it probably should go in one. If, it, if it's a specific comment, we uh, can probably put it in two as it regards literature. So, okay, let's go ahead and uh, move on to B. Dr. Fay, do you want to read that into the record? Yes, charge question 1B. Please provide advice about whether the systematic review principles and processes described in the document represent comprehensive, workable, objective, and transparent processes. What specific changes do you recommend for improving the clarity and presentation of this systematic review approaches? Okay, Please. Dr. Baker. Thank you. Um, so just one comment that came in for question 1B, but um, is similar to what we've heard before. So I'll start with that is just another reviewer commenting that this document does not seem to be a, a protocol. A protocol should be indistinguishable from a standing operating procedure, um, which this is not. And in general, it does not flow logically. And so this having the steps laid out, numbered and described would be helpful. And um, the reviewer left a reference, Lint et al. 2021. And I think after I'm done, he may have some more comments on that for you all. Um, so to get started with some general comments, um, the protocol is specific to the conduct of systematic reviews for TSCA. Um, and it's apparent that the protocol has been much improved from working closely with the IRIS office. But given that the outputs of the reviews for the two offices within EPA are so similar and rely on a lot of the same literature sources and resources, um, it would be helpful for this protocol that we reviewed to document um, how data will be shared within the agency when needed, because sharing data, especially <laughs> literature screening and extraction, can further expedite the review of chemicals. Um, EPA has stated that the visuals will be evergreen, but how this is operationalized um, and the implications of having evergreen visuals um, is lacking in the document. The visuals currently lack documentation or notation as to when the underlying data or the specific display was last updated. So it's important that EPA quickly resolve these issues and more clearly describe how often literature searches will be conducted and how often the corresponding reports will be updated. Um, and there should be a distinction between evidence synthesis and evidence integration. Um, for example, as is currently practiced by IRIS and was recommended in the NASM review. Um, and you know, the reviewer noted that this will also likely be discussed in charge question four and thought that this was well described in some of the comments submitted by um, the UCSF commenters. So regarding comprehensiveness, um, reviewers felt that Tosca has significantly improved the comprehensiveness comprehensiveness of this protocol, um, but almost to a fault. Um, as we said for question 1A, many of the sections have excess information. The appendices, um, while they provide a space to input as much information as possible, may be bloated, so it needs to be narrowed down with the necessary steps to complete the review in the main body and additional examples or directing questions in the appendices. Um, that being said, as it gets narrowed down, there are still key elements that need to be included and are currently missing. Um, one of those is problem formulation and protocol development, which are fundamental to um, the systematic review methodology. Um, several figures and in initial chapters indicate that this was conducted, yet it is not referenced. This should be added to the text and diagrams, um, specifically notably absent from figure 3.1, is the development of a protocol um, and information on how to refine the protocol to be chemical specific or condition of use specific is not addressed. Um, the protocol does not describe how or when PECOs are developed or refined through this process. So another chapter is recommended to reflect the problem formulation and scoping phase and how the protocol or literature scoping could change with specific chemicals or conditions of use. Um, and a, just a reminder from a reviewer that while scoping informs the systematic review, it is not the same and should not be considered 
consistent with the systematic review. And I have, there are references that were given if you are interested. And so as a recommendation, clarify and separate the scoping and the systematic review for individual clinical assessments. Um, another reviewer commented, they agree that adding the development of chemical specific protocols is recommended to be consistent with widespread systematic review methods. And there is a need for information on PACO development, which should be informed by the TOSCA risk evaluation objectives that are defined, defined in chapter two. So regarding whether or not the protocol is workable, um, although improved, the process still seems far from workable. Having multiple discipline teams lead, leads to repetitive searching, screening, extracting, and evaluating of data, adding to the already burdensome process. Um, the generic protocol is nearly 700 pages in length, including appendices, making it difficult to understand how any end user could follow the protocol procedure properly, let alone a reviewer being able to determine if the methods are sufficient. Significant professional judgment is needed to evaluate the data particularly in the application of metric scores and adjustments made after the initial evaluation. Reviewers also commented here that previous recommendations from SAC and NASM pointed out there were existing methodologies that could and should be used to both improve the basis for the decisions made and to save time and money. And reviewers feel those should be revisited. Um, reviewers commented on the data evaluation, chapter five, EPA has chosen not to use validated best practice methods as suggested by NASM with regard to quantitative scoring methods. In the 2021 TOSCA protocol um, that we reviewed, EPA applies rankings of high, medium, and low. They are still derived using um, quantitative scoring and it doesn't actually re represent much of a change from the TOSCA 2018 version. So a feeling like maybe some of the previous comments have not been adequately addressed. Um, there is a quote from the TOSCA regulation provided on page 28 that notes that the administrator must use methodologies employed, employed in a manner consistent with the best available science to inform decisions. Um, however, a reviewer cautioned that this approach often leads to the faulty path whereby no reasonably available literature is identified and then the assessment returns to models that have no actual input data. Um, so whether or not this protocol is objective. Um, reviewers felt, um, some reviewers felt that the overall objective of the protocol is clear. Um, they're typically written to either provide a user with instructions on completing the review or for the general public to determine how and why the review was done. This protocol is a mixture of both without the information needed for either party to complete their respective tasks. Um, for data evaluation, the objective should be to transparently describe and appraise the available data, but when scores are used and can be adjusted after the review, it appears the objective is to justify the selection of studies regardless of their quality. Several chapters indicate the potential for evidence outside of the systematic review to be included or considered in the evaluation. This was confusing to reviewers because it wasn't ever made clear when this would be needed or warranted or available and how it would actually be conducted. Um, is there a method to evaluate potential data gaps? The protocol should also address how and when to gather information from outside the systematic review. So modeling, read across, in silico data sources, et cetera. Um, and similarly for assessing supplemental material how to identify, assess, and determine when to include or not. Multiple reviewers agreed that streams of evidence such as modeling, read across, and in silico should be considered. And it was also noted that there is an information on how to handle, handle new approach methodologies, COX-21 data, adverse outcome pathways. Um, and this is important because in general, this type of toxicology testing is replacing animal studies. Um, and so this is something the protocol should be responsive to. Um, risk of bias and misinterpretation is not discussed. Um, animal studies provide lots of data points, um, but assuming an alpha of 0 0.05, they could be wrong one out of 20 times. Um, biases such as ne ne negative publication bias are also not mentioned. 
um, where useful negative data are rarely considered because they aren't published as much. Regarding transparency, um, transparency should be the number one goal of a systematic review because it allows the process to be verified and repeatable. Um, although some improvements have been made here, there are still areas where um, more transparency is needed. Reporting the efficiency of systematic review tools, clearly stating the involvement of reviewers, consistency between reviewers and disciplines, and detailed risk evaluations can all improve the transparency of this process. There were concerns noted with the PACO statements. The PACO statements provided in Appendix H.5 do not appear to be statements. They should align with systematic review objectives and subsequently, subsequently guide inclusion and exclusion criteria. Having clear PACO statements is fundamental to a systematic review and the whole protocol should center around addressing the PACO questions and statements. The protocol should include direction on how to generate these PACO statements for each chemical evaluated as opposed to just generating inclusion and exclusion criteria. This would improve the transparency and utility of the systematic review method in the risk evaluation process. Um, additionally, it was noted that PACO statements appear to inappropriately exclude important toxicity endpoints from the Tosca hazard assessments. The focus is on apical endpoints, but often biochemical markers of effect or other outcomes at the cellular level are relevant to include. Many new approach methodologies focus on the activity of non-apical endpoints. Previously, EPA has identified altered thyroid hormone levels related to PFBs, decreased sperm quality or concentration um, in evaluation of TCE and PCE, and of course, cholinesterase inhibition is an endpoint for exposure to organophosphate pesticides, just to name a few examples. Um, therefore, it's unacceptable both scientifically and from a previous precedent to focus on just the apical endpoints defined as alterations at the target organ. Where appropriate or relevant, the PACO should also explicitly list metabolites of target chemicals. And then just to end with two specific comments, um, on page 71, um, where qualitative study quality is mentioned, there seems to have a redundancy. Um, and then on page 148, which is um, Appendix A2, which is the list of updates to the systematic review protocol in response to um, comments, it says OPPT has provided a crosswalk of existing frameworks in the systematic review protocol for TOSCA risk evaluations for hazard. Reviewers were confused what is meant by the term crosswalk of existing frameworks and would seek clarification from EPA. Um, that ends the comments on 1B that I've compiled. Thank you. Uh, our first associate discussion is Dr. Hager Bernays. Thank you, um, uh, Wendy Hager Bernays, and thank you, uh, Dr. Baker, for um, compiling and, and for presenting um, everything. Um, there were a few other points um, that I had, um, which refers back to uh, the actual, the screening process. And again, is this 1B or 1C? I'm not sure, but I'll put it here for the record. Um, the screening process um, uh, is somewhat, uh, I'll say concerning because of the already stated variations uh, and issues with the PICO statement. And one additional comment is that um, we heard about um, professional judgment and outsourcing, the need to outsource um, uh, specifically. And I think uh, um, that there needs to be clarification and clear statement about the elimination uh, of key evidence and data. Um, and it would be useful to have this clear documentation of those decisions made uh, at each step. Uh, an example should be provided, revisited, and determined whether the decisions um, are uh, almost, um, are, are, I'll call them routine, uh, but could be uh, addressed uh, later on in the process or could inform um, 
um, an update to, to this process. Um, another question, uh, another point that I had, um, and I think this was uh, in reference to also what uh, Dr. Chasen had reported, uh, which is that exposure data on the more highly exposed people, um, if these are not published in the queried sources that are mentioned, uh, then they may not be adequately captured. And uh, um, providing uh, documentation as to how um, those data would be obtained and queried uh, would be useful. Um, and, and, and that's all I have, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Johnson, I've been informed you have a graphic that you'd like to put up. Yeah, hi, yeah, sure do. Um, I'd like to take a, beg your pardon for a minute as we just take a step back and that just to, the reason why I guess you know, we're here, uh, we're, we're developing this systematic review process is because there's pros and cons from all these different sides of evidence, right? Um, if we have human evidence, typically we don't have really good exposure information or we have confounders that cause problems. And so it's difficult to just use epidemiological information. If we have animal information, well, we have very controlled studies. And we have good dose response, but you know, animals aren't the same as people, right? And then for in vitro information, um, you know, we can investigate actual effects in human cell lines, but we tend to miss interconnectivity between tissues, neuroendocrine effects, neuroimological effects. We miss kinetics, we miss other changes or adaptation, and it's hard to uh, basically um, interpret some of that information occasionally. You now, on the computational side, um, it's relatively fast. Sometimes these models will provide indicators of confidence associated with them, given the amount of data in the database. But um, we don't really have good information on mechanisms or mode of action, and sometimes these models could be incorrect. So. I just bring this up to, to show that I think that it is, this is something that Dr. Baker brought up. It would be great to include uh, in vitro as well as in silico computational as the, I guess, uh, third and fourth leg of this stool, in addition to uh, your evidence integration and to understanding whether each of these different endpoints have sufficient evidence of effect or not. I think, uh, the, the in vitro in mechanistic information may help you bridge the, the gap between animals and people in that data set. And uh, it helped you, may also help with the use of PBK models um, be able to understand exactly how much is too much. And so um, we can go off this slide now. I just wanted to bring this up so I can put my comments in a little more context. Um, I also know that the systematic review process is, is complicated. There's a lot of pieces to it because you want to make sure that that you don't, you don't hit the criticisms that you didn't do a good literature review, that you didn't miss anything, that you interpret everything objectively as possible. And I just provide a couple of quotes that, I've, that I saw recently um, from Van Gothy that we know actually only when we know little. With knowledge, doubt increases. And uncertainty can prevail in situations where a lot of information is available. New information can either decrease or increase uncertainty. New knowledge on complex processes may reveal the presence of uncertainties that were previously unknown or were understated, right? The unknown unknowns. In this way, more knowledge illuminates our understanding, maybe more limited. And this process is more complex than we thought before. That was from Walker et al. And so uh, I understand the need to do this. I just try to put this in just a little better context. I think, uh, again, we should include these other streams of evidence, but they don't have to follow the same criteria as we used for human and animal evidence. Um, you, may want to th you may want to think about, and in vitro evidence isn't always the same as mechanistic evidence, right? Mechanistic evidence means we have some molecular basis for the effect that we're seeing and can maybe, maybe use that evidence such as AOPs or initial key events to better extrapolate those data to humans. Some in vitro information is, is, can be dose response and we can maybe think about doing in vitro in, in vivo extrapolation. But again, uh, I, I don't think and I don't uh, wouldn't recommend that that you do um, a mechanistic literature search alongside at the same time you do the animal and the human literature search. I think you need, you want to focus that right, and you probably want to do it afterwards. That would sort of a, a, a phased approach, if you will, but may give you um, more you know help you streamline your searching processes and find the information you're interested in. So you may want to revise that PICO statement after you've done your animal work, after you've done your uh, 
Human Health Literature Review. And I'll stop right there. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Uh, our next associate discussant is Dr. Uh, Hulan Fednik. Am and I, I thought right? Pedenic, yeah. It's, oh, Pedenic. sorry, I put my video back on. Uh, and I thought Dr. Rooney had a comment. I don't know if it was relevant, if we should take yeah, it now. We're, we're, we're going to do it in no, order. We're, yeah, we do it in order. There's okay, a, perfect. Method to the madness, yes. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> yeah, so Christy poland Fedenic. Yeah, no, I thought that Dr. Baker did a wonderful job summarizing comments. I just really wanted to uh, reiterate and highlight that the agency also has the ability to utilize already existing tools and methods uh, when developing their systematic review. And so, you know, it it's unclear to me, you know, again, at, you know, after the, the NASIM review uh, and the SAC comments, why there are so many elements that can, can currently remain in this system systematic review uh, methodology that, uh, you know, you could have, that, that the agency could have taken existing protocols and utilized those and been, and, and save time and money and resources. And so just wanted to re re reiterate that. And then also just to highlight some of the comments that we've already heard, especially from uh, folks at UCSF that, you know, really just that highlighted uh, some of the issues that the, that really make the, the overall process um, lacking in comprehensivity, workability, objectivity and transparency. So the inconsistent PICO statements, for example, is really problematic, uh, which makes, you know, it, it actually makes all of these steps uh, really uh, not meet the bar of, of those, um, those comprehensive, workable, objective, and transparent processes. Uh, having inappropriate exclusion criteria based on a range of areas, a lack of clarity about evidence integration. A lot of these things have already been said, but just wanted to get them uh, uh, even further into the record. So thank you. Thank you. Um, also have a note that uh, if you are interested in the crosswalk um, nomenclature that that's in appendix A1, the, the uh, framework is contained in uh, appendix A1 for those of you interested in that. Um, okay, our, uh, our next discussant is Dr. Uh, Myers. Hi, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you to Dr. Baker. She got most of my comments. I just wanted to reiterate that the literature trees, although helpful, are not very transparent in what data is actually passing through the system. And also having some sort of diagram or tree that involves all of the data, not discipline specific, so that we can see studies that are overlapping um, or that are being reviewed by multiple assessment uh, discipline teams would be really helpful in, in getting an overall view of the, of the review. Thank you. Great. Uh, Dr. Pelch? Hi, yes, this is Katie Pelch. Thank you. I thought Dr. Baker did a great job summarizing the comments. And the only thing that I would build off on what uh, Dr. Myers just stated was that there, I was also kind of surprised that there wasn't a study flow diagram that highlighted overall when you do that very comprehensive literature search that has no parameters other than the chemical name included in it. And then kind of a whip um, that shows the whittling down of studies through the process and how many studies end up in each specific discipline. So that big picture um, study flow diagram that would be recommended from Prisma, I think was also lacking. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, questions now open to the rest of the committee. Anybody have any? Further comments? Okay. Oh, Dr. Wong. Hi, this is Amy Wong. Um, there was comments about the PICO statement um, change or it's initially very broad for all effects and then later narrowed down to specific. Um, I think one way to overcome those problems is to start with scoping and evidence mapping early on to see where the evidence are, um, then set your PICO statement based on the available data um, that you could actually investigate. Um, that will not have appearance of inconsistent PICO statement at a different stage, which I actually think it's necessary um, to conserve the energy and effort to the most valuable information 
because we all know the systematic review process is not only long, but also labor and love intensive. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. If you can again get your comments to Dr. Baker, that'd be great. Anybody else for 1B? Okay, hearing none, uh, at this point, we'll go back to Dr. Barone and Dr. Fay. Do you have any questions to clarification regarding the comments from the committee? Uh, this is Stan Barone. With regard to, I think you already heard the comments about the crosswalk in uh, Appendix A1. We crosswalked the OHAT um, uh, procedures. We crosswalked the navigation guide and the IRIS handbook and the WHO exposure framework. So we can show where our domains and metrics line up with those particular existing approaches. There's a lot of discussion, comments about existing approaches. We um, did look at those. We have um, actually detailed in the protocol how we are using the existing phthalate and formaldehyde um, data evaluation in our approach, in our protocol for those specific chemical um, groups and specific chemical for formaldehyde. So I do think we are um, in line with the, the, some of the comments. Uh, with regard to um, Dr. Wang's last comment, which I thought was very helpful, um, we have actually tailored our PICOs from the scoping phase to, um, to data evaluation, and that's what's reflected um, in what was originally uh, outlined during scoping and published with the scopes, and then what is published in the appendices um, the amendments and the appendices of the current draft protocol. So in the future, uh, I think we've got some, some more things to do. I'm hearing a lot of good, good dialogue, a lot of good suggestions. Okay, thanks. All right, uh, Dr. Fay, do you wanna read uh, 1C into the record? Yes. Charge question 1C. EPA developed a glossary of key terms based upon previous recommendations from SAC and NASM. These glossary terms focus on definitions relevant to systematic review generally, but are also provided to be transparent about the adoption or the adaptation of terms specific to their application within the TOSCA systematic review protocol. Please provide recommendations for additional terms that should be included. Please provide recommendations for refining or clarifying any terms or definitions. Okay, our lead uh, discussion once again is Dr. Baker. All right, thank you. So for this, I'm going to break it up into general comments, um, suggestions for making the glossary more useful, and then finally end with words to consider for inclusion, inclusion or refinement in the glossary. So general comments, um, Reviewers appreciated the attempts at a, at a glossary, acknowledging that it can be challenging to do and tough to build consensus around. Um, they also agreed that the addition of the glossary has added to the clarity of the protocol, um, that additional information and terminology mapping would be useful. For example, discipline and topic areas have the same categories in the glossary, but it is not clear how these are related or different. Um, and disciplines, as defined in the glossary, differs from the disciplines that are listed in Table 3.1. Um, adding the sub-disciplines to the glossary would also be helpful, and perhaps adding tags, as it is unclear if tags and sub-disciplines are the same, and if the tags are the same in the SWIFT review and the Hawk literature inventory trees. Um, there was a comment um, earlier that I mentioned about defining what the different TOSCA groups that will evaluate at all, stage, at all stages of the data valuation are, um, and perhaps adding these groups to the glossary so the reader can be familiar with the different expertise being utilized in such a review. For example, how is the toxic from, from an industrial hygienist or an exposure scientist? Um, a terminology map would be helpful in not only describing the body of data, 
but also in understanding how it flows through the process. Consider using additional figures along with the glossary to better describe the process. One specific example of an issue with terminology is the number of different pairings used to describe whether a study has information needed for the review. So on topic versus off topic, relevant versus non-relevant, and excluded versus excluded. I'm sorry, included versus excluded should all mean the same thing, but it is unclear if they have unique meanings in this context. This may be an artifact from the previous protocol or another example of different dis disciplines drafting their respective sections, but the document should be clear and consistent throughout. Um, so consistently use a term and then add it to the glossary as kind of the, the term. Um, best available science definition includes the word unbiased and it's not clear what this means. Does it mean low risk of bias or does it mean free of financial and non-financial bias? Quality levels includes the phrase qualitative judgment describing the certainty of the data quality evaluation. This seems to be describing the certainty of confidence in the evidence, not confidence in the evaluation. So here are some um, ideas from the reviewers on how to make the glossary more useful. Um, in the glossary, it could be helpful to mention which chapter or section that term is mentioned in to help people match up where it is discussed. Many of the terms or phrases in the glossary, the reader may not even realize are terms that would warrant a definition, like information. Um, perhaps moving the glossary to the top with the list of abbreviations would help the reader to know what words are even in it and know that these are terms that have a standard definition in the protocol to look out for. In figure 2.1, the term risk evaluation is used to describe the processes following the literature search and screening, while in figure 3.1, risk evaluation does not begin until after the data evaluation and data extraction, as we've mentioned before. But risk evaluation is not defined in the glossary, nor is there a consistent use between chapters. The risk evaluation should occur after the systematic review, beginning with the evidence integration, which is not typically considered part of the systematic review. Um, and it could be helpful to have more references to the glossary in the text so the reader is reminded it is there um, to help them with some of the words. Um, so finally, words to consider for inclusion or refinement in the glossary. Um, so EPA needs to be careful about the use of the term weight of the scientific evidence and strength of the evidence, both of which are defined in the glossary, and weight of the evidence, which is not defined but is used in the text, an example of which is on page 96 in the second paragraph. Um, EPA should consider defining relevant human health effects, which are mentioned in section 7.5.1, um, and the term definitions in general should somewhere indicate or connect to the forms of study valid validity beyond internal validity, um, such as risk of bias, but also include construct, construct validity and external validity. Um, other terms to consider adding, quantitative scoring, qualitative scoring, um, NAM for new approach methodologies, apical endpoint, relevant human health effects, which I already mentioned, relevant species, which is mentioned in table 710 in reference to evaluating the strength of the evidence for ecotoxicity and the quality of the database. Um, if the term crosswalk is to be used, it should also be defined in the glossary. Potentially exposed or susceptible population. I'm sorry, potentially exposed or susceptible subpopulation. Um, reviewers suggested that these may be two different groups to define. Exposure is different than biological susceptibility. There are more highly exposed um, or vulnerable subpopulations. Um, so for an example, workers in facilities using Tosca chemicals, people living downwind of stacks, um, people who might be using or consuming contaminated water. Susceptibility refers to underlying biology that makes a subpopulation more likely to experience adverse health effects. 
For example, the fetus is more susceptible to the effects of chemicals for which the developing brain is a target, or TCE is shown to have effects on the developing heart. This would make the fetus um, susceptible to the effects of TCE. So divide those two out. Um, a reviewer would suggest removing the, wor the wording typically provided by a guideline study in the definition of data need. It is necessary that data is it necessary that data are sourced from a, guide, a guideline study? Including this term suggests that peer-reviewed non-guideline studies are less likely to be used in the systematic review. Um, in the definition of evidence integration, what are trusted sources? Can this be further defined or is it necessary? Overall, it is unclear what this definition implies. It's recommended that this definition be made consistent with current guidance from NASM. For example, evidence integration is the process for drawing conclusions, considering all the evidence streams in combination within a discipline. Um, we, reviewers would also like a definition for evidence maps. Literature inventory tree is defined, but evidence map is not. Um, and then listing KOA, the octanal air partition coefficient um, as in the glossary and including that parameter in assessing chemical fate to improve assessments, especially for semi-volatile compounds. Um, it was also noted that there's not a lot of clarity or differentiation in the definitions for data stream, data types, and evidence stream. There is also no clear dif differentiation between topic area and discipline. Some of the um, provided definitions include other elements that aren't defined, for example, study types. It would be beneficial if examples were included or a figure was included to better show the relationship between these elements. Um, and so data streams, body, um, some suggested definitions, data stream, body of discipline specific information derived or relevant to a specific topic area data types, data or information from specific study types within each discipline for exposure and hazard, evidence stream, subcategories of the types of information within each discipline. The various evidence streams within a discipline are depicted in the literature, inventory trees, and evidence maps. For example, human health hazard includes epidemiological, animal, and mechanistic evidence streams. Topic area. Subcategories of discipline-specific information supporting EPA's risk evaluations. OPPT topic areas include physical and chemical properties, environmental fate and transport, occupational exposure, environmental releases, general population exposure, consumer exposure, environmental exposure, human health hazard, and environmental hazard. And then discipline, technical areas within EPA OPPT that are responsible for the assessment of information supporting TSCA risk evaluations. The disciplines include physical and chemical properties, environmental fate, exposure, engineering, human health hazard, and environmental hazard. And then finally, a few comments on the list of abbreviations included at the start of the document. Um, given that NTP has recently reorganized, it may be necessary to add any new relevant abbreviations, for example, whatever has replaced OHAT. Um, and then PBT should be refined as persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic so that the words are all adjectives. Currently, it's two nouns and one adjective. And then is it possible there is a need to add the abbreviation SEM for systematic evidence map or alternatively EM as EPA seems to use the term evidence map. And those are all the comments for 1C. Thank you, Dr. Baker. Uh, our next discussant is Dr. Blystone. Yep, uh, Dr. Baker did a great job again, nothing to add. Uh, good, thank you. Uh, Dr. Hager Bernays. Uh, yes, uh, I agree, Dr. Uh, Wendy Heiger Bernays, Dr. Baker did a, a great job. One minor comment uh, in the glossary now, uh, the, the uh, 
acronym is UCMR, not UCRM for unregulated contaminant monitoring rule. That's all I have. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dr. Pulin Pedinik. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Yay. Um, yeah, yeah, no. Well, it took I, me all day. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> <laughs> this is Christy Pullen Fidenic. And I, yeah, I thought that Dr. Baker also did a wonderful job and just wanted to say that I have a citation that we could also add to the to the, our comments as well that talks about the potentially exposed and susceptible subpopulations and you know suggests that the agency, though the, the statute says and has a potentially exposed or susceptible subpopulation, that really looking also at that intersection is going to be really critical. And so uh, if those definitions are added to the glossary to really be mindful of the fact that, you know, there are communities, for example, you know, a child living in a fence line community that's exposed, uh, both susceptible and exposed, uh, would be at the highest risk, uh, you know, to the chemicals that they're being exposed to. And so just wanted to suggest that and I'll give the citation uh, once we're doing our comments. So. Great. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Myers? I have nothing to add. Thanks, Dr. Baker. Dr. Pelch. Hi, this is Dr. Pelch. Um, just a minor comment. I, in my comments that got sent, um, I was not indicating that those specific definitions for data streams, data types, evidence stream, topic area, and discipline, um, I was not providing alternative words. I was just highlighting the overlap among those. And I apologize that that was not clear in my submitted comments. So what was read were the existing definitions. Okay. Uh, Dr. Wyckoff? Nothing additional to add, thank you. Okay, other committee members? Dr. Cobb. So uh, that was a great, uh, great review. I, I um, actually misread the question and looked at the um, at the acronyms in the front. So Dan, this kind of maybe is in the gray area, but I think it fits here as well as could could be. Uh, just to note that the hazardous substance database is, is in that uh, list of acronyms and it's now part of PubMed. So that may be something that the agency wants to, to look at. Also, I would suggest listing uh, KOA partitioning between octanol and air and actually including that in the, in the assessment. We'll get to that hopefully later uh, in, the, uh, in the questions. And that is it. Okay, thank, I think she did mention KOA uh, in the comments, um, George, but good to reinforce that. Sorry, I must uh, have missed it. No worries. Uh, Dr. Barrow. Uh, thank you, Lisa Barrow. I just um, wanted to note that some of the uh, terms defined in the glossary are also used uh, in an in unconventional way than they would be in uh, the field in which they're often used. So for example, domain, people often talk about domain-based uh, evaluation tools and in the glossary, the way the domain is uh, defined here, it doesn't match that definition that's typically used in systematic review, which would focus on risk of bias um, elements. And um, so I think that also needs to be looked at, the, the conventional use of the term. And I also just want to note that the uh, NASM uh, report on the IRIS handbook had two uh, very clear recommendations related to the glossary that would be relevant to our discussion. So I can send them along in writing or just read them out briefly here. Uh we're ahead of schedule, so you can read them out briefly. Here. Okay, I'll so I think these, <laughs> these would be the two that are relevant. So um, single definitions uh, should be provided for concepts and the definitions should be applied consistently throughout the book or the document. Uh, and the second is use terminology in a manner that is consistent with existing accepted definitions in related fields and when alternative definitions are used, um, the document should provide explicit justification. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Dr. Goyak. Hi, this is Katie Goyak. I just wanted to highlight that I agree with the, um, the comments that were read earlier, highlighting the need for some clarity in the glossary um, between the term strength of the evidence and weight of the evidence. Um, and also I highlighted this earlier in the clarification discussion with EPA, but I note that 
um, sometimes within the protocol, the, the term confidence is also used, confidence level. Um, so I, I think that might be, uh, might be considered as an addition to the glossary. Okay, great suggestions. Anyone else? Or we tie it up. Um, so I guess at this point, uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll let everybody stew on uh, question one A, B, and C. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, we'll we'll begin again, and if you, I'll give you guys another chance just to, if you have anything else to to add. At the same time, uh, Dr. Barone, I'll give you guys. Um, a chance to, if you have any questions, again, questions of clarification in terms of uh, the comments that you heard, it seems uh, there's quite a bit of uh, <laughs> recommendations and critiques as well. Um, hopefully there were more, just as many recommendations as critiques for you to, to help uh, with the document uh, moving forward. So uh, with no further comments uh, at this point, I'll turn the meeting over to our DFO, uh, Dr. Peterson. This is Todd Peterson, and as DFO, I wish to say thank you to all the SAC peer reviewers. Uh, quite a good day meeting. Also, thank you to Dr. Tala Henry, the Deputy Director of Programs for the Office of Pollution Prevention and Toxics, for the welcome from OPBT, as well as the introduction to the meeting topic on systematic review. Uh, we thank the OPPT team, and especially Dr. Stan Barone and uh, Dr. Kelly Fay for giving today's additional technical presentations, as well as the oral commenters for providing public input. And to the public for listening online. We had quite a few in attendance today. Again, the live stream captured today on YouTube will be available by a web link that is provided on the SAC webpage that I mentioned earlier in the day. This concludes the peer review activities for the agenda for today, and we will reconvene tomorrow morning for day two at 10 a.m. Eastern time. This session is now adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> Get the dog. Okay.